Publisher's Preface, Introduction, and Translator's Preface of the 1907 English Language Publication of The Ego and His Own by Max Stirner. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Matt Messerschmidt in Ann Arbor, Michigan, USA. Publisher's Preface of The Ego and His Own by Max Stirner For more than twenty years I have entertained the design of publishing an English translation of Der Einzige und sein Eigentum. When I formed this design, the number of English-speaking persons who had ever heard of the book was very limited. The memory of Max Stirner had been virtually extinct for an entire generation. But in the last two decades, there has been a remarkable revival of interest, both in the book and in its author. It began in this country with a discussion in the pages of the anarchist periodical Liberty, in which Stirner's thought was clearly expounded and vigorously championed by Dr. James L. Walker, who adopted for this discussion the pseudonym Takkak. At that time, Dr. Walker was the chief editorial writer for the Galveston News. Some years later, he became a practicing physician in Mexico, where he died in 1904. A series of essays which he began in an anarchist periodical, Egoism, and which he lived to complete, was published after his death in a small volume, The Philosophy of Egoism. It is a very able and convincing exposition of Stirner's teachings, and almost the only one that exists in the English language. But the chief instrument in the revival of Stirnerism was, and is, the German poet John Henry Mackay. Very early in his career, he met Stirner's name in Lange's History of Materialism, and was moved thereby to read his book. The work made such an impression on him that he resolved to devote a portion of his life to the rediscovery and rehabilitation of the lost and forgotten genius. Through years of toil and correspondence and travel, and triumphing over tremendous obstacles, he carried his task to completion, and his biography of Stirner appeared in Berlin in 1898. It is a tribute to the thoroughness of McKay's work that since its publication, not one important fact about Stirner has been discovered by anybody. During his years of investigation, McKay's advertising for information had created a new interest in Stirner, which was enhanced by the sudden fame of the writings of Friedrich Nietzsche, an author whose intellectual kinship with Stirner has been a subject of some controversy. Der Einzige, previously obtainable only in an expensive form, was included in Philipp Reclam's Universal Bibliothek, and this cheap edition has enjoyed a wide and ever-increasing circulation. During the last dozen years, the book has been translated twice into French, once into Italian, once into Russian, and possibly into other languages. The Scandinavian critic Brandis has written on Stirner, a large and appreciative volume entitled Le Individualisme Anarchiste Max Stirner from the pen of Professor Victor Bosch of the University of Rennes has appeared in Paris. Another large and sympathetic volume, Max Stirner, written by Dr. Anselm Ruest, has been published very recently in Berlin. Dr. Paul Elsbacher, in his work Der Anarchismus, gives a chapter to Stirner making him one of the seven typical anarchists, beginning with William Godwin and ending with Tolstoy, of whom his book treats. There is hardly a notable magazine or a review on the continent that has not given at least one leading article to the subject of Stirner. Upon the initiative of McKay, and with the aid of other admirers, a suitable stone has been placed above the philosopher's previously neglected grave and a memorial tablet upon the house in Berlin where he died in 1856. And this spring, another is to be placed upon the house in Bayreuth where he was born in 1806. 
As a result of these various efforts, and though but little has been written about Stirner in the English language, his name is now known to at least thousands in America and England, where formerly it was known only to hundreds. Therefore conditions are now more favorable for the reception of this volume than they were when I formed the design of publishing it more than twenty years ago. The problem of securing a reasonably good translation, for in the case of a work presenting difficulties so enormous it was idle to hope for an adequate translation, was finally solved by entrusting the task to Stephen T. Byington, a scholar of remarkable attainments, whose specialty is philology and who is also one of the ablest workers in the propaganda of anarchism. But, for further security from error, it was agreed with Mr. Byington that his translation should have the benefit of revision by Dr. Walker, the most thorough American student of Stirner, and by Emma Heller Schum and George Schum, who are not only sympathetic with Stirner, but familiar with the history of his time, and who enjoy a knowledge of English and German that makes it difficult to decide which is their native tongue. It was also agreed that, upon any point of difference between the translator and his revisers which consultation might fail to solve, the publisher should decide. This method has been followed, and in a considerable number of instances it has fallen to me to make a decision. It is not only fair to say, therefore, that the responsibility for special errors and imperfections properly rests on my shoulders, whereas, on the other hand, the credit for whatever general excellence the translation may possess belongs with the same propriety to Mr. Byington and his coadjutors. One thing is certain. Its defects are due to no lack of loving care and pains. And I think I may add with confidence while realizing fully how sh far short of perfection it necessarily falls, that it may safely challenge comparison with the translations that have been made into other languages. In particular, I am responsible for the admittedly erroneous rendering of the title. The ego and his own is not an exact English equivalent of der einzige und sein Eigentum. But then, there is no exact English equivalent. Perhaps the nearest is the unique one and his property. But the unique one is not strictly de, the einzige, for uniqueness connotes not only singleness, but an admirable singleness, while Stjernet's Einzigkeit is admirable in his eyes only as such, it being no part of the purpose of his book to distinguish a particular Einzigkeit as more excellent than another. Moreover, the unique one in his property has no graces to compel our forgiveness of its slight inaccuracy. It is clumsy and unattractive, and the same objections may be urged with still greater force against all the other renderings that have been suggested. The single one in his property, the only one in his property, the lone one and his property, the unit and his property, and last and least and worst, the individual and his prerogative. The ego and his own, on the other hand, if not a precise rendering, is at least an excellent title in itself, excellent by its euphony, its monosyllabic incisiveness, and its telling Einzigkeit. Another strong argument in its favor is the emphatic correspondence of the phrase his own with Mr. Byington's renderings of the kindred words Eigenheit und Eigne. Moreover, no reader will be led astray who bears in mind Sterna's distinction. I am not an ego along with all other egos, but the sole ego. I am unique. And to help the reader bear this in mind, the various renderings of the word Einzige that occur through the volume are often accompanied by footnotes showing that, in the German, one and the same word does duty for all. If the reader finds the first quarter of this book somewhat forbidding and obscure, he is advised nevertheless not to falter. Close attention will master almost every difficulty, and if he will but give it, he will find abundant reward in what follows. 
For his guidance, I may specify one defect in the author's style. While controverting a view opposite to his own, he seldom distinguishes with sufficient clearness his statement of his own view from his restatement of the antagonist view. As a result, the reader is plunged into deeper and deeper mystification until something suddenly reveals the cause of his misunderstanding, after which he must go back and read again. I therefore put him on his guard. The other difficulties lie, as a rule, in the structure of the work. As to these, I can hardly do better than translate the following passage from Professor Bosch's book, alluded to above. There is nothing more disconcerting than the first approach to this strange work. Stirner does not condescend to inform us as to the architecture of his edifice or furnish us the slightest guiding thread. The apparent divisions of this book are few and misleading. From the first page to the last, a unique thought circulates, but it divides itself among an infinity of vessels and arteries in which each runs a blood so rich in ferments that one is tempted to describe them all. There is no progress in the development, and the repetitions are innumerable. The reader who is not deterred by this oddity, or rather absence of composition, gives proof of genuine intellectual courage. At first, one seems to be confronted with a collection of essays strung together with a throng of aphorisms. But if you read this book several times, if, after having penetrated the intimacy of each of its parts, you then traverse it as a whole, Gradually the fragments weld themselves together, and Stirner's thought is revealed in all its unity, in all its force, and in all its depth. A word about the dedication. McKay's investigations have brought to light that Maria Danhot had nothing whatever in common with Stirner, and was unworthy of the honor conferred upon her. She was no Eichene. I therefore reproduce the dedication merely in the interest of historical accuracy. Happy as I am in the appearance of this book, my joy is not unmixed with sorrow. The cherished project was as dear to the heart of Dr. Walker as to mine, and I deeply grieve that he is no longer with us to share our delight in the fruition. Nothing, however, can rob us of the masterly introduction that he wrote for this volume in 1903, or perhaps earlier, from which I will not longer keep the reader. This introduction, no more than the book itself, shall that Einzige, death, make his eigentum. February 1907 Benjamin R. Tucker, Publisher Introduction Fifty years sooner or later can make little difference in the case of a book so revolutionary as this. It saw the light when a so-called revolutionary movement was preparing in men's minds which agitation was, however, only a disturbance due to desires to participate in government, and to govern and to be governed, in a manner different to that which prevails. The revolutionists of 1848 were bewitched with an idea. They were not at all the masters of ideas. Most of those who since that time have prided themselves upon being revolutionists have been and are likewise but the bondmen of an idea, that of the different lodgment of authority. The temptation is, of course, present to attempt an explanation of the central thought of this work, but such an effort appears to be unnecessary to one who has the volume in his hand. The author's care in illustrating his meaning shows that he realized how prone the possessed man is to misunderstand whatever is not molded according to the fashions in thinking. The author's learning was considerable. His command of words and ideas may never be excelled by another, and he judged it needful to develop his argument in manifold ways. So those who enter into the spirit of it will scarcely hope to impress others with the same conclusion in a more summary manner, or, if one might deem that possible after reading Stirner, still one cannot think that it could be done so surely. The author has made certain work of it, even though he has to wait for his public, but still, 
The reception of the book by its critics amply proves the truth of the saying that one can give another arguments, but not understanding. The system makers and the system believers thus far cannot get it out of their heads that any discourse about the nature of an ego must turn upon the common characteristics of egos to make a systematic scheme of what they share as a generality. The critics inquire what kind of man the author is talking about. They repeat the question, what does he believe in? They fail to grasp the purport of the recorded answer, I believe in myself, which is attributed to a common soldier long before the time of Stirner. They ask, what is the principle of the self-conscious egoist, the Einzige? To this perplexity, Stirner says, change the question, put who instead of what, and an answer can then be given by naming him. This, of course, is too simple for persons governed by ideas, and for persons in quest of new governing ideas. They wish to classify the man. Now, that in me which you can classify is not my distinguishing self. Man is the horizon or zero of my existence as an individual. Over that I rise as I can. At least I am something more than man in general. Pre-existing worship of ideas and disrespect for self has made of this ego at the very most a somebody, often or an empty vessel to be filled with the grace or the leavings of a tyrannous doctrine, thus a nobody. Stirner dispels the morbid subjugation and recognizes each one who knows and feels himself as his own property to be neither humble nobody nor befogged somebody, but henceforth flat-footed and level-headed Mr. This Body, who has a character and good pleasure of his own, just as he has a name of his own. The critics who attacked this work, and were answered in the author's minor writings, rescued from oblivion by John Henry Mackay, nearly all display the most astonishing triviality and impotent malice. We owe to Dr. Edward von Hartmann the unquestionable service which he rendered by directing attention to this book in his Philosophie des Unbewussten, the first edition of which was published in 1869, and in other writings. I do not begrudge Dr. von Hartmann the liberty of criticism which he used, and I think the admirers of Stirner's teaching must quite appreciate one thing which Dr. Hartmann did at a much later date. In Der Eigene, of August 10, 1896, there appeared a letter written by him and giving, among other things, certain data from which to judge that, when Nietzsche wrote his later essays, Nietzsche was not ignorant of Stirner's book. Von Hartmann wishes that Stirner had gone on and developed his principle. Von Hartmann suggests that you and I are really the same spirit, looking out through two pairs of eyes. Then, one may reply, I need not concern myself about you, for in myself I have us. And at that rate, von Hartmann is merely accusing himself of inconsistency. For, when Stirner wrote this book, von Hartmann's spirit was writing it. And it is just the pity that von Hartmann in his present form does not endorse what he said in the form of Stirner, that Stirner was different from any other man that his ego is not Fichte's transcendental generality, but this transitory ego of flesh and blood. It is not as a generality that you and I differ, but as a couple of facts which are not to be reasoned into one. I is somewise Hartman, and thus Hartman is I, but I am not Hartman, and Hartman is not I. Neither am I the eye of Stirner. Only Stirner himself was Stirner's eye. Note how comparatively indifferent it is with Stirner that one is an ego, but how all-important it is that one be a self-conscious ego, a self-conscious, self-willed person. Those not self-conscious and self-willed 
are constantly acting from self-interested motives, but clothing these in various garbs. Watch those people closely in the light of Stierner's teachings, and they seem to be hypocrites. They have so many good moral and religious paths of which self-interest is at the end and bottom. But they, we may believe, do not know that this is more than a coincidence. In Stierner we have the philosophical foundation for political liberty. His interest in the practical development of egoism to the dissolution of the state and the union of free men is clear and pronounced and harmonizes perfectly with the economic philosophy of Josiah Warren. Allowing for difference of temperament and language, there is a substantial agreement between Stierner and Proudhon. Each would be free, and sees in every increase of the number of free people and their intelligence an auxiliary force against the oppressor. But, on the other hand, Will anyone for a moment seriously contend that Nietzsche and Proudhon march together in general aim and tendency? That they have anything in common except the daring to profane the shrine and sepulchre of superstition? Nietzsche has been much spoken of as a disciple of Stirner, and owing to favorable callings from Nietzsche's writings, it has occurred that one of his books has been supposed to contain more sense than it really does so long as one has read only the extracts. Nietzsche cites scores or hundreds of authors. Has he read everything and not read Stirner? But Nietzsche is as unlike Stirner as a tightrope performance is unlike an algebraic equation. Stirner loved liberty for himself and loved to see any and all men and women taking liberty, and he had no lust for power. Democracy was to him sham liberty, egoism the genuine liberty. Nietzsche, on the contrary, pours out his contempt upon democracy because it is not aristocratic. He is predatory to the point of demanding that those who must succumb to feline rapacity must be taught to submit with resignation. When he speaks of anarchistic dogs, scouring the streets of great civilized cities. It is true, the context shows that he means the communists. But his worship of Napoleon, his bathos of anxiety for the rise of an aristocracy that shall rule Europe for thousands of years, his idea of treating women in the oriental fashion, show that Nietzsche has struck out in a very old path, doing the apotheosis of tyranny. We individual egoistic anarchists, however, may say to the Nietzsche school, so as not to be misunderstood, we do not ask of the Napoleons to have pity, nor of the predatory barons to do justice. They will find it convenient for their own welfare to make terms with men who have learned of Stirner what a man can be who worships nothing, bears allegiance to nothing. To Nietzsche's rodomontade of eagles in baronial form, born to prey on industrial lambs, we rather tauntingly oppose the ironical question, where are your claws? What if the eagles are found to be plain barnyard fowls, on which more silly fowls have fastened steel spurs to hack the victims, who, however, have the power to disarm the sham eagles between two sons. Stirner shows that men make their tyrants as they make their gods, and his purpose is to unmake tyrants. Nietzsche dearly loves a tyrant. In style, Stirner's work offers the greatest possible contrast to the puerile, padded phraseology of Nietzsche's Zarathustra and its false imagery. Whoever imagined such an unnatural conjuncture as an eagle toting a serpent in friendship, which performance is told of in bare words, but nothing comes of it? In Stirner we are treated to an enlivening and earnest discussion, addressed to serious minds, and every reader feels that the word is to him, for his instruction and benefit, so far as he has mental independence and courage to take it and use it. 
The startling intrepidity of this book is infused with a wholehearted love for all mankind, as evidenced by the fact that the author shows not one iota of prejudice or any idea of division of men into ranks. He would lay aside government, but would establish any regulation deemed convenient, and for this only our convenience is consulted. Thus, there will be general liberty only when the disposition toward tyranny is met by intelligent opposition that will no longer submit to such a rule. Beyond this, the manly sympathy and philosophical bent of Stirner are such that rulership appears by contrast of vanity, an infatuation of perverted pride. We know not whether we more admire our author or more love him. Steiner's attitude toward women is not special. She is an individual if she can be, not handicapped by anything he says, feels, thinks, or plans. This was more fully exemplified in his life than even in his book, but there is not a line in the book to put or keep women in an inferior position to men. Neither is there anything of caste or aristocracy in the book. Likewise, there is nothing of obscurantism or affected mysticism about it. Everything in it is made as plain as the author could make it. He who does not so is not Stirner's disciple, nor successor, nor co-worker. Someone may ask, how does plumbline anarchism train with the unbridled egoism proclaimed by Stirner? The plumbline is not a fetish, but an intellectual conviction and egoism is a universal fact of animal life. Nothing could seem clearer to my mind than that the reality of egoism must first come into the consciousness of men, before we can have the unbiased Einzige in place of the prejudiced biped who lends himself to the support of tyrannies a million times stronger over me than the natural self-interest of any individual. When plumb-line doctrine is misconceived as duty between unequal-minded men, as a religion of humanity, it is indeed the confusion of trying to read without knowing the alphabet and of putting philanthropy in place of contract. But if the plumb-line be scientific, it is or can be my possession, my property, and I choose it for its use, when circumstances admit of its use. I do not feel bound to use it because it is scientific in building my house, but as my will to be intelligent, it is not to be merely willful. The adoption of the plumb line follows the discarding of incantations. There is no plumb line without the unvarying lead at the end of the line, not a fluttering bird or a clawing cat. On the practical side of egoism versus self-surrender, and for a trial of egoism in politics, this may be said. The belief that men not moved by a sense of duty will be unkind or unjust to others is but an indirect confession that those who hold that belief are greatly interested in having others live for them rather than for themselves. But I do not ask or expect so much. I am content if others individually live for themselves, and thus cease in so many ways to act in opposition to my living for myself, to our living for ourselves. If Christianity has failed to turn the world from evil, it is not to be dreamed that rationalism of a pious moral stamp will succeed in the same task. Christianity, or all philanthropic love, is tested in non-resistance. It is a dream that example will change the hearts of rulers, tyrants, mobs. If the extremist self-surrender fails, how can a mixture of Christian love and worldly caution succeed? This at least must be given up. The policy of Christ and Tolstoy can soon be tested. But Tolstoy's belief is not satisfied with the present test and failure. 
He has the infatuation of one who persists because this ought to be. The egoist who thinks, I should like this to be, still has the sense to perceive that it is not accomplished by the fact of some believing and submitting inasmuch as others are alert to prey upon the unresisting. The pharaohs we have ever with us. Several passages in this most remarkable book show the author as a man full of sympathy. When we reflect upon his deliberately expressed opinions and sentiments, his spurning of the sense of moral obligation as the last form of superstition, may we not be warranted in thinking that the total disappearance of the sentimental supposition of duty liberates a quantity of nervous energy for the purest enjoyment and clarifies the intellect for the more discriminating choice of objects of merit? J. L. Walker Translator's Preface If the style of this book is found unattractive, it will show that I have done my work ill and not represented the author truly. But, if it is found odd, I beg that I may not bear all the blame. I have simply tried to reproduce the author's own mixture of colloquialisms and technicalities, and his preference for the precise expression of his thought, rather than the word conventionally expected. One especial feature of the style, however, gives the reason why this preface should exist. It is characteristic of Stirner's writing that the thread of thought is carried on largely by the repetition of the same word in a modified form or sense. That connection of ideas which has guided popular instinct in the formation of words is made to suggest the line of thought which the writer wishes to follow. If this echoing of words is missed, the bearing of the statements on each other is in a measure lost and where the ideas are very new, one cannot afford to throw away any help in following their connection. Therefore, where a useful echo, and there are a few useless ones in the book, could not be reproduced in English, I have generally called attention to it in a note. My notes are distinguished from the authors by being enclosed in parentheses. One or two such coincidences of language occurring in words which are prominent throughout the book, should be borne constantly in mind as a sort of carry perpetuum. For instance, the identity in the original of the words spirit and mind, and of the phrases supreme being and highest essence. In such cases I have repeated the note where it seemed that such repetition may be absolutely necessary but have trusted the reader to carry it in his head where a failure of his memory would not be ruinous or likely. For the same reason, that is, in order not to miss any indication of the drift of the thought, I have followed the original in the very liberal use of italics, and in the occasional eccentric use of a punctuation mark, as I might not have done in translating a work of a different nature. I have set my face as a flint against the temptation to add notes that were not part of the translation. There is no telling how much I might have enlarged the book if I had put a note at every sentence which deserved to have its truth brought out by fuller elucidation, or even at every one which I thought needed correction. It might have been within my province if I had been able to explain all the allusions to contemporary events, but I doubt whether anyone could do that properly without having access to the files of three or four well-chosen newspapers of Schirner's time. The allusions are clear enough, without names and dates, to give a vivid picture of certain aspects of German life then. The tone of some of them is explained by the fact that the book was published under censorship. I have usually preferred, for the sake of the connection, to translate biblical quotations somewhat as they stand in the German, 
rather than conform them altogether to the English Bible. I am sometimes quite as near the original Greek as if I had followed the current translation. Where German books are referred to, the pages cited are those of the German editions even when, usually because of some allusions in the text, the titles of the books are translated. Stephen T. Byington End of Front Material Next section, The Ego and His Own by Max Stirner. The Ego and His Own by Max Stirner. Translated by Stephen T. Byington. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Matt Messerschmidt in Freiburg, Germany. The Ego and His Own by Max Stirner. Introduction all things are nothing to me. What is not supposed to be my concern? First and foremost, the good cause. Then God's cause. The cause of mankind. Of truth. Of freedom. Of humanity. Of justice. Further, the cause of my people my prince, my fatherland. Finally, even the cause of mind and a thousand other causes. Only my cause is never to be my concern. Shame on the egoist who thinks only of himself. Let us look and see, then, how they manage their concerns. Those for whose cause we are to labor, devote ourselves and grow enthusiastic. You have much profound information to give about God, and have for thousands of years searched the depths of the Godhead, and looked into its heart, so that you can doubtless tell us how God himself attends to God's cause, which we are called to serve. And you do not conceal the Lord's doings, either. Now, what is his cause? Has he, as is demanded of us, made an alien cause, the cause of truth or love, his own? You are shocked by this misunderstanding, and you instruct us that God's cause is indeed the cause of truth and love, but that this cause cannot be called alien to him, because God is himself truth and love. You are shocked by the assumption that God could be like us poor worms in furthering an alien cause as his own. Should God take up the cause of truth if he were not himself truth? He cares only for his cause, but because he is all in all, therefore all is his cause. But we, we are not all in all and our cause is altogether little and contemptible. Therefore we must serve a higher cause. Now it is clear, God cares only for what is his, busies himself only with himself, thinks only of himself, and has only himself before his eyes. Woe to all that is not well-pleasing to him. He serves no higher person, and satisfies only himself. His cause is a purely egoistic cause. How is it with mankind whose cause we are to make our own? Is its cause that of another, and does mankind serve a higher cause? No. Mankind looks only at itself. Mankind will promote the interests of mankind only, 
mankind is its own cause. That it may develop, it causes nations and individuals to wear themselves out in its service, and when they have accomplished what mankind needs, it throws them on the dung heap of history and gratitude. Is not mankind's cause a purely egoistic cause? I have no need to take up each thing that wants to show its cause on us and show that it is occupied only with itself, not with us, only with its good, not with ours. Look at the rest for yourselves. Do truth, freedom, humanity, justice desire anything else than that you grow enthusiastic and serve them? They all have an admirable time of it when they receive zealous homage. Just observe the nation that is defended by devoted patriots. The patriots fall in bloody battle or in the fight with hunger and want. What does the nation care for that? By the manure of their corpses the nation comes to its bloom. The individuals have died for the great cause of the nation, and the nation sends some words of thanks after them and has the profit of it. I call that a paying kind of egoism. But only look at that sultan who cares so lovingly for his people. Is he not pure unselfishness itself? And does he not hourly sacrifice himself for his people? Oh yes, for his people. Just try it. Show yourself not as his, but as your own. For breaking away from his egoism, you will take a trip to jail. The sultan has set his cause on nothing but himself. He is to himself all in all. He is to himself the only one, and tolerates nobody who would dare not to be one of his people. And you will not learn by these brilliant examples that the egoist gets on best? I, for my part, take a lesson from them and propose, instead of further unselfishly serving those great egoists, rather, to be the egoist myself. God and mankind have concerned themselves for nothing, for nothing but themselves. Let me then likewise concern myself for myself, who am equally with God the nothing of all others, who am my all, who am the only one. If God, if mankind, as you affirm, have substance enough in themselves to be all in all to themselves, then I feel that I shall still less lack that, and that I shall have no complaint to make of my emptiness. I am not nothing in the sense of emptiness, but I am the creative nothing, the nothing out of which I myself as creator create everything. Away, then, with every concern that is not altogether my concern. You think at least the good cause must be my concern? What's good? What's bad? Why, I myself am my concern, and I am neither good nor bad. Neither has any meaning for me. The divine is God's concern. The human man's. My concern is neither the divine nor the human, not the true, good, just, free, etc., but solely what is mine, and it is not a general one, but is unique, as I am unique. Nothing is more to me than myself. End of introduction. Part First, Chapter One of The Ego and His Own by Max Stirner. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Matt Messerschmidt in Freiburg, Germany. Part First Man 
Man is to man the supreme being, says Feuerbach. Man has just been discovered, says Bruno Bauer. Let us then take a more careful look at this supreme being and this new discovery. Chapter 1. A Human Life From the moment when he catches sight of the light of the world, a man seeks to find out himself and get a hold of himself out of its confusion, in which he, with everything else, is tossed about in motley mixture. But everything that comes into contact with the child defends itself in turn against his attacks and asserts its own persistence. Accordingly, because each thing cares for itself and at the same time comes into constant collision with other things, the combat of self-assertion is unavoidable. Victory or defeat? Between the two alternatives, the fate of the combat wavers. The victor becomes the lord, the vanquished one, the subject. The former exercises supremacy and the rights of supremacy. The latter fulfills in awe and deference the duties of a subject. But both remain enemies and always lie in wait. They watch for each other's weaknesses children for those of their parents, and parents for those of their children, their fear, for example. Either the stick conquers the man, or the man conquers the stick. In childhood, liberation takes the direction of trying to get to the bottom of things, to get at what is back of things. Therefore we spy out the weak points of everybody, for which it is well known. Children have a sure instinct. Therefore we like to smash things, like to rummage through hidden corners, pry after what is covered up or out of the way, and try what we can do with everything. When we once get at what is back of things, we know we are safe. When we have got at the fact that the rod is too weak against our obduracy, we no longer fear it, have outgrown it. Back of the rod, mightier than it, stands our obduracy, our obdurate courage. By degrees we get at what is back of everything that was mysterious and uncanny to us. The mysteriously dreaded might of the rod, the father's stern look, etc. And back of all we find our ataraxia, our imperturbability, intrepidity, our counterforces our odds of strength, our invincibility. Before that which formerly inspired in us fear and deference, we no longer retreat shyly, but take courage. Back of everything we find our courage, our superiority. Back of the sharp command of parents and authorities stands, after all, our courageous choice or our outwitting shrewdness. And the more we feel ourselves, the smaller appears that which before seemed invincible. And what is our trickery, shrewdness, courage, obduracy? What else but mind? Through a considerable time we are spared a fight that is so exhausting later, the fight against reason. The fairest part of childhood passes without the necessity of coming to blows with reason. We care nothing at all about it, do not meddle with it, admit no reason. We are not to be persuaded to anything by conviction, and are deaf to good arguments and principles. On the other hand, coaxing, punishment, and the like are hard for us to resist. This stern life-and-death combat with reason enters later, and begins a new phase. In childhood we scamper about without racking our brains much. Mind is the name of the first self-discovery, the first undeification of the divine, that is, of the uncanny, the spooks, the powers above. Our fresh feeling of youth, this feeling of self, now defers to nothing. 
The world is discredited, for we are above it. We are mind. Now, for the first time, we see that hitherto we have not looked at the world intelligently at all, but only stared at it. We exercise the beginnings of our strength on natural powers. We defer to parents as a natural power. Later we say, Father and mother are to be forsaken, all natural power to be counted as riven. They are vanquished. For the rational, the intellectual man, there is no family as a natural power. A renunciation of parents, brothers, etc. makes its appearance. If these are born again as intellectual, rational powers, they are no longer at all what they were before. And not only parents, but men in general, are conquered by the young man. They are no hindrance to him, and are no longer regarded. For now, he says, one must obey God rather than men. From this high standpoint, everything earthly recedes into contemptible remoteness, for the standpoint is the heavenly. The attitude is now altogether reversed. The youth takes up an intellectual position, while the boy, who did not yet feel himself as mind, grew up on mindless learning. The former does not try to get hold of things, for instance, to get into his head the data of history, but of the thoughts that lie hidden in things, and so, therefore, of the spirit of history. On the other hand, the boy understands connections, no doubt, but not ideas, the spirit. Therefore he strings together whatever can be learned without proceeding a priori and theoretically, without looking for ideas. As in childhood, one had to overcome the resistance of the laws of the world. So now in everything that he proposes, he is met by an objection of the mind, of reason, of his own conscience. That is unreasonable, unchristian, unpatriotic, and the like cries conscience to us, and frightens us away from it. Not the might of the avenging Eumenides, not Poseidon's wrath, not God, far as he sees the hidden, not the Father's rod of punishment do we fear, but conscience. We run after our thoughts now, and follow their commands just as before we followed parental human ones. Our course of action is determined by our thoughts, ideas, conceptions, faith, as it is in childhood by the commands of our parents. For all that, we were already thinking when we were children, only our thoughts were not fleshless, abstract, absolute, that is, nothing but thoughts, a heaven in themselves a pure world of thought, logical thoughts. On the contrary, they had been only thoughts that we had about a thing. We thought of the thing so or so. Thus we may have thought, God made the world that we see there, but we did not think of, search, the depths of the Godhead itself. We may have thought, that is the truth about the matter, but we did not think of truth itself, nor unite into one sentence, God is truth. The depths of the Godhead, who is truth, we did not touch. Over such purely logical, theological questions, what is truth, Pilate does not stop, though he does not therefore hesitate to ascertain in an individual case what truth there is in the thing, whether the thing is true. Any thought bound to a thing is not yet nothing but a thought, absolute thought. To bring to light the pure thought, or to be of its party, is the delight of youth, and all the shapes of light in the world of thought, like truth, freedom, 
humanity, man, illumine and inspire the youthful soul. But when the spirit is recognized as the essential thing, it still makes a difference whether the spirit is poor or rich, and therefore one seeks to become rich in spirit. The spirit wants to spread out so as to found its empire, an empire that is not of this world, the world just conquered. Thus then, it longs to become all in all to itself. For, although I am spirit, I am not yet perfected spirit, and must first seek the complete spirit. But with that I, who had just now found myself as spirit, lose myself again at once, bowing before the complete spirit as one not my own but supernal, and feeling my emptiness. Spirit is the essential point for everything, to be sure. But then is every spirit the right spirit? The right and true spirit is the ideal of spirit, the Holy Spirit. It is not my or your spirit, but just an ideal, supernal one. It is God. God is spirit. And this supernal Father in heaven gives it to those that pray to him. The man is distinguished from the youth by the fact that he takes the world as it is, instead of everywhere fancying it amiss and wanting to improve it, model it after his ideal. In him, the view that one must deal with the world according to his interest, not according to his ideals, becomes confirmed. So long as one knows himself only as spirit, and feels that all the value of his existence consists in being spirit, it becomes easy for the youth to give his life, the bodily life, for nothing, for the silliest point of honor. So long it is only thoughts that one has, ideas that he hopes to be able to realize some day when he has found a sphere of action. Thus one has meanwhile only ideals, unexecuted ideas, or thoughts. Not till one has fallen in love with his corporeal self, and takes a pleasure in himself as a living flesh and blood person, but it is in mature years, in the man, that we find it so. Not till then has one a personal or egoistic interest, an interest not only of our spirit, for instance, but of total satisfaction, satisfaction of the whole chap, a selfish interest. Just compare a man with a youth, and see if he will not appear to you harder, less magnanimous, more selfish. Is he therefore worse? No, you say. He has only become more definite, or as you also call it, more practical. But the main point is this, that he makes himself more the center than does the youth, who is infatuated about other things, for example, God, fatherland, and so on. Therefore the man shows a second self-discovery. The youth found himself as spirit, and lost himself again in the general spirit, the complete, holy spirit. Man, mankind. In short, all ideals. The man finds himself as embodied spirit. Boys had only unintellectual interests, those interests devoid of thoughts and ideas, youths only intellectual ones. The man has bodily, personal, egoistic interests. If the child has not an object that it can occupy itself with, it feels ennui, for it does not yet know how to occupy itself with itself. The youth, on the contrary, throws the object aside, because for him thoughts arose out of the object. He occupies himself with his thoughts, his dreams, occupies himself intellectually, or his mind is occupied. 
The young man includes everything not intellectual under the contemptuous name of externalities. If he nevertheless sticks to the most trivial externalities, such as the customs of students' clubs and other formalities, it is because, and when, he discovers mind in them, when they are symbols to him. As I find myself back of things, and that as mind, so I must later find myself also back of thoughts, to wit, as their creator and owner. In the time of spirits thoughts grew till they overtopped my head, whose offspring they yet were. They hovered about me and convulsed me like fever fantasies, an awful power. The thoughts had become corporeal on their own account, were ghosts such as God, Emperor, Pope, fatherland, etc. If I destroy their corporeity, then I take them back into mine and say, I alone am corporeal. And now I take the world as what it is to me, as mine, as my property. I refer all to myself. If, as spirit, I had thrust away the world in the deepest contempt, so, as owner, I thrust spirits or ideas away into their vanity. They have no longer any power over me, as no earthly might has power over the spirit. The child was realistic, taken up with the things of this world, till little by little he succeeded in getting at what was back of those very things. The youth was idealistic, inspired by thoughts, till he worked his way up to where he became the man, the egoistic man, who deals with things and thoughts according to his heart's pleasure, and sets his personal interest above everything. Finally, the old man? When I become one, there will still be time enough to speak of that. End of chapter. Part First, Chapter Two, Section A of The Ego and His Own by Max Stirner. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Matt Messerschmidt in Freiburg, Germany. Chapter Two, and of the Old Times and the New. How each of us developed himself, what he strove for, attained, or missed, what objects he formerly pursued, and what plans and wishes his heart is now set on, what transformations his views have experienced, what perturbations his principles, in short, how he has today become what yesterday or years ago he was not. This he brings out again from his memory with more or less ease, and he feels with a special vividness what changes have taken place in himself when he has before his eyes the unrolling of another's life. Let us therefore look into the activities our forefathers busied themselves with. Section A. The Ancients Custom having once given the name of the Ancients to our pre-Christian ancestors, we will not throw it up against them that, in comparison with us experienced people, they ought properly to be called children, but will continue rather to honor them as our good old fathers. But how have they come to be antiquated, and who could displace them through his pretended newness? We know, of course, the revolutionary innovator and disrespectful heir, who even took away the sanctity of the Father's Sabbath to hallow his Sunday, and interrupted the course of time to begin it himself with a new chronology. We know him, and know that it is the Christian. But does he remain forever young? And is he today still the new man? Or will he too be superseded? as he has superseded the 
ancients. The fathers must doubtless have themselves begotten the young one who entombed them. Let us then peep at this act of generation. To the ancients the world was the truth, says Feuerbach, but he forgets to make the important addition, a truth whose untruth they tried to get back of, and at last really did. What is meant by those words of Feuerbach will be easily recognized if they are put alongside the Christian thesis of the vanity and transitoriness of the world. For, as the Christian can never convince himself of the vanity of the divine world, but believes in its eternal and unshakable truth, which, the more its depths are searched, must all the more brilliantly come to light and triumph. So the ancients on their side lived in the feeling of the world and mundane relations, such as the nature of ties of blood, were the truth before which their powerless eye must bow. The very thing on which the ancients set the highest value is spurned by Christians as the valueless, and what they recognized as truth, these brand as idle lies, the high significance of the fatherland disappears, and the Christian must regard himself as a stranger on earth. The sanctity of funeral rites, which sprang a work of art like the Antigone of Sophocles, is designated as a paltry thing. Let the dead bury their dead. The infrangible truth of family ties is represented as an untruth, which one cannot promptly enough get clear of, and so in everything. If we now see that to the two sides opposite things appear as truth, to the one the natural, to the other the intellectual, to one earthly things and relations, to the other heavenly, the heavenly fatherland, Jerusalem that is above, etc., it still remains to be considered how the new time and that undeniable reversal could come out of antiquity. But the ancients themselves worked toward making their truth a lie. Let us plunge at once into the midst of the most brilliant years of the ancients, into the Periclean century. Then the sophistic culture was spreading, and Greece made a pastime of what had hitherto been to her a monstrously serious matter. The fathers had been enslaved by the undisturbed power of existing things, too long for the posterity not to have to learn, by bitter experience, to feel themselves. Therefore the sophists, with courageous sauciness, pronounced the reassuring words, Don't be bluffed and diffuse the rationalistic doctrine. Use your understanding, your wit, your mind against everything. It is by having a good and well-drilled understanding that one gets through the world best, provides for himself the best lot, the pleasantest light. Thus they recognize in mind man's true weapon against the world. This is why they lay such stress on dialectic skill command of language, the art of disputation, etc. They announce that mind is to be used against everything, but they are still far removed from the holiness of the spirit, for to them it is a means, a weapon, as trickery and defiance serve children for the same purpose. Their mind is the unbribable understanding. Today we should call that a one-sided culture of the understanding, and add the warning, cultivate not only your understanding, but also, and especially, your heart. Socrates did the same. For, if the heart did not become free from its natural impulses, but remained filled with the most fortuitous contents and, as an uncriticized avidity, altogether in the power of things, nothing but a vessel of the most various appetites, 
then it was unavoidable that the free understanding must serve the bad heart, and was ready to justify everything that the wicked heart desired. Therefore Socrates says that it is not enough for one to use his understanding in all things, but it is a question of what cause one exerts it for. We should now say, one must serve the good cause. But serving the good cause is being moral. Hence Socrates is the founder of ethics. Certainly the principle of the sophistic doctrine must lead to the possibility that this blindest and most dependent slave of his desires might yet be an excellent sophist, and, with keen understanding, trim and expound everything in favor of his coarse heart. What could there be for which a good reason might not be found, or which might not be defended through thick and thin? Therefore Socrates says, you must be pure-hearted if your shrewdness is to be valued. At this point begins the second period of Greek liberation of the mind, the period of purity of heart. For the first was brought to a close by the sophists and their proclaiming the omnipotence of the understanding. But the heart remained worldly-minded, remained a servant of the world, always affected by worldly wishes. This coarse heart was to be cultivated from now on, the era of culture of the heart. But how is the heart to be cultivated? What the understanding, this one side of the mind, has reached, to wit, the capability of playing freely with and over every concern, awaits the heart also. Everything worldly must come to grief before it, so that at last family, commonwealth, fatherland, and the like are given up for the sake of the heart, that is, of blessedness, the heart's blessedness. Daily experience confirms the truth that the understanding must have renounced a thing many years before the heart has ceased to beat for it. So the sophistic understanding, too, had so far become master over the dominant ancient powers that they now needed only to be driven out of the heart, in which they dwelt unmolested, to have at last no part at all left in the man. This war is opened by Socrates. And not till the dying day of the old world does it end in peace. The examination of the heart takes its start with Socrates, and all the contents of the heart are sifted. In their last and extremest struggles, the ancients threw all the contents out of the heart and let it no longer beat for anything. This was the deed of the skeptics. The same purgation of the heart was now achieved in the skeptical age, as the understanding had succeeded in establishing the sophistic age. The sophistic culture has brought it to pass that one's understanding no longer stands still before anything, and the skeptical that his heart is no longer moved by anything. So long as man is entangled in the movements of the world and embarrassed by relations to the world, and he is so till the end of antiquity, because his heart still has to struggle for independence from the worldly. So long he is not yet spirit, for spirit is without body and has no relations to the world and corporality. For it the world does not exist, nor natural bonds, but only the spiritual and spiritual bonds. Therefore man must first become so completely unconcerned and reckless, so altogether without relations, that the skeptical culture presents him, so altogether indifferent to the world that even its falling in ruins would not move him, before he could feel himself as worldless, that is, as spirit. And this is the result of the gigantic work of the ancients, that man knows himself as a being without relations and without a world, as
Paul's spear. Only now, after all worldly care has left him, is he all in all to himself? Is he only for himself? Is he spirit for the spirit? Or, in plainer language, he cares only for the spiritual. In the Christian wisdom of serpents and innocence of doves, the two sides, understanding and heart, of the ancient liberation of mind are so completed that they appear young and new again and neither the one nor the other lets itself be bluffed any longer by the worldly and natural. Thus the ancients mounted to spirit and strove to become spiritual. But a man who wishes to be active as spirit is drawn to quite other tasks than he was able to set himself formerly, to tasks which really give something to do to the spirit and not to mere sense or acuteness which exerts itself only to become master of things. The spirit busies itself solely about the spiritual and seeks out the traces of mind in everything. To the believing spirit, everything comes from God and interests him only to the extent that it reveals this origin. To the philosophic spirit, everything appears with the stamp of reason and it interests him only so far as he is able to discover in it reason, that is, spiritual content. Not the spirit, then, which has to do with absolutely nothing unspiritual, with no thing, but only with the essence which exists behind and above things, with thoughts. Not that did the ancients exert, for they did not yet have it, no, they had only reached the point of struggling and longing for it, and therefore sharpened it against their too powerful foe, the world of sense. But what would not have been sensuous for them, since Jehovah, or the gods of the heathens, were yet far removed from the conception, God is spirit, since the heavenly fatherland had not yet stepped into the place of the sensuous, etc., they sharpened against the world of sense their sense, their acuteness. To this day the Jews, those precocious children of antiquity, have got no farther, and with all the subtlety and strength of their prudence and understanding, which easily becomes master of things and forces them to obey it. They cannot discover spirit, which takes no account whatever of things. The Christian has spiritual interests because he allows himself to be a spiritual man. The Jew does not even understand these interests in their purity because he does not allow himself to assign no value to things. He does not arrive at pure spirituality, a spirituality such as is religiously expressed, for instance, in the faith of Christians, which alone, without works, justifies. Their unspirituality sets Jews forever apart from Christians, and the spiritual man is incomprehensible to the unspiritual, as the unspiritual is contemptible to the spiritual. But the Jews have only the spirit of this world. The ancient acuteness and profundity lies as far from the spirit and the spirituality of the Christian world as earth from heaven. He who feels himself as free spirit is not oppressed and made anxious by the things of this world, because he does not care for them. If one is still to feel their burden, he must be narrow enough to attach weight to them as is evidently the case, for instance, when one is still concerned for his dear life. He to whom everything centers in knowing and conducting himself as a free spirit gives little heed to how scantily he is supplied meanwhile, and does not reflect at all on how he must make his arrangements to have a thoroughly free or enjoyable life. 
He is not disturbed by the inconveniences of the life that depends on things, because he lives only spiritually and on spiritual food, while aside from this he only gulps things down like a beast, hardly knowing it, and dies bodily to be sure, when his fodder gives out, but knows himself immortal as spirit, and closes his eyes with an adoration or a thought. His life is occupation with the spiritual, is thinking. The rest does not bother him. Let him busy himself with the spiritual in any way that he can, and chooses, in devotion, in contemplation, or in philosophic cognition. His doing is always thinking. And therefore Descartes, to whom this had at last become quite clear, could lay down the proposition, I think, that is, I am. This means, my thinking is my being or my life. Only when I live spiritually do I live. Only as spirit am I really. Or, I am spirit through and through, and nothing but spirit. Unlucky Peter Schlimmer, who has lost his shadow, is the portrait of this man become a spirit, for the spirit's body is shadowless. Over against this, how different among the ancients, stoutly and manfully as they might bear themselves against the might of things, they must yet acknowledge the might itself, and got no farther than to protect their life against it as well as possible. Only at a late hour, did they recognize that their true life was not that which they led in the fight against the things of the world, but the spiritual life turned away from these things. And when they saw this, they became Christians, the moderns, and innovators upon the ancients. But the life turned away from things, the spiritual life, no longer draws any nourishment from nature, but lives only on thoughts, and therefore is no longer life, but thinking. Yet it is not to be supposed now that the ancients were without thoughts, just as the most spiritual man is not to be conceived of as if he could be without life. Rather, they had their thoughts about everything, about the world, man, the gods, etc., and showed themselves keenly active in bringing all this to their consciousness. But they did not know thought, even though they thought of all sorts of things, and worried themselves with their thoughts. Compare with their position the Christian saying, My thoughts are not your thoughts. As the heaven is higher than the earth, so are my thoughts higher than your thoughts. And remember what was said above about our child thoughts. What is antiquity seeking, then? The true enjoyment of life. We will find that at bottom it is all the same as the true life. The Greek poet Simonides sings, Health is the noblest good for mortal man. The next to this is beauty. The third riches acquired without guile. The fourth, the enjoyment of social pleasures in the company of young friends. These are all good things of life, pleasures of life. What else was Diogenes of Sinope seeking for than the true enjoyment of life, which he discovered in having the least possible wants? What else Aristippus, who found it in a cheery temper under all circumstances? They are all seeking for cheery, unclouded life courage, for cheeriness. They are seeking to be of good cheer. The Stoics want to realize the wise man, the man with practical philosophy, the man who knows how to live, a wise life. Therefore, they find him in contempt for the world, in a life without development, without spreading out, without friendly relations with the world thus in the isolated life, 
in life as life, not in life with others. Only the Stoic lives. All else is dead for him. The Epicureans, on the contrary, demand a moving life, for which it is yet necessary that what can be and what is repelled should remain existing, otherwise there would be no longer anything to repel. He reaches at most an extreme degree of liberation, and is distinguished only in degree from the less liberated. If he even got as far as the deadening of the earthly sense, which at last admits only the monotonous whisper of the word Brahm, he nevertheless would not be essentially distinguishable from the sensual man. Even the stoic attitude in manly virtue amounts only to this, that one must maintain and assert oneself against the world. And the ethics of the stoics, their only science, since they could tell nothing about the spirit but how it should behave toward the world, and of nature, physics, only this, that the wise man must assert himself against it, is not a doctrine of the spirit, but only a doctrine of the repelling of the world and of self-assertion against the world. And this consists in imperturbability and equanimity of life, and so in the most explicit Roman virtue. The Romans too, Horace, Cicero, and others, went no further than this practical philosophy. The comfort, Hedone, of the Epicureans is the same practical philosophy the Stoics teach, only trickier, more deceitful. They teach only another behavior toward the world, exhort us only to take a shrewd attitude toward the world. The world must be deceived, for it is my enemy. The break with the world is completely carried through by the skeptics. My entire relation to the world is worthless and truthless. Timon says, The feelings and thoughts which we draw from the world contain no truth. What is truth? cries Pilate. According to Pyrrho's doctrine, the world is neither good nor bad, neither beautiful nor ugly, but these are predicates which I give it. Timon says that, In itself, nothing is either good or bad that man only thinks of it thus or thus. To face the world only ataraxia, unmovingness, and aphasia, speechlessness, or, in other words, isolated inwardness, are left. There is no longer any truth to be recognized in the world. Things contradict themselves. Thoughts about things are without distinction. Good and bad are all the same so that what one calls good and other finds bad. Here the recognition of truth is at an end, and only the man without power of recognition, the man who finds in the world nothing to recognize, is left. And this man just leaves the truth-vacant world where it is, and takes no account of it. So antiquity gets through with the world of things, the order of the world, the world as a whole, but to the order of the world, or the things of this world, belong not only nature, but all relations in which man sees himself placed by nature, as in the family, the community, in short, the so-called natural bonds. With the world of the spirit, Christianity then begins. The man who still faces the world armed is the ancient, the heathen, to which class the Jew too as non-Christian belongs. The man who has come to be led by nothing but his heart's pleasure, the interest he takes, his fellow feeling, his spirit, is the modern, the Christian. As the ancients worked toward the conquest of the world and strove to release man from the heavy trammels of connection with other things, at last they came also to the dissolution of the state, and giving preference to everything private. Of course, community, family, and so forth, as natural relations, are burdensome hindrances which diminish my spiritual freedom. End of chapter 2, section A.
Part First, Chapter Two, Section B of The Ego and His Own by Max Stirner. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Matt Messerschmidt in Freiburg, Germany. Section B The Moderns. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. The old is passed away. Behold, all is become new. As it was said above, to the ancients the world was a truth. We must say here, to the moderns the spirit was a truth. But here, as there, we must not omit the supplement, a truth whose untruth they tried to get back of and at last they really do. A course similar to that which antiquity took may be demonstrated in Christianity also, in that the understanding was held a prisoner under the dominion of the Christian dogmas up to the time preparatory to the Reformation, but in the pre-Reformation century asserted itself sophistically and played heretical pranks with all tenets of the faith. And the talk then was, especially in Italy and at the Roman court. If only the heart remains Christian-minded, the understanding may go right on, taking its pleasure. Long before the Reformation, people were so thoroughly accustomed to fine-spun wranglings that the Pope, and most others, looked on Luther's appearance, too, as a mere wrangling of monks at first. Humanism corresponds to sophisticism, and as in the time of the Sophists, Greek life stood in its fullest bloom, the Periclean Age. So the most brilliant things happened in the time of humanism, or, as one might perhaps also say, of Machiavellianism, printing, the New World, etc. All this time the heart was still far from wanting to relieve itself of its Christian contents. But, finally, the Reformation, like Socrates, took hold seriously of the heart itself, and since then hearts have kept growing visibly more unchristian. As with Luther, people began to take the matter to heart. The outcome of this step of the Reformation must be that the heart also gets lightened of the heavy burden of Christian faith. The heart, from day to day more unchristian, loses the contents with which it had busied itself, till at last nothing but empty warm-heartedness is left it. The quite general love of men, the love of man, the love of freedom, self-consciousness. Only so is Christianity complete, because it has become bald, withered, and void of contents, there are now no contents whatsoever against which the heart does not mutiny, unless, indeed, the heart unconsciously or without self-consciousness lets them slip in. The heart criticizes to death with hard-hearted mercilessness everything that wants to make its way in, and is capable, except, as before, unconsciously or taken by surprise, of no friendship no love. What could there be in men to love, since they are all alike egoists? None of them man as such. None are spirit only. The Christian loves only the spirit. But where could one be found who should really be nothing but spirit? To have a liking for the corporeal man with hide and hair, why, that would no longer be a spiritual warm-heartedness. It would be treason against pure warm-heartedness, the theoretical regard. For pure warm-heartedness is by no means to be conceived as that kindliness that gives everybody a friendly handshake. On the contrary, pure warm-heartedness is warm-hearted toward nobody. It is only a theoretical interest concern for man as man, not as a person.
the person is repulsive to it because of being egoistic, because of not being that abstraction, man. But it is only for the abstraction that one can have a theoretical regard. To pure warm-heartedness or pure theory, men exist only to be criticized, scoffed at, and thoroughly despised. To it, no less than to the fanatical parson, they are only filth and other such nice things. Pushed to this extremity of disinterested warm-heartedness, we must finally become conscious that the spirit, which alone the Christian loves, is nothing. In other words, that the spirit is a lie. What has here been set down roughly, summarily, and doubtless as yet incomprehensibly, will, it is to be hoped, become clear as we go on. Let us take up the inheritance left by the ancients, and as active workmen, do with it as much as can be done with it. The world lies despised at our feet, far beneath us in our heaven, into which its mighty arms are no longer thrust, and its stupefying breath does not come. Seductively as it may pose, it can delude nothing but our senses. It cannot lead astray the spirit, and spirit, alone after all, we really are. Having once got back of things, the spirit has also got above them, and become free from their bonds, emancipated, supernal, free. So speaks spiritual freedom. To the spirit which, after long toil, has got rid of the world, the worldless spirit. Nothing is left after the loss of the world and the worldly but the spirit and the spiritual. Yet, as it has only moved away from the world and made of itself a being free from the world, without really being able to annihilate the world, this remains to it a stumbling block that cannot be cleared away, a discredited existence. And, as, on the other hand, it knows and recognizes nothing but the spirit and the spiritual, it must perpetually carry about with it the longing to spiritualize the world, to redeem it from the blacklist. Therefore, like a youth, it goes about with plans for the redemption or improvement of the world. The ancients, we saw, served the worldly, the natural, the natural order of the world, but they incessantly asked themselves of this service, and, when they had tired themselves to death in ever-renewed attempts at revolt, then, among their last sighs, was born to them the God, the conqueror of the world. All their doing had been nothing but wisdom of the world, an effort to get back of the world and above it. And what is the wisdom of the many following centuries? What did the moderns try to get back of? No longer to get back of the world, for the ancients had accomplished that, but back of the God whom the ancients bequeathed to them, back of the God who is spirit, back of everything that is the spirits, the spiritual. But the activity of the spirit, which searches even the depths of the Godhead, is theology. If the ancients have nothing to show but wisdom of the world, the moderns never did, nor do, make their way further than to theology. We shall later see that even the newest revolts against God are nothing but the extremest efforts of theology, that is, theological insurrections. End of section. Part First, Chapter Two, 
Section B of The Ego and His Own by Max Stirner. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Matt Messerschmidt in Freiburg, Germany. The Moderns. Subdivision 1. The Spirit. The realm of spirits is monstrously great. There is an infinite deal of the spiritual. Yet let us look and see what the spirit, this bequest of the ancients, properly is. Out of their birth pangs it came forth, but they themselves could not utter themselves as spirit. If they could give birth to it, it itself must speak. The born God, the Son of Man, is the first to utter the word, the Spirit. He, God, has to do with nothing earthly and no earthly relationship, but solely with the Spirit and spiritual relationships. Is my courage, indestructible under all the world's blows, my inflexibility and my obduracy, perchance already Spirit, in the full sense, because the world cannot touch it? Why, then it would not yet be at enmity with the world, and all its actions would consist merely in not succumbing to the world. No, as long as it does not busy itself with itself alone, as long as it does not have to do with its world, the spiritual, alone, it is not free spirit, but only the spirit of this world, the spirit fettered to it. The spirit is free spirit, that is, really spirit, only in a world of its own. In this, the earthly world, it is a stranger. Only through a spiritual world is the spirit really spirit, for this world does not understand it, and does not know how to keep the maiden from a foreign land from departing. But where is it to get this spiritual world? Where but out of itself? It must reveal itself, and the words that it speaks, the revelations in which it unveils itself, these are its world. As a visionary lives and has his world only in the visionary pictures that he himself creates, as a crazy man generates for himself his own dream world, without which he could not be crazy, so the spirit must create for itself its spirit world, and is not spirit till it creates it. Thus its creations make its spirit, and by its creatures we know it, the Creator. In them it lives, they are its world. Now, what is the spirit? It is the creator of a spiritual world. Even in you and me, people do not recognize spirit until they see that we have appropriated to ourselves something spiritual. Though thoughts may have been set before us, we have at least brought them to live in ourselves. For as long as we were children, the most edifying thoughts might have been laid before us without our wishing, or being able, to reproduce them in ourselves. So the spirit also exists only when it creates something spiritual. It is real only together with the spiritual, its creature. As then, we know it by its works, the question is what these works are. But the works or children of the spirit are nothing else but spirits. If I had before me Jews, Jews of the true metal, I should have to stop here and leave them standing before this mystery, as for almost two thousand years they have remained standing before it, unbelieving and without knowledge. But as you, my dear reader, are at least not a full-blooded Jew, for such a one will not go astray as far as this. We will still go along a bit of road together, till perhaps you too turn your back on me because I laugh in your face. If someone told you you were altogether spirit, you would take hold of your body and not believe him, but answer, I have a spirit, no doubt, but do not exist only as spirit, but as a man with a body. You would still distinguish yourself from your spirit. 
But, replies he, it is your destiny, even though you are yet going about in the fetters of the body, to be one day a blessed spirit. And however you may conceive of the future aspect of your spirit, so much is yet certain that in death you will put off this body and yet keep yourself, your spirit, for all eternity. Accordingly, your spirit is the eternal and true in you, the body only a dwelling here below, which you may leave and perhaps exchange for another. Now you believe him. For the present, indeed, you are not spirit only. But when you emigrate from the mortal body, as one day you must, then you will have to help yourself without this body. And therefore it is needful that you be prudent and care in time for your proper self. What should it profit a man if he gained the whole world and yet suffered damage in his soul? But, even granted the doubts, raised in the course of time against the tenets of the Christian faith, have long since robbed you of faith in the immortality of your spirit. You have nevertheless left one tenet undisturbed, and yet ingenuously adhered to the one truth, that the spirit is your better part, and that the spiritual has greater claims on you than anything else. Despite all your atheism, in zeal against egoism, you concur with the believers in immortality. But whom do you think of under the name of egoist? A man who, instead of living to an idea that is a spiritual thing, and sacrificing it to his personal advantage, serves the latter. A good patriot brings his sacrifice to the altar of the fatherland. But it cannot be disputed that the fatherland is an idea since for beasts incapable of mind, or children as yet without mind, there is no fatherland and no patriotism. Now if anyone does not approve himself as a good patriot, he betrays his egoism with reference to the fatherland. And so the matter stands in innumerable other cases. He who in human society takes the benefit of a prerogative sins egoistically against the idea of equality. He who exercises dominion is blamed as an egoist against the idea of liberty, and so on. You despise the egoist because he puts the spiritual in the background as compared with the personal, and has his eyes on himself where you would like to see him act to favor an idea. The distinction between you is that he makes himself the central point, but you the spirit or that you cut your identity in two and exalt your proper self, the spirit, to be ruler of the paltrier remainder, while he will hear nothing of this cutting in two, and pursues spiritual and material interests just as he pleases. You think, to be sure, that you are falling foul only of those who enter into no spiritual interest at all. But, in fact, you curse at everybody who does not look on the spiritual interest as his true and highest interest. You carry your nightly service for this beauty so far that you affirm her to be the only beauty of the world. You live not to yourself, but to your spirit, and to what is the spirit's, and that is, ideas. As the spirit exists only in its creating of the spiritual, let us take a look about us for its first creation. If only it has accomplished this, there follows thenceforth a natural propagation of creations, as according to the myth only the first human beings needed to be created, the rest of the race propagating of itself. The first creation, on the other hand, must come forth out of nothing. The spirit has toward its realization nothing but itself, or rather, it has not yet even itself, but must create itself. Hence, its first creation is itself, the spirit. Mystical as this sounds, we yet go through it as an everyday experience. Are you a thinking being before you think? In creating the first thought, you create yourself, the thinking one. For you do not think before you think a thought, or have a thought. Is it not your singing that first makes you a singer? Your talking that first makes you a talker? 
Now so too it is the production of the spiritual that first makes you a spirit. Meantime, as you distinguish yourself from the thinker, singer, and talker, so you no less distinguish yourself from the spirit, and feel very clearly that you are something besides spirit. But, as in the thinking ego, hearing and sight easily vanish in the enthusiasm of thought, so you also have been seized by the spirit enthusiasm, and you now long with all your might to become holy spirit, and to be dissolved in spirit. The spirit is your ideal, the unattained, the otherworldly. Spirit is the name of your God. God is spirit. Against all that is not spirit, you are a zealot. And therefore you play the zealot against yourself, who cannot get rid of the remainder of the non-spiritual. Instead of saying, I am more than spirit, you say with contrition, I am less than spirit. And spirit, pure spirit, or the spirit that is nothing but spirit, I can only think of, but am not. And since I am not it, it is another, exists as another, whom I call God. It exists in the nature of the case that the spirit that is to exist as pure spirit must be an otherworldly one. For since I am not it, it follows that it can only be outside me, since in any case a human being is not fully comprehended in the concept spirit. It follows that the pure spirit, the spirit as such, can only be outside of men, beyond the human world, not earthly, but heavenly. Only from this disunion in which I and the spirit lie, only because I and spirit are not names for one and the same thing, but different names for completely different things, only because I am not spirit and spirit not I, only from this do we get a quite tautological explanation of the necessity that the spirit dwells in the other world, that is, is God. But from this it also appears how thoroughly theological is the liberation that Feuerbach is laboring to give us. What he says is that we had only mistaken our own essence, and therefore looked for it in the other world, but that now, when we see that God was only our human essence, we must recognize it again as ours and move it back out of the other world into this. To God, who is spirit, Feuerbach gives the name Our Essence. Can we put up with this, that our essence is brought into opposition to us, that we are split into an essential and an unessential self? Do we not therewith go back into the dreary misery of seeing ourselves banished out of ourselves? What have we gained then? when for a variation we have transferred into ourselves the divine outside us. Are we that which is in us, as little as we are that which is outside us? I am as little my heart as I am my sweetheart, this other self of mine. Just because we are not the spirit that dwells in us, just for that reason we had to take it and set it outside us. It was not we, did not coincide with us, and therefore we could not think of it as existing otherwise than outside us, on the other side from us, in the other world. With the strength of despair, Feuerbach clutches at the total substance of Christianity, not to throw it away, no, to drag it to himself, to draw it, the long year and forth, ever distant, out of its heaven with a last effort, and keep it by him forever. Is not that a clutch of the uttermost despair, a clutch for life or death? And is it not at the same time the Christian yearning and hungering for the other world? The hero wants not to go into the other world, but to draw the other world to him and compel it to become this world. And since then has not all the world with more or less consciousness, been crying that this world is the vital point, and heaven must come down on earth and be experienced even here? 
Let us, in brief, set Feuerbach's theological view and our contradiction over against each other. The essence of man is man's supreme being. Now by religion, to be sure, the supreme being is called God and regarded as an objective essence. But in truth, it is only man's own essence. And therefore, the turning point of the world's history is that henceforth, no longer God, but man, is to appear to man as God. To this we reply, the supreme being is indeed the essence of man. But just because it is his essence, and not he himself, it remains quite immaterial whether we see it outside him and view it as God, or find it in him and call it essence of man, or man. I am neither God nor man, neither the supreme essence nor my essence. And therefore it is all one in the main whether I think of the essence as in me or outside me. Nay. We really do always think of the Supreme Being as in both kinds of otherworldliness, the inward and the outward, at once. For the Spirit of God is, according to the Christian view, also our spirit, and dwells in us. It dwells in heaven and dwells in us. We poor things are just its dwelling, and if Feuerbach goes on to destroy its heavenly dwelling, and force it to move to us bag and baggage, then we, its earthly apartments, will be badly overcrowded. But after this digression, which, if we were at all proposing to work by line and level, we should have had to save for later pages in order to avoid repetition, we return to the spirit's first creation, the spirit itself. The spirit is something other than myself. But this other, what is it? End of section. Part First, Chapter Two, Section B of The Ego and His Own by Max Stirner. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Matt Messerschmidt in Ann Arbor, Michigan, USA. The Moderns. Subdivision 2. The Possessed. Have you ever seen a spirit? No, not I, but my grandmother. Now, you see, it's just so with me, too. I myself haven't seen any, but my grandmother had them running between her feet all sorts of ways and out of confidence in our grandmother's honesty, we believe in the existence of spirits. But had we no grandfathers then, and did they not shrug their shoulders every time our grandmothers told about their ghosts? Yes, these were unbelieving men who have harmed our good religion much, those rationalists. We shall feel that. What else lies at the bottom of this warm faith in ghosts? if not the good faith in the existence of spiritual beings in general? And is not this latter itself disastrously unsettled, if saucy men of the understanding may disturb the former? The Romanticists were quite conscious what a blow the very belief in God suffered by the laying aside of the belief in spirits or ghosts. And they tried to help us out of the baleful consequences, not only by their reawakened fairy world, but at last and especially by the intrusion of a higher world, by the somnambulists of Prevorst, etc. The good believers and fathers of the church did not suspect that with the belief in ghosts the foundation of religion was withdrawn, and that since then it had been floating in the air. He who no longer believes in any ghost need only to travel on consistently in his unbelief to see that there is no separate being at all, concealed behind things. No ghost, or what is naively reckoned as synonymous even in our use of words, no spirit. Spirits exist. Look about in the world and say for yourself whether a spirit does not gaze upon you out of everything. Out of the lovely little flower there speaks to you the spirit of the Creator, who has shaped it so wonderfully. The stars proclaim the spirit that established their order. From the mountaintops a spirit of sublimity breathes down. 
Out of the waters a spirit of yearning murmurs up. Not of men, millions of spirits speak. The mountains may sink, the flowers fade, the world of stars fall in ruins, the men die. What matters the wreck of these visible bodies? The spirit, the invisible spirit, abides eternally. Yes, the whole world is haunted. Only is haunted? Nay, it itself walks. It is uncanny through and through. It is the wandering, seeming body of a spirit. It is a spook. What else should a ghost be, then, than an apparent body, but real spirit? Well, the world is empty, is not, is only glamorous semblance. Its truth is the spirit alone. It is the seeming body of a spirit. Look out near or far. A ghostly world surrounds you everywhere. You are always having apparitions or visions. Everything that appears to you is only the phantom of an indwelling spirit. It is a ghostly apparition. The world is to you only a world of appearances, behind which the spirit walks. You see spirits. Are you perchance thinking of comparing yourself with the ancients who saw gods everywhere? Gods, my dear modern, are not spirits. Gods do not degrade the world to a semblance and do not spiritualize it. But to you the whole world is spiritualized and have become an enigmatical ghost. Therefore do not wonder if you likewise find in yourself nothing but a spook. Is not your body haunted by your spirit? And is not the latter alone the true and real, the former only the transitory, not, or a semblance? Are we not all ghosts, uncanny beings that wait for deliverance, to wit, spirits? Since the spirit appeared in the world, since the word became flesh. Since then the world has been spiritualized, enchanted, a spook. You have spirit, for you have thoughts. What are your thoughts? Spiritual entities. Not things, then? No, but the spirit of things. The main point in all things. The inmost in them. Their idea. Consequently, what you think is not only your thought. On the contrary, it is that in the world which is most real, that which is properly to be called true. It is the truth itself. If only I think truly, I think the truth. I may, to be sure, err with regard to the truth, and fail to recognize it. But if I recognize truly, the object of my cognition is the truth. So, I suppose, you strive at all times to recognize the truth. To me, the truth is sacred. It may well happen that I find a truth incomplete and replace it with a better, but the truth I cannot abrogate. I believe in the truth, therefore I search in it. Nothing transcends it. It is eternal. Sacred, eternal is the truth. It is the sacred, the eternal. But you, who let yourself be filled and led by this sacred thing, are yourself hallowed. Further, the sacred is not for your senses, and you never as a sensual man discover its trace, but for your faith, or more definitely still, for your spirit. For it itself, you know, is a spiritual thing, a spirit is spirit for the spirit. The sacred is by no means so easily to be set aside as many at present affirm, who no longer take this unsuitable word into their mouths. If even in a single respect I am still upbraided as an egoist, there is left the thought of something else which I should serve more than myself, and which must be to me more important than everything. In short, somewhat in which I should have to seek my true welfare, something sacred. However human this sacred thing may look, though it be the human itself, 
that does not take away its sacredness, but at most changes it from an unearthly to an earthly sacred thing, from a divine one to a human. Sacred things exist only for the egoist who does not acknowledge himself, the involuntary egoist, for him who is always looking after his own and yet does not count himself as the highest being, who serves only himself and at the same time always thinks he is serving a higher being, who knows nothing higher than himself and is yet infatuated about something higher. In short, for the egoist who would not like to be an egoist, and abases himself, combats his egoism, but at the same time abases himself only for the sake of being exalted, and therefore of gratifying his egoism. Because he would like to cease to be an egoist, he looks about in heaven and earth for higher beings to serve and sacrifice himself to. But, However much he shakes and disciplines himself, in the end he does all for his own sake, and the disreputable egoism will not come off him. On this account, I call him the involuntary egoist. His toil and care to get away from himself is nothing but the misunderstood impulse to self-dissolution. If you are bound to your past hour, if you must babble today because you babbled yesterday, if you cannot transform yourself each instant, you feel yourself fettered to slavery and benumbed. Therefore, over each minute of your existence, a fresh minute of the future beckons to you. And developing yourself, you get away from yourself, that is, from the self that was at that moment. As you are at each instant, you are your own creature, and in this very creature, you do not wish to lose yourself, the Creator. You are yourself a higher being than you are, and surpass yourself. But that you are the one who is higher than you, that is, that you are not only creature, but likewise your Creator. Just this, as an involuntary egoist, you fail to recognize. And therefore, the higher essence is to you an alien essence. Every higher essence, such as truth, mankind, and so on, is an essence over us. Alienness is a criterion of the sacred. In everything sacred, there lies something uncanny, strange, such as we are not quite familiar and at home in. What is sacred to me is not my own, and if for instance, the property of others was not sacred to me. I should look on it as mine, which I should take to myself when occasion offered. Or, on the other side, if I regard the face of the Chinese emperor as sacred, it remains strange to my eye, which I close at its appearance. Why is an incontrovertible mathematical truth which might even be called eternal according to the common understanding of words, not sacred, because it is not revealed or not the revelation of a higher being. If by revealed we understand only the so-called religious truths, we go far astray and entirely fail to recognize the breadth of the concept higher being. Atheists keep up their scoffing at the higher being which was also honored under the name of the highest or etre supreme, and trample in the dust one proof of his existence after another, without noticing that they themselves, out of need for a higher being, only annihilate the old to make room for a new. Is man, perchance, not a higher essence than an individual man? And must not the truths, rights, and ideas which result from the concept of him be honored and counted sacred as revelations of this very concept? For, even though we should abrogate again many a truth that seemed to be made manifest by this concept, yet this would only evince a misunderstanding on our part, 
without in the least degree harming the sacred concept itself, or taking their sacredness from those truths that must rightly be looked upon as its revelations. Man reaches beyond every individual man, and yet, though he be his essence, is not in fact his essence, which rather would be as single as he the individual himself, but a general and higher, yes, for atheists, the highest essence. And as the divine revelations were not written down by God with his own hand, but made public through the Lord's instruments, so also the new highest essence does not write out its revelations itself, but lets them come to our knowledge through true men. Only the new essence betrays, in fact, a more spiritual style of conception than the old God, because the latter was still represented in a sort of embodiedness or form, while the undimmed spirituality of the new is retained, and no special material body is fancied for it. And withal, it does not lack corporeity, which even takes on a yet more seductive appearance, because it looks more natural and mundane, and consists in nothing less than in every bodily man. Yes, or outright in humanity, or all men. Thereby, the spectralness of the spirit in a seeming body has once again become really solid and popular. Sacred, then, is the highest essence and everything in which the highest essence reveals or will reveal itself. But hallowed are they who recognize this highest essence together with its own, together with its revelations. The sacred hollows in turn its reverer, who by his worship becomes himself a saint, as likewise what he does is saintly, a saintly walk, saintly thoughts, and saintly actions, imaginations, and aspirations. It is easily understood that the conflict over what is revered as the highest essence can be significant only so long as even the most embittered opponents concede to each other the main point that there is a highest essence to which worship or service is due. If one should smile compassionately at the whole struggle over a highest essence, as a Christian might at the war of words between a Shia and a Sunni, or between a Brahmin and a Buddhist, then the hypothesis of a highest essence would be null in his eyes, and the conflict on this basis an idle play. Whether then the one God or the three in one, whether the Lutheran God or the Atreus Supreme, or not God at all, but man, may represent the highest essence. That makes no difference at all for him who denies the highest essence itself. For in his eyes, those servants of a highest essence are one and all pious people the most raging atheist, not less than the most faith-filled Christian. In the foremost place of the sacred, then, stands the highest essence and the faith in this essence, our holy faith. The Spook With ghosts we arrive in the spirit realm, in the realm of essences. What haunts the universe, and has its occult, incomprehensible being there, is precisely the mysterious spook that we call highest essence. And to get to the bottom of this spook, to comprehend it, to discover reality in it, to prove the existence of God, this task men set to themselves for thousands of years, with the horrible impossibility the endless denied labor of transforming the spook into a non-spook, the unreal into something real, the spirit into an entire and corporeal person. With this they tormented themselves to death. Behind the existing world they sought the thing in itself, the essence. Behind the thing they sought the unthing. When one looks to the bottom of anything, searches out its essence. One often discovers something quite other than what it seems to be, 
honeyed speech and a lying heart, pompous words and beggarly thoughts, and so on. By bringing the essence into prominence, one degrades the hitherto misapprehended appearance to a bare semblance, a deception. The essence of the world, so attractive and splendid, is for him who looks to the bottom of it, emptiness. Emptiness equals world's essence, world's doings. Now he who is religious does not occupy himself with the deceitful semblance, with the empty appearances, but looks upon the essence, and in the essence has the truth. The essences which are deduced from some appearances are the evil essences, and conversely from others the good. The essence of human feeling, for instance, is love. The essence of human will is the good, that of one's thinking, the true, and so on. What at first passed for existence, such as the world and its like, appears now as bare semblance, and the truly existent is much rather the essence, whose realm is filled with gods, spirits, demons, with good or bad essences. Only this inverted world, the world of essences, truly exists now. The human heart may be loveless, but its essence exists, God, who is love. Human thought may wander in error, but its essence, truth, exists. God is truth, and the like. To know and acknowledge essences alone, and nothing but essences, that is religion. Its realm is a realm of essences, spooks, and ghosts. The longing to make the spook comprehensible, or to realize nonsense, has brought about a corporeal ghost, a ghost or spirit with a real body, an embodied ghost. How the strongest and most talented Christians have tortured themselves to get a conception of this ghostly apparition. But there always remained the contradiction of two natures, the divine and the human, the ghostly and sensual. There remained the most wondrous spook, a thing that was not a thing. Never yet was a ghost more soul-torturing, and no shaman who pricks himself to raving fury and nerve-lacerating cramps to conjure a ghost can endure such soul-torment as Christians suffered from that most incomprehensible ghost. But through Christ, the truth of the matter had at the same time come to light that the veritable spirit or ghost is man. The corporeal or embodied spirit, is just man. He himself is the ghostly being, and at the same time the being's appearance and existence. Henceforth, man no longer, in typical cases, shudders at ghosts outside himself, but at himself. He is terrified at himself. In the depth of his breast dwells the spirit of sin. Even the faintest thought, and this is itself a spirit, you know, may be a devil, etc. The ghost has put on a body. God has become man. But now man is himself the gruesome spook which he seeks to get back of, to exorcise, to fathom, to bring to reality and to speech. Man is spirit. What matter if the body wither, if only the spirit is saved? Everything rests on the spirit, and the spirit's or soul's welfare becomes the exclusive goal. Man has become to himself a ghost, an uncanny spook, to which there is even assigned a distinct seat in the body, a dispute over the seat of the soul, whether in the head, etc. You are not to me, and I am not to you, a higher essence. Nevertheless, a higher essence may be hidden in each of us, and call forth a mutual reverence. To take at once the most general, man lives in you and in me. If I did not see man in you, what occasion should I have to respect you? To be sure, you are not man in his true and adequate form, but only a mortal veil of his, from which he can withdraw without himself ceasing. But yet for the present this general and higher essence is housed in you, 
and you present before me, because an imperishable spirit has in you assumed a perishable body, so that really your form is only an assumed one, a spirit that appears, appears in you, without being bound to your body and to this particular mode of appearance, therefore a spook. Hence I do not regard you as a higher essence, but only respect that higher essence which walks in you. I respect man in you. The ancients did not observe anything of this sort in their slaves, and the higher essence man found as yet little response. To make up for this, they saw in each other ghosts of another sort. The people is a higher essence than an individual, and like man or the spirit of man, a spirit haunting the individual, the spirit of the people. For this reason they revered the spirit, and only so far as he served this or else a spirit related to it, as in the spirit of the family, could the individual appear significant, only for the sake of the higher essence, the people, was consideration allowed to the member of the people. As you are hallowed to us by man who haunts you, so at every time men have been hallowed by some higher essence or other, like people, family, and such. Only for the sake of a higher essence has anyone been honored from of old. Only as a ghost has he been regarded in the light of a hallowed, a protected and recognized person. If I cherish you because I hold you dear, because in you my heart finds nourishment, my need satisfaction, then it is not done for the sake of a higher essence whose hallowed body you are, not on account of my beholding in you a ghost, an appearing spirit, but from egoistic pleasure. You yourself with your essence are valuable to me, for your essence is not a higher one is not a higher and more general than you, is unique like yourself, because it is you. But it is not only man that haunts, so does everything. The higher essence, the spirit, that walks in everything, is at the same time bound to nothing, and only appears in it. Ghosts in every corner, here would be the place to pass the haunting spirits in review, if they were not to come before us again further on in order to vanish before egoism. Hence, let only a few of them be particularized by way of example, in order to bring us at once to our attitude toward them. Sacred above all is the Holy Spirit. Sacred the truth. Sacred our right, law, a good cause, majesty, marriage, the common good, order, fatherland, and so on. Wheels in the head. Man, your head is haunted. You have wheels in your head. You imagine great things and depict to yourself a whole world of gods that has an existence for you, a spirit realm to which you suppose yourself to be called an ideal that beckons to you. You have a fixed idea. Do not think that I am jesting or speaking figuratively when I regard those persons who cling to the higher, and because the vast majority belongs under this head, almost the whole world of men, as veritable fools, fools in a madhouse. What is it, then, that is called a fixed idea? An idea that has subjected the man to itself. When you recognize, with regard to such a fixed idea, that it is a folly, you shut its slave up in an asylum. And is the truth of the faith, say, which we are not to doubt, the majesty of the people, which we are not to strike at, he who does is guilty of lay's majesty, virtue, against which the censor is not to let a word pass, that morality may be kept pure, are these not fixed ideas? Is not the stupid chatter of most of our newspapers the babble of fools who suffer from the fixed idea of morality, legality, Christianity, and so forth, and only seem to go about free because the madhouse in which they walk takes in so broad a space? 
Touch the fixed idea of such a fool, and you will at once have to guard your back against the lunatic's stealthy malice. For these great lunatics are like the little so-called lunatics in this point too, that they assail by stealth him who touches their fixed idea. They first steal his weapon, steal free speech from him, and then they fall upon him with their nails. Every day now lays bare the cowardice and vindictiveness of these maniacs, and the stupid populace hurrahs for their crazy measures. One must read the journals of this period, and must hear the Philistines talk, to get the horrible conviction that one is shut up in a house with fools. Thou shalt not call thy brother a fool, if thou dost, etc. But I do not fear the curse, and I say, my brothers are arch fools. Whether a poor fool of the insane asylum is possessed by the fancy that he is God the Father, Emperor of Japan, the Holy Spirit, or what not, or whether a citizen in comfortable circumstances conceives that it is his mission to be a good Christian, a faithful Protestant, a loyal citizen, a virtuous man. Both these are one and the same fixed idea. He who has never tried and dared not to be a good Christian, a faithful Protestant, a virtuous man, and the like, is possessed and prepossessed by faith, virtuousness, etc. Just as the schoolmen philosophized only inside the belief of the Church, as Pope Benedict XIV wrote fat books inside the papist superstition, without ever throwing a doubt upon this belief, as authors fill whole folios on the state without calling into question the fixed idea of the state itself, as our newspapers are crammed with politics because they are conjured into the fancy that man was created to be a zoon politicon, and so also subjects vegetate in subjection, virtuous people in virtue, liberals in humanity, without ever putting to these fixed ideas of theirs the searching knife of criticism. Undislodgeable, like a madman's delusion, those thoughts stand on a firm footing, and he who doubts them lays hands on the sacred. Yes, the fixed idea. That is the truly sacred. Is it perchance only people possessed by the devil that meet us? Or do we as often come upon people possessed in the contrary way? Possessed by the good, by virtue, morality, the law, or some principle or other? Possessions of the devil are not the only ones. God works on us, and the devil does. The former workings of grace, the latter workings of the devil. Possessed people are set in their opinions. If the word possession displeases you, then call it prepossession. Yes, since the spirit possesses you, and all inspirations come from it, call it inspiration and enthusiasm. I add the complete enthusiasm, for we cannot stop with the sluggish, halfway kind, is called fanaticism. It is precisely among cultured people that fanaticism is at home, for man is cultured so far as he takes an interest in spiritual things. An interest in spiritual things, when it is alive, is and must be fanaticism. It is a fanatical interest in the sacred, fanu. Observe our liberals. Look into the Zaxus and Fatislands letter. Hear what Schlosser says. Holbach's company constituted a regular plot against the traditional doctrine and the existing system, and its members were as fanatical on behalf of their unbelief as monks and priests, Jesuits and pietists, Methodists, missionary and Bible societies, commonly are for mechanical worship and orthodoxy. Take notice how a moral man behaves who today often thinks he is through with God and throws off Christianity as a bygone thing. If you ask him whether he has ever doubted that the copulation of brother and sister is incest, that monogamy is the truth of marriage, that filial piety is a sacred duty, then a moral shudder will come over him at the conception of one's being allowed to touch his sister as wife also. And whence this shudder? 
because he believes in those moral commandments. This moral faith is deeply rooted in his breast. Much as he rages against the pious Christians, he himself has nevertheless as thoroughly remained a Christian, to wit, a moral Christian. In the form of morality, Christianity holds him a prisoner, and a prisoner under faith. Monogamy is to be something sacred, and he who may live in bigamy is punished as a criminal. He who commits incest suffers as a criminal. Those who are always crying that religion is not to be regarded in the state, and the Jew is to be a citizen equally with the Christian, show themselves in accord with this. Is not this of incest and monogamy a dogma of faith? Touch it, and you will learn by experience how this moral man is a hero of faith also. Not less than Krumacher, not less than Philip II. These fight for the faith of the church, he for the faith of the state, or the moral law of the state, for articles of faith. Both condemn him who act otherwise than their faith will allow. The brand of crime is stamped upon him, and he may languish in reformatories in jails. Moral faith is as fanatical as religious faith. They call that liberty of faith, then, when brother and sister on account of a relation that they should have settled with their conscience, are thrown into prison. But they set a pernicious example. Yes, indeed. Others might have taken the notion that the state had no business to meddle with their relation, and thereupon purity of morals would go to ruin. So then, the religious heroes of faith are zealous for the sacred God, the moral ones for the sacred good. Those who are zealous for something sacred often look very little like each other. How the strictly orthodox or old-style believers differ from the fighters for truth, light, and justice, from the philothes, the friends of light, the rationalists, and others. And yet how utterly unessential is this difference. If one buffets single traditional truths, miracles, and limited power of princes, then the rationalists buffet them too and only the old-style believers wail. But, if one buffets truth itself, he immediately has both as believers for opponents. And so with moralities, the strict believers are relentless, the clearer heads are more tolerant. But he who attacks morality itself gets both to deal with. Truth, morality, justice, light, etc., are to be and remain sacred. What anyone finds to censure in Christianity is simply supposed to be unchristian, according to the view of the, these rationalists. But Christianity must remain a fixture. To buffet it is outrageous, an outrage. To be sure, the heretic against pure faith no longer exposes himself to the earlier fury of persecution but so much the more does it now fall upon the heretic against pure morals. End of section. Part 1st, Chapter 2, Section B of the Ego and His Own by Max Stirner. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Matt Messerschmidt in Ann Arbor, Michigan, USA. The Moderns. Continuation of Subdivision 2. The Possessed. Piety has for a century received so many blows, and had to hear its superhuman essence reviled as an inhuman one so often, that one cannot feel tempted to draw the sword against it again. And yet, it has almost always been only moral opponents that have appeared in the arena to assail the supreme essence in favor of 
another supreme essence. So Proudhon, unabashed, says, Man is destined to live without religion, but the moral law is eternal and absolute. Who would dare today to attack morality? Moral people skimmed off the best fat from religion, ate it themselves, and are now having a tough job to get rid of the resulting scrofola. If, therefore, we point out that religion has not by any means been hurt in its inmost part, so long as people reproach it only with its superhuman essence, and that it takes its final appeal to the spirit alone, for God is spirit, then we have sufficiently indicated its final accord with morality, and can leave its stubborn conflict with the latter lying behind us. It is a question of a supreme essence with both, and whether this is a superhuman or a human one can make, since it is any case an essence over me, a supermine one, so to speak, but little difference to me. In the end, the relation to the human essence, or to man, as soon as ever it has shed the snakeskin of the old religion, will yet wear a religious snakeskin again. So Feuerbach instructs us that, if one only inverts speculative philosophy, always makes the predicate the subject, and so makes the subject the object and principle, one has the undraped truth, pure and clean. Herewith, to be sure, we lost the narrow religious standpoint, lost the God, who from this standpoint is subject, but we take in exchange for it the other side of the religious standpoint, the moral standpoint. Thus we no longer say, God is love, but love is divine. If we further put in place of the predicate divine, the equivalent sacred, then, as far as concerns the sense, all the old comes back again. According to this, Love is to be the good in man, his divineness, that which does him honor, his true humanity. It makes him man for the first time, makes for the first time a man out of him. So then it would be more accurately worded thus, love is what is human in man, and what is inhuman is the loveless egoist. But precisely all that which Christianity and with it speculative philosophy, i.e. theology, offers as the good, the absolute, is to self-ownership simply not the good, or, what means the same, it is only the good. Consequently, by the transformation of the predicate into the subject, the Christian essence, and with it the predicate that contains the essence, you know, would only be fixed yet more oppressively. God and the divine would entwine themselves all the more inextricably with me. To expel God from his heaven and to rob him of his transcendence cannot yet support a claim of complete victory, if therein he is only chased into the human breast and gifted with indelible imminence. Now, they say, the divine is the truly human. The same people who oppose Christianity as the basis of the state, who oppose the so-called Christian state, do not tire of repeating that morality is the fundamental pillar of social life and of the state. As if the dominion of morality were not a complete dominion of the sacred, a hierarchy. So we may here mention, by the way, that rationalist movement which, after theologians had long insisted that only faith was capable of grasping religious truths, that only to believers did God reveal himself, and that therefore only the heart, the feelings, the believing fancy was religious, broke out with the assertion that the natural understanding, human reason, 
was also capable of discerning God. What does that mean but that the reason laid claim to be the same visionary as the fancy? In this sense, Romarus wrote his most notable truths of natural religion. It had to come to this, that the whole man with all his faculties was found to be religious, heart and affections, understanding and reason, feeling, knowledge, and will. In short, everything in man appeared religious. Hegel has shown that even philosophy is religious. And what is not called religion today? The religion of love, the religion of freedom, political religion. In short, every enthusiasm. And so it is, too, in fact. To this day we use the Romance word religion, which expresses the concept of a condition of being bound. To be sure, we remain bound, so far as religion takes possession of our inward parts. But is the mind also bound? On the contrary, that is free, is sole Lord, is not our mind, but absolute. Therefore, the correct affirmative translation of the word religion would be freedom of mind. In whomsoever the mind is free, he is religious in just the same way as he in whom the senses have free course is called a sensual man. The mind binds the former, that desires the latter. Religion, therefore, is boundless or religio with reference to me. I am bound. It is freedom with reference to the mind. The mind is free or has freedom of mind. Many know from experience how hard it is on us when the desires run away with us, free and unbridled, but that the free mind, splendid intellectuality, enthusiasm for intellectual interests, or however this jewel may in the most various phrase be named, brings us into yet more grievous straits than even the wildest impropriety. People will not perceive, nor can they perceive it without being consciously egoists. Remorous, and all who have shown that our reason, our heart, etc., also lead to God, have therewithal shown that we are possessed through and through. To be sure, they vexed the theologians, from whom they took away the prerogative of religious exaltation. But for religion, for freedom of mind, they thereby conquered yet more ground. For, when the mind is no longer limited to feeling or faith, but also, as understanding, reason, and thought in general, belongs to itself the mind. When, therefore, it may take part in the spiritual and heavenly truths in the form of understanding, as well as in its other forms, then the whole mind is occupied only with spiritual things, that is, with itself, and is therefore free. Now we are so through and through religious that jurors, sworn men, condemn us to death, and every policeman, as a good Christian, takes us to the lockup by virtue of an oath of office. Morality could not come into opposition with piety till after the time when, in general, the boisterous hate of everything that looked like an order, decrees, commandments, etc., spoke out in revolt, and the personal absolute lord was scoffed at and persecuted. Consequently, it could arrive at independence only through liberalism, whose first form acquired significance in the world's history as citizenship and weakened the specifically religious powers. See liberalism below. For when morality not merely goes alongside of piety, but stands on feet of its own, then its principle lies no longer in the divine commandments, but in the law of reason, from which the commandments, so far as they are still to remain valid, must first await justification for their validity. In the law of reason, man determines himself out of himself. For man is rational, 
and out of the essence of man, those laws follow of necessity. Piety and morality part company in this, that the former makes God the lawgiver, the latter man. From a certain standpoint of morality, people reason about as follows. Either man is led by his sensuality and is, following it, immoral, or he is led by the good, which, taken up into will, is called moral sentiment, sentiment and prepossession in favor of the good. Then he shows himself moral. From this point of view, how, for instance, can Sand's act against Kotzebue be called immoral? What is commonly understood by unselfish, it certainly was, in the same measure as, among other things, St. Crispin's thieveries in favor of the poor. He should not have murdered, for it stands written, Thou shalt not murder. Then to serve the good, the welfare of the people, as Sand at least intended, or the welfare of the poor, like Crispin, is moral but murder and theft are immoral, the purpose moral, the means immoral. Why? Because murder, assassination, is something absolutely bad. When the guerrillas enticed the enemies of the country into ravines and shot them down unseen from the bushes, do you suppose that was assassination? According to the principle of morality, which commands us to serve the good, you could really ask only whether murder could never in any case be a realization of the good, and would have to endorse that murder which realized the good. You cannot condemn Sand's deed at all. It was moral, because in the service of the good, because unselfish. It was an act of punishment, which the individual inflicted, an execution inflicted at the risk of the executioner's life. What else had his scheme been, after all, but that he wanted to suppress writings by brute force? Are you not acquainted with the same procedure as a legal and sanctioned one? And what can be objected against it from your principle of morality? But it was an illegal execution. So the immoral thing in it was the illegality, the disobedience to law? Then you admit that the good is nothing else than law, morality, nothing else than loyalty. And to this externality of loyalty, your morality must sink. To this righteousness of works and the fulfillment of the law. Only that the latter is at once more tyrannical and more revolting than the old time righteousness of works. For in the latter, only to act is needed but you require the disposition to. One must carry in himself the law, the statute, and he who is most legally disposed is the most moral. Even the last vestige of cheerfulness in Catholic life must perish in this Protestant legality. Here at last, the domination of the law is for the first time complete. Not I live, but the law lives in me. Thus I have really come so far to be only the vessel of its glory. Every Prussian carries his gendarme in his breast, says a high Prussian officer. Why do certain opposition parties fail to flourish? solely for the reason that they refuse to forsake the path of morality or legality. Hence the measureless hypocrisy of devotion, love, etc., from whose repulsiveness one may daily get the most thrown at this rotten and hypocritical relation of a lawful opposition. In the moral relation of love and fidelity, a divided or opposed will cannot have place. The beautiful relation is disturbed if the one wills this and the other the reverse. But now, according to the practice hitherto, and the old prejudice of the opposition, the moral relation 
is to be preserved above all. What is then left to the opposition? Perhaps the will to have a liberty, if the beloved one sees fit to deny it? Not a bit. It may not will to have the freedom. It can only wish for it, petition for it, lisp a please, please. What would come of it if the opposition really willed, willed with the full energy of the will? No, it must renounce will in order to live to love, renounce liberty for love of morality. It may never claim as a right what it is permitted only to beg as a favor. Love, devotion, etc. demand with undeviating definiteness that there be only one will to which the others devote themselves, which they serve, follow, love. Whether this will is regarded as reasonable or as unreasonable, in both cases one acts morally when one follows it, and immorally when one breaks away from it. The will that commands the censorship seems to many unreasonable, but he who in a land of censorship evades the censoring of his book acts immorally, and he who submits it to the censorship acts morally. If someone let his moral judgment go and set up a secret press, one would have to call him immoral and imprudent in the bargain if he let himself be caught. But will such a man lay claim to a value in the eyes of the moral? Perhaps, that is, if he fancied he was serving a higher morality. The web of the hypocrisy of today hangs on the frontiers of two domains, between which our time swings back and forth, attaching its fine threads of deception and self-deception. No longer vigorous enough to serve morality without doubt or weakening. Not yet reckless enough to live wholly to egoism. It trembles now toward the one and now toward the other in the spider web of hypocrisy. And, crippled by the curse of halfness, catches only miserable, stupid flies. If one has dared to make a free motion, Immediately one waters it again with assurances of love and shams resignation. If, on the other hand, they have had the face to reject the free motion with moral appeals to confidence, immediately the moral courage also sinks, and they assure one how they hear the free words with special pleasure. They sham approval. In short, People would like to have the one, but not go without the other. They would like to have a free will, but not for their lives lack the moral will. Just come into contact with a servile loyalist, you liberals. You will sweeten every word of freedom with a look of the most loyal confidence, and he will clothe his servilism in the most flattering phrases of freedom. Then you go apart, and he, like you, thinks I know you, Fox. He sends the devil in you as much as you do the dark old Lord God in him. A Nero is a bad man only in the eyes of the good. In mind, he is nothing but a possessed man, as are the good, too. The good see in him an arch-villain and relegate him to hell. Why did nothing hinder him in his arbitrary course? Why did people put up with so much? Do you suppose the tame Romans, who let all their will be bound by such a tyrant, were a hair the better? In old Rome they would have put him to death instantly, never would have been his slaves. But the contemporary good among the Romans opposed to him only moral demands, not their will. They sighed that their emperor did not do homage to morality like them. They themselves remained moral subjects, till at last one found courage to give up moral, obedient subjection. And then the same good Romans, who, 
as obedient subjects, had borne all the ignominy of having no will, hurrahed over the nefarious, immoral act of the rebel. Where, then, in the good, was the courage for the revolution, that courage which they now praised, after another had mustered it up? The good could not have this courage, for a revolution and an insurrection into the bargain is always something immoral, which one can resolve upon only when one ceases to be good and becomes either bad or neither of the two. Nero was no viler than his time, in which one could only be one of the two, good or bad. The judgment of his time on him had to be that he was bad, and this in the highest degree, not a milksop, but an arch scoundrel. All moral people can pronounce only this judgment on him. Rascals such as he was are still living here and there today. See, for example, the memoirs of Ritter von Lang in the midst of the moral. It is not convenient to live among them, certainly, as one is not sure of his life for a moment. But can you say that it is more convenient to live among the moral? One is just as little sure of his life there, only that one is hanged in the way of justice. But least of all is one sure of his honor, and the national cockade is gone before you can say Jack Robinson. The hard fist of morality treats the noble nature of egoism altogether without compassion. But surely one cannot put a rascal and an honest man on the same level now, no human being does that oftener than you judges of morals. Yes, still more than that, you imprison as a criminal an honest man who speaks openly against the existing constitution, against the hallowed institutions, and you entrust portfolios and still more important things to a crafty rascal. So in proxy, you have nothing to reproach me with. But in theory, now there I do put both on the same level, as two opposite poles, to wit, both on the level of the moral law. Both have meaning only in the moral world, just as in the pre-Christian time, a Jew who kept the law and one who broke it had meaning and significance only in respect to the Jewish law. Before Jesus Christ, on the contrary, the Pharisee was no more than the sinner and publican. So before self-ownership, the moral Pharisee amounts to as much as the immoral sinner. Nero became very inconvenient by his possessiveness, but a self-owning man would not silly oppose to him the sacred and whine if the tyrant does not regard the sacred. He would oppose to him his will. How often the sacredness of the inalienable rights of man has been held up to their foes, and some liberty or other shown and demonstrated to be a sacred right of man. Those who do that deserve to be laughed out of court, as they actually are, were it not that in truth they do, even though unconsciously, take the road that leads to the goal. They have a presentiment that, if only the majority is once won for that liberty, it will also will the liberty, and will then take what it will have. The sacredness of the liberty, and all possible proofs of this sacredness, will never procure it. Lamenting and petitioning only shows beggars. The moral man is necessarily narrow, in that he knows no other enemy than the immoral man. He who is not moral is immoral, and accordingly reprobate, despicable, etc. Therefore, the moral man can never comprehend the egoist. Is not unwedded cohabitation an immorality? The moral man may turn as he pleases. He will have to stand by this verdict. Amelia Galati gave up her life for this moral truth. And it is true. It is an immorality. 
A virtuous girl may become an old maid. A virtuous man may pass the time in fighting his natural impulses until he has perhaps dulled them. He may castrate himself for the sake of virtue, as St. Origen did for the sake of heaven. He thereby honors sacred wedlock, sacred chastity, as inviolable. He is moral. Unchastity can never become a moral act. However indulgently the moral man may judge and excuse him who committed it, it remains a transgression, a sin against a moral commandment. There clings to it an indelible stain. As chastity once belonged to the monastic vow, so it does to moral conduct. Chastity is a good. For the egoist, on the contrary, even chastity is not a good without which he could not get along. He cares nothing at all about it. What now follows from this for the judgment of the moral man? This, that he throws the egoist into the only class of men that he knows besides moral men, into that of the immoral. He cannot do otherwise. He must find the egoist immoral in everything in which the egoist disregards morality. If he did not find him so, then he would already have become an apostate from morality without confessing it to himself. He would already no longer be a truly moral man. One should not let himself be led astray by such phenomena, which at the present day are certainly no longer to be classed as rare, but should reflect that he who yields any point of morality can as little be counted among the truly moral as Lessing was a pious Christian when, in the well-known parable, he compared the Christian religion, as well as the Mohammedan and Jewish, to a counterfeit ring. Often people are already further than they venture to confess to themselves. For Socrates, because in culture he stood on the level of morality, it would have been an immorality if he had been willing to follow Credo's seductive indictment and escape from the dungeon. To remain was the only moral thing. But it was solely because Socrates was a moral man. The unprincipled, sacrilegious men of the revolution, on the contrary, had sworn fidelity to Louis XVI and decreed his deposition, yes, his death. But the act was an immoral one at which moral persons will be horrified to all eternity. Yet all this applies, more or less, only to civic morality, on which the freer look down with contempt. For it, like civism, its native ground, in general, is still too little removed and free from the religious heaven not to transplant the latter's laws without criticism or further consideration to its domain instead of producing independent doctrines of its own. Morality cuts quite a different figure when it arrives at the consciousness of its dignity and raises its principle, the essence of man, or man with a capital M, to be the only regulative power. Those who have worked their way through to such a decided consciousness break entirely with religion, whose God no longer finds any place alongside their man and, as they see below, themselves scuttle the ship of state, so too they crumble away that morality which flourishes only in the state, and logically have no right to use even its name any further. For what this critical party calls morality is very positively distinguished from the so-called civic or political morality, and must appear to the citizen like an insensate an unbridled liberty. But at bottom, it has only the advantage of the purity of the principle, which, freed from its defilement with the religious, has now reached universal power in its clarified definiteness as humanity. Therefore, one should not wonder that the name morality is retained along with others, like freedom, benevolence, self-consciousness. 
and is only garnered now and then with the addition a free morality. Just as, though the civic state is abused, yet the state is to arise again as a free state, or, if not even so, yet as a free society. Because this morality completed into humanity has fully settled its accounts with the religion out of which it historically came forth, nothing hinders it from becoming a religion on its own account. For a distinction prevails between religion and morality only so long as our dealings with the world of men are regulated and hallowed by our relation to a superhuman being, or so long as our doing is a doing for God's sake. If, on the other hand, it comes to the point that man is to man the supreme being, then that distinction vanishes, and morality, being removed from its subordinate position, is completed into religion. For then, the higher being, who had hitherto been subordinated to the highest, man, has ascended to absolute height, and we are related to him as one is related to the highest being, religiously. Morality and piety are now as synonymous as in the beginning of Christianity, and it is only because the supreme being has come to be a different one that a holy walk is no longer called a holy one, but a human one. If morality has conquered, then a complete change of masters has taken place. After the annihilation of faith, Feuerbach thinks to put into the supposedly safe harbor of love. The first and highest law must be the love of man to man. Homo homini deus est. This is the supreme practical maxim. This is the turning point of the world's history. But, properly speaking, only the God is changed, the Deus. Love has remained. There love to the superhuman God, here love to the human God, to Homo as Deus. Therefore man is to me sacred, and everything truly human is to me sacred. Marriage is sacred of itself, and so it is with all moral relations. Friendship is and must be sacred for you and property and marriage and the good of every man, but sacred in and of itself. Haven't we the priest again there? Who is his God? Man with a great M. What is the divine, the human? Then the predicate has indeed only been changed into the subject. And instead of the sentence, God is love, they say, love is divine. Instead of God has become man, man has become God, etc. It is nothing more or less than a new religion. All moral relations are ethical are cultivated with a moral mind, only where of themselves, without religious consecration by the priest's blessing, they are counted religious. Feuerbach's proposition, theology is anthropology, means only religion must be ethics, ethics alone is religion. Altogether, Feuerbach accomplishes only a transposition of subject and predicate, a giving of preference to the latter. But since he himself says, love is not and has never been considered by men sacred through being a predicate of God, but it is a predicate of God because it is divine in and of itself, he might judge that the fight against the predicates themselves, against love and all sanctities, must be commenced. How could he hope to turn men away from God when he left them the divine? And if, 
as Feuerbach says, God himself has never been the main thing to them, but only his predicates. Then he might have gone on, leaving them the tinsel longer yet, since the doll, the real colonel, was left at any rate. He recognizes, too, that with him it is only a matter of annihilating an illusion. He thinks, however, that the effect of the illusion on men is downright ruinous, since even love, in itself the truest, most inward sentiment, becomes an obscure, illusory one through religiousness. Since religious love loves man only for God's sake, therefore loves man only apparently, but in truth, God only. Is this different with moral love? Does it love the man, this man, for this man's sake, or for morality's sake? And so, for homo homini deus, for God's sake? End of section. Part First, Chapter Two, Section B, of the Ego and His Own by Max Stirner. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Matt Messerschmidt in Ann Arbor, Michigan, USA. The Moderns. Continuation of Subdivision 2. The Possessed. The wheels in the head have a number of other formal aspects, some of which it may be useful to indicate here. Thus self-renunciation is common to the holy with the unholy, to the pure and the impure. The impure man renounces all better feelings, all shame, even natural timidity, and follows only the appetite that rules him. The pure man renounces his natural relation to the world, renounces the world, and follows only the desire which rules him. Driven by the thirst for money, the avaricious man renounces all admonitions of conscience, all feeling of honor, all gentleness, and all compassion. He puts all considerations out of sight. The appetite drags him along. The holy man behaves similarly. He makes himself the laughingstock of the world, is hard-hearted and strictly just, for the desire drags him along. As the unholy man renounces himself before mammon, so the holy man renounces himself before God and the divine laws. We are now living in a time when the shamelessness of the holy is every day more and more felt and uncovered, whereby it is at the same time compelled to unveil itself and lay itself bare more and more every day. Have not the shamelessness and stupidity of the reasons with which men antagonize the progress of the age long surpassed all measure and all expectation? But it must be so. The self-renouncers must, as holy men, take the same course that they do as unholy men, as the latter little by little sink to the fullest measure of self-renouncing vulgarity and lowness, so the former must ascend to the most dishonorable exaltation. The mammon of the earth and the god of heaven both demand exactly the same degree of self-renunciation. The low man, like the exalted one, reaches out for a good, the former for the material good, the latter for the ideal, the so-called supreme good. And at last, both complete each other again too, as the material-minded man sacrifices everything to an ideal phantasm, his vanity, and the spiritually-minded man to a material gratification, 
the life of enjoyment. Those who exhort men to unselfishness think they are saying an uncommon deal. What do they understand by it? Probably something like what they understand by self-renunciation. But who is the self that is to be renounced and to have no benefit? It seems that you, yourself, are supposed to be it. And for whose benefit is unselfish self-renunciation recommended to you? Again, for your benefit and behoof. Only that through unselfishness you are procuring your true benefit. You are to benefit yourself, and yet you are not to seek your benefit. People regard as unselfish the benefactor of men, a Franke who founded the orphan asylum, an O'Connell who works tirelessly for his Irish people, but also the fanatic who, like St. Boniface, hazards his life for the conversion of the heathen, or like Robespierre, sacrifices everything to virtue, like Kerne, dies for God, king, and fatherland. Hence, among others, O'Connell's opponents try to trump up against him some selfishness or mercenariness, for which the O'Connell Fund seems to give them a foundation. For, if they were successful in casting suspicion on his unselfishness, they would easily separate him from his adherents. Yet what could they show further than that O'Connell was working for another end than the ostensible one? But, whether he may aim at making money or at liberating the people, it still remains certain, in one case as in the other, that he is striving for an end, and that his end, selfishness here as there, only that his national self-interest would be beneficial to others too, and so would be for the common interest. Now, do you suppose unselfishness is unreal and nowhere extant? On the contrary, nothing is more ordinary. One may even call it an article of fashion in the civilized world, which is considered so indispensable that, if it costs too much in solid material, people at least adorn themselves with its tinsel counterfeit and feign it. Where does unselfishness begin? right where an end ceases to be our end and our property, which we, as owners, can dispose of at pleasure, where it becomes a fixed end or a fixed idea, where it begins to inspire, enthuse, fanaticize us. In short, where it passes into our stubbornness and becomes our master. One is not unselfish so long as he retains the end in his power, one becomes so only at that here I stand, here I cannot do otherwise. The fundamental maxim of all the possessed. One becomes so in the case of a sacred end, through the corresponding sacred zeal. I am not unselfish so long as the end remains my own, and I, instead of giving myself up to be the blind means of its fulfillment, leave it always an open question. My zeal need not on that account be slacker than the most fanatical, but at the same time I remain toward it frostily cold, unbelieving, and its most irreconcilable enemy. I remain its judge because I am its owner. Unselfishness grows rank as far as possessiveness reaches, as much on possessions of the devil as on those of a good spirit. There vice, folly, and the like. Here, humility, devotion, and so forth. Where could one look without meeting victims of self-renunciation? There sits a girl opposite me, who perhaps has been making bloody sacrifices to her soul for ten years already. Over the buxom form droops a deathly tired head, and pale cheeks betray the slow bleeding away of her youth. Poor child, how often the passions may have beaten at your heart, and the rich powers of youth have demanded their right. When your head rolled in the soft pillow, how awakening nature quivered through your limbs, the blood swelled your veins, 
and fiery fancies poured the gleam of voluptuousness into your eyes. Then appeared the ghost of the soul and its external bliss. You were terrified. Your hands folded themselves. Your tormented eyes turned its look upward. You prayed. The storms of nature were hushed. A calm glided over the ocean of your appetites. Slowly the weary eyelids sank over the life extinguished under them. The tension crept out unperceived from the rounded limbs. The boisterous waves dried up in the heart. The folded hands themselves rested a powerless weight on the unresisting bosom. One last faint, oh dear, moaned itself away and the soul was at rest. You fell asleep to awake in the morning to a new combat and a new prayer. Now the habit of renunciation cools the heat of your desire, and the roses of your youth are growing pale in the chlorosis of your heavenliness. The soul is saved. The body may perish. O Laius, O Ninon, how well you did to scorn this pale virtue. One free grisette against a thousand virgins grown gray in virtue. The fixed idea may also be perceived as maxim, principle, standpoint, and the like. Archimedes, to move the earth, asked for a standpoint outside it. Men sought continually for this standpoint and every one seized upon it as well as he was able. This foreign standpoint is the world of mind, of ideas, thoughts, concepts, essences. It is heaven. Heaven is the standpoint from which the earth is moved, earthly doings surveyed and despised. To assure to themselves heaven, to occupy the heavenly standpoint firmly and forever. How painfully and tirelessly humanity struggled for this. Christianity has aimed to deliver us from a life determined by nature, from the appetites as actuating us, and has so meant that man should not let himself be determined by his appetites. This does not involve the idea that he was not to have appetites, but that the appetites were not to have him, that they were not to become fixed, uncontrollable, indissoluble. Now, could not what Christianity, religion, contrived against the appetites be applied to us to its own precept that mind, thought, conceptions, ideas, faith, must determine us could we not ask that neither should mind, or the conception, the idea, be allowed to determine us, to become fixed and inviolable or sacred? Then it would end in the dissolution of mind, the dissolution of all thoughts, of all conceptions. As we there had to say, we are indeed to have appetites but the appetites are not to have us. So we should now say, we are indeed to have mind, but mind is not to have us. If the latter seems lacking in sense, think of the fact that with so many a man, a thought becomes a maxim, whereby he himself is made prisoner to it, so that it is not he that has the maxim, but rather it that has him. And with the maxim, he has a permanent standpoint again. The doctrines of the catechism become our principles before we find it out and no longer brook rejection. Their thought, or mind, has the sole power, and no protest of the flesh is further listened to. Nevertheless, it is only through the flesh that I can break the tyranny of mind, for it is only when a man hears his flesh along with the rest of him that he hears himself wholly, 
and it is only when he hears himself that he is a hearing or rational being. The Christian does not hear the agony of his enthralled nature, but lives in humility. Therefore, he does not grumble at the wrong which befalls his person. He thinks himself satisfied with the freedom of the spirit. But if the flesh once takes the floor, and its tone is passionate, indecorous, not well disposed, spiteful, as it cannot be otherwise, then he thinks he hears voices of devils, voices against the spirit, for decorum, passionlessness, kindly disposition, and the like, is spirit, and is justly zealous against them. He could not be a Christian if he were willing to endure them. He listens only to morality, and slaps unmorality in the mouth. He listens only to legality, and gags the lawless word. The spirit of morality and legality holds him a prisoner, a rigid, unbending master. They call that the mastery of the spirit. It is at the same time the standpoint of the spirit. And now whom do the ordinary liberal gentlemen mean to make free? Whose freedom is it that they cry out and thirst for? The spirits. That of the spirit of morality, legality, piety, the fear of God. That is what the anti-liberal gentlemen also want. And the whole contention between the two turns on a matter of advantage, whether the latter are to be the only speakers, or the former are to receive a share in the enjoyment of the same advantage. The spirit remains the absolute lord for both, and their only quarrel is over who shall occupy the hierarchical throne that pertains to the vice-regent of the lord. The best of it is that one can calmly look upon the stir with the certainty that the wild beasts of history will tear each other to pieces just like those of nature. Their putrefying corpses fertilize the ground for our crops. <laughs> we shall come back later to many other wheels in the head. For instance, those of vocation, truthfulness, love, and the like. When one's own is contrasted with what is imparted to him, there is no use in objecting that we cannot have anything isolated, but receive everything as a part of the universal order, and therefore through the impression of what is around us, and that consequently we have it as something imparted. For there is a great difference between the feelings and thoughts which are aroused in me by other things and those which are given to me. God, immortality, freedom, humanity are drilled into us from childhood as thoughts and feelings which move our inner being more or less strongly, either ruling us without our knowing it, or sometimes in richer natures manifesting themselves in systems and works of art, but are always not aroused but imparted feelings, because we must believe in them and cling to them. That an absolute existed, and that it must be taken in, felt, and thought by us, was settled as a faith in the minds of those who spent all the strength of their mind on recognizing it and setting it forth. The feeling for the absolute exists there as an imparted one, and thenceforth results only in the most manifold revelations of itself. So in Klopstock, the religious feeling was an imparted one, which in the Messiad simply found artistic expression. If, on the other hand, the religion with which he was confronted had been for him only an incitation to feeling and thought, and if he had known how to take an attitude completely his own toward it, then there would have resulted, instead of religious inspiration, a dissolution and consumption of the religion itself. 
Instead of that, he only continued in mature years his childish feelings received in childhood, and squandered the powers of his manhood in decking out his childish trifles. The difference is, then, whether feelings are imparted to me or only aroused. Those feelings which are aroused are my own, egoistic, because they are not as feelings drilled into me, dictated to me, and pressed upon me. But those which are imparted to me I receive with open arms. I cherish them in me as a heritage, cultivate them, and am possessed by them. Who is there that has never, more or less consciously, noticed that our whole education is calculated to produce feelings in us, impart them to us, instead of leaving their production to ourselves, however they may turn out? If we hear the name of God, we are to feel veneration. If we hear that of the Prince's Majesty, it is to be received with reverence, deference, submission. If we hear that of morality, we are to think that we hear something inviolable. If we hear of the evil one, or evil ones, we are to shudder. The intention is directed to these feelings, and he who should hear with pleasure the deeds of the bad would have to be taught what's what with the rod of discipline. Thus stuffed with imparted feelings, we appear before the bar of majority and are pronounced of age. Our equipment consists of elevated feelings, lofty thoughts, inspiring maxims, eternal principles. The young are of age when they twitter like the old. They are driven through school to learn the old song. And when they have this by heart, they are declared of age. We must not feel at every thing and every name that comes before us what we could and would like to feel thereat. At the name of God, we must think of nothing laughable, feel nothing disrespectful, it being prescribed and imparted to us what and how we are to feel and think at the mention of that name. That is the meaning of the care of souls, that my soul, or my mind, be tuned as others think right, not as I myself would like. How much trouble does it not cost one, finally to secure to oneself a feeling of one's own at the mention of at least this or that name, and to laugh in the face of many who expect from us a holy face and a composed expression at their speeches. What is imparted is alien to us. It is not our own, and therefore is sacred, and it is hard work to lay aside the sacred dread of it. Today one again hears seriousness praised, seriousness in the presence of highly important subjects and discussions, German seriousness, and so on. This sort of seriousness proclaims clearly how old and grave lunacy and possession have already become. For there is nothing more serious than a lunatic when he comes to the central point of his lunacy. Then his great earnestness incapacitates him for taking a joke. See Madhouses. End of section. The Ego and His Own by Max Stirner. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Matt Messerschmidt in Ann Arbor, Michigan, USA. Chapter 2, Section A, Subdivision 3 The Hierarchy. The historical reflections on our Mongolism, which I propose to insert episodically at this place, are not given with the claim of thoroughness, or even of approved soundness, but solely because it seems to me that they may contribute toward making the rest clear. The history of the world, whose shaping properly belongs altogether to the Caucasian race, 
seems till now to have run through two Caucasian ages, in the first of which we had to work out and work off our innate negroidity. This was followed in the second by mongoloidity, Chineseness, which must likewise be terribly made an end of. Negroidity represents antiquity, the time of dependence on things, on cocks eating, birds flight, on sneezing, on thunder and lightning, on the rustling of sacred trees, and so forth. Mongoloidity, the time of dependence on thoughts, the Christian time. Reserved for the future are the words, I am owner of the world of things, and I am owner of the world of mind. In the Negroid age fall the campaigns of Sesostris and the importance of Egypt and of Northern Africa in general. To the Mongoloid age belong the invasions of the Huns and Mongols, up to the Russians. The value of me cannot possibly be rated high so long as the hard diamond of the not me bears so enormous a price as was the case both with God and with the world. The not me is still too stony and indomitable to be consumed and absorbed by me. Rather, men only creep about with extraordinary bustle on this immovable entity on this substance, like parasitic animals on a body from whose juices they draw nourishment, yet without consuming it. It is the bustle of vermin, the assiduity of Mongolians. Among the Chinese, we know, everything remains as it used to be, and nothing essential or substantial suffers a change. All the more actively do they work away at that which remains, which bears the name of the old, ancestors, and the like. Accordingly, in our Mongolian age, all change has been only reformatory or ameliorative, not destructive or consuming and annihilating. The substance, the object, remains. All our assiduity was only the activity of ants and the hopping of fleas, jugglers' tricks on the immovable tightrope of the objective, corvée service under the leadership of the unchangeable or eternal. The Chinese are doubtless the most positive nation, because totally buried in precepts, but neither has the Christian age come out from the positive, from limited freedom freedom within certain limits. In the most advanced stage of civilization, this activity earns the name of scientific activity, of working on emotionless presupposition, a hypothesis that is not to be upset. In its first and most unintelligible form, morality shows itself as habit. To act according to the habit and usage, mores, of one's country is to be moral there. Therefore, pure moral action, clear, unadulterated morality, is most straightforwardly practiced in China. They keep to the old habit and usage and hate each innovation as a crime worthy of death. For innovation is the deadly enemy of habit, of the old, of permanence. In fact, too, it admits of no doubt that through habit man secures himself against the obtrusiveness of things, of the world, and forms a world of his own, in which alone he is and feels at home, builds himself a heaven. Why, heaven has no other meaning than that it is a man's proper home, in which nothing alien regulates and rules him any longer, no influence of the earthly any longer makes him himself alien. In short, in which the dross of the earthly is thrown off, and the combat against the world has found an end, in which, therefore, nothing is any longer denied him. 
Heaven is the end of abnegation. It is free enjoyment. There, man no longer denies himself anything, because nothing is any longer alien and hostile to him. But now habit is a second nature, which detaches and frees man from his first and original natural condition, in securing him against every casualty of it. The fully elaborated habit of the Chinese has provided for all emergencies, and everything is looked out for. Whatever may come, the Chinaman always knows how he has to behave, and does not need to decide first according to the circumstances. No unforeseen case throws him down from the heaven of his rest. The morally habituated and inured Chinaman is not surprised and taken off his guard. He behaves with equanimity, that is, with equal spirit or temper, toward everything, because his temper, protected by the precaution of his traditional usage, does not lose its balance. Hence, on the ladder of culture or civilization, humanity mounts the first round through habit, and, as it conceives that, in climbing to culture, it is at the same time climbing to heaven, the realm of culture or second nature. It really mounts the first round of the ladder to heaven. If Mongoldom has settled the existence of spiritual beings, if it has created a world of spirits, a heaven, the Caucasians have wrestled for thousands of years with these spiritual beings to get to the bottom of them. What were they doing then but building on Mongolian ground? They have not built on sand, but in the air. They have wrestled with Mongolism, stormed the Mongolian heaven, Tian. When will they at last annihilate this heaven? When will they at last become really Caucasians and find themselves? When will the immortality of the soul which in these latter days thought it was giving itself still more security if it presented itself as an immortality of mind, at last changed to the mortality of mind. It was when, in the industrious struggle of the Mongolian race, men had built a heaven, that those of the Caucasian race, since in their Mongolian complexion they have to do with heaven, took upon themselves the opposite task, the task of storming that heaven of custom, heaven-storming activity. To dig under all human ordinance in order to set up a new and better one on the cleared site. To wreck all customs in order to put up new and better customs in their place. Their act is limited to this. But is it thus already purely and really what it aspires to be? And does it reach its final aim? No. In this creation of a better, it is tainted with Mongolism. It storms heaven only to make a heaven again. It overthrows an old power only to legitimate a new power. It only improves. Nevertheless, the point aimed at often as it may vanish from the eyes at every new attempt, is the real, complete downfall of heaven, customs. In short, of man secured only against the world, of the isolation or inwardness of man. Through the heaven of culture, man seeks to isolate himself from the world, to break its hostile power. But this isolation of heaven must likewise be broken, and the true end of heaven storming is the downfall of heaven, the annihilation of heaven. Improving and reforming is the Mongolism of the Caucasian, because thereby he is always getting up again what already existed, to wit, a precept, a generality, a heaven. He harbors the most irreconcilable enmity to heaven, and yet builds new heavens daily, piling heaven on heaven. He only crushes one by another. 
the Jews heaven destroys the Greeks, the Christians the Jews, the Protestants the Catholics. If the heaven-storming men of Caucasian blood throw off their Mongolian skin, they will bury the emotional man under the ruins of the monstrous world of emotion, the isolated man under his isolated world, the paradisaical man under his heaven. And heaven is the realm of spirits, the realm of freedom of the spirit. The realm of heaven, the realm of spirits and ghosts, has found its right standing in the speculative philosophy. Here it was stated as the realm of thoughts, concepts, and ideas. Heaven is peopled with thoughts and ideas. And this realm of spirits is then the true reality. To want to win freedom for the spirit is Mongolism. Freedom of the spirit is Mongolian freedom. Freedom of feeling, moral freedom, and so forth. We may find the word morality taken as synonymous with spontaneity, self-determination. But that is not involved in it. Rather has the Caucasian shown himself spontaneous only in spite of his Mongolian morality. The Mongolian heaven, or morals, remained the strong castle, and only by storming incessantly at this castle did the Caucasian show himself moral. If he had not had to do with morals at all any longer, if he had not had therein his undomitable, continual enemy, the relation to morals would cease, and consequently morality would cease. That his spontaneity is still a moral spontaneity, therefore, is just the mongoloidity of it, is a sign that in it he has not arrived at himself. Moral spontaneity corresponds entirely with religious and orthodox philosophy constitutional monarchy, the Christian state, freedom within certain limits, the limited freedom of the press, or, in a figure, to the hero fettered to a sickbed. Man has not really vanquished shamanism and its spooks, till he possesses the strength to lay aside not only the belief in ghosts or in spirits, but also the belief in the spirit. He who believes in a spook no more assumes the introduction of a higher world than he who believes in the spirit, and both seek behind the sensual world a supersensual one. In short, they produce and believe another world, and this other world the product of their mind is a spiritual world, for their senses grasp and know nothing of another, a non-sensual world. Only their spirit lives in it. Going on from this Mongolian belief in the existence of spiritual beings to the point that the proper being of man, too, is his spirit, and that all care must be directed to this alone, to the welfare of his soul is not hard. Influence on the spirit, so-called moral influence, is hereby assured. Hence it is manifest that Mongolism represents utter absence of any rights of the sensuous, represents non-sensuousness and unnature, and that sin and the consciousness of sin was our Mongolian torment that lasted thousands of years. But who then will dissolve the spirit into its nothing? He who by means of the spirit set forth nature as the null, finite, transitory, he alone can bring down the spirit too to like nullity. I can. Each one among you can who does his will as an absolute I. In a word, the egoist can. 
Before the sacred, people lose all sense of power and all confidence. They occupy a powerless and humble attitude toward it. And yet no thing is sacred of itself, but by my declaring it sacred, by my declaration, my judgment, my bending the knee, in short, by my conscience. Sacred is everything which for the egoist is to be unapproachable, not to be touched, outside his power, above him. Sacred, in a word, is every matter of conscience. For this is a matter of conscience to me, means simply, I hold this sacred. For little children, as for animals, nothing sacred exists. Because in order to make room for this conception, one must already have progressed so far in understanding that he can make distinctions like good and bad, warranted and unwarranted. Only at such a level of reflection or intelligence, the proper standpoint of religion, can unnatural, that is, brought into existence by thinking, reverence, sacred dread, step into the place of natural fear. To this sacred dread belongs holding something outside oneself for mightier, greater, better warranted, better. The attitude in which one acknowledges the might of something alien, not merely feels it, then, but expressly acknowledges it, admits it, yields, surrenders, lets himself be tied, devotion, humility, servility, submission. Here walks the whole ghostly troop of the Christian virtues. Everything toward which you cherish any respect or reverence deserves the name of sacred. You yourself, too, say that you would feel a sacred dread of laying hands on it. And you give this tinge even to the unholy, gallows, crime, etc. You have a horror of touching it. There lies in it something uncanny, that is, unfamiliar or not your own. If something or other did not rank as sacred in a man's mind, why, then all bars would be let down to self-will, to unlimited subjectivity. Fear makes the beginning, and one can make himself fearful to the coarsest man. Already, therefore, a barrier against his insolence. But in fear there always remains the attempt to liberate oneself from what is feared, by guile, deception, tricks, etc. In reverence, on the contrary, it is quite otherwise. Here something is not only feared, but also honored. What is feared has become an inward power which I can no longer get clear of. I honor it and captivated by it and devoted to it, belong to it. By the honor which I pay it, I am completely in its power and do not even attempt liberation any longer. Now I am attached to it with all the strength of faith. I believe. I and what I fear are one. Not I live, but the respected lives in me. Because the spirit, the infinite, does not allow of coming to any end, therefore it is stationary, it fears dying, it cannot let go its dear Jesus. The greatness of finiteness is no longer recognized by its blinded eye. The object of fear, now raised to veneration, may no longer be handled. Reverence is made eternal. The respected is deified. The man is now no longer employed in creating, but in learning, knowing, investigating, 
occupied with a fixed object, losing himself in its depths without returning to himself. The relation to this object is that of knowing, fathoming, basing, not that of dissolution, abrogation. Man is to be religious. That is settled. Therefore, people busy themselves only with the question how this is to be attained, what is the right meaning of religiousness, etc. Quite otherwise, when one makes the axiom itself doubtful and calls it in question, even though it should go to smash. Morality, too, is such a sacred conception. One must be moral and must look only for the right how, the right way to be so. One dares not go at morality itself with the question whether it is not itself an illusion. It remains exalted above all doubt, unchangeable. And so we go on with the sacred, grade after grade, from the holy to the holiest of holies. End of section. The Ego and His Own by Max Stirner. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Matt Messerschmidt in Ann Arbor, Michigan, USA. Chapter 2, Section A. Continuation of Subdivision 3 The Hierarchy Men are sometimes divided into two classes, cultured and uncultured. The former, so far as they were worthy of their name, occupied themselves with thoughts, with mind, and, because in the time since Christ, of which the very principle is thought, they were the ruling ones, demanded a servile respect for the thoughts recognized by them. State, emperor, church, God, morality, order are such thoughts or spirits that exist only for the mind. A merely living being, an animal, cares as little for them as a child. But the uncultured are really nothing but children and he who attends only to the necessities of his life is indifferent to those spirits. But, because he is also weak before them, he succumbs to their power and is ruled by thoughts. This is the meaning of hierarchy. Hierarchy is dominion of thoughts, dominion of mind. We are hierarchic to this day, kept down by those who are supported by thoughts. Thoughts are the sacred. But the two are always clashing, now one and now the other giving the offense. And this clash occurs not only in the collision of two men, but in one and the same man. For no cultured man is so cultured as not to find enjoyment in things too, and so be uncultured and no uncultured man is totally without thoughts. In Hegel it comes to light at last what a longing for things even the most cultured man has, and what a horror of every hollow theory he harbors. With him, reality, the world of things, is altogether to correspond to the thought, and no concept is to be without reality. This caused Hegel's system to be known as the most objective, as if in it thought and thing celebrated their union. But this was simply the extremest case of violence on the part of thought, its highest pitch of despotism and soul dominion, the triumph of mind, and with it the triumph of philosophy. Philosophy cannot hereafter achieve anything higher 
for its highest is the omnipotence of mind, the almightiness of mind. Stirner's footnote. Rousseau, the philanthropists, and others were hostile to culture and intelligence, but they overlooked the fact that this is present in all men of the Christian type and assailed only learned and refined culture. End footnote. Spiritual men have taken into their head something that is to be realized. They have concepts of love, goodness, and the like, which they would like to see realized. Therefore, they want to set up a kingdom of love on earth, in which no one any longer acts from selfishness, but each one from love. Love is to rule. What have they taken into their head? What shall we call it but fixed idea? Why, their head is haunted. The most oppressive spook is man. Think of the proverb, the road to ruin is paved with good intentions. The intention to realize humanity altogether in oneself, to become altogether man, is of such ruinous kind. Here belong the intentions to become good, noble, loving, and so forth. In the sixth part of the Denkwürdigkeiten, page 7, Bruno Bauer says, quote, That middle class, which was to receive such a terrible importance for modern history, is capable of no self-sacrificing action, no enthusiasm for an idea, no exaltation. It devotes itself to nothing but the interests of its mediocrity, i.e., it remains always limited to itself and conquers at last only through its bulk, with which it has succeeded in tiring out the efforts of passion, enthusiasm, consistency, through its surface, into which it absorbs a part of the new ideas. End quote. And, page 6, quote, It has turned the revolutionary ideas, for which not it, but unselfish or impassioned men sacrifice themselves solely to its own profit, has turned spirit into money. That is, to be sure, after it has taken away from those ideas their point, their consistency, their destructive seriousness, fanatical against all egoism. End quote. These people, then, are not self-sacrificing, not enthusiastic, not idealistic, not consistent, not zealots. They are egoists in the usual sense, selfish people, looking out for their advantage, sober, calculating. Who, then, is self-sacrificing? In the fullest sense, surely, he who ventures everything else for one thing, one object, one will, one passion. Is not the lover self-sacrificing, who forsakes father and mother, endures all dangers and privations to reach his goal? Or the ambitious man, who offers up all his desires, wishes, and satisfactions to the single passion? Or the avaricious man, who denies himself everything to gather treasures? Or the pleasure seeker? He is ruled by a passion to which he brings the rest as sacrifices. And are these self-sacrificing people perchance not selfish, not egoist? As they have only one ruling passion, so they provide for only one satisfaction, but for this the more strenuously they are wholly absorbed in it. Their entire activity is egoistic, but it is a one-sided, unopened, narrow egoism. 
it is possessedness. Why, those are petty passions, by which, on the contrary, man must not let himself be enthralled. Man must make sacrifices for a great idea, a great cause. A great idea, a good cause, is, it may be, the honor of God, for which innumerable people have met death. Christianity, which has found its willing martyrs, the Holy Catholic Church, which has greedily demanded sacrifices of heretics, liberty and equality, which were waited on by bloody guillotines. He who lives for a great idea, a great cause, a doctrine, a system, a lofty calling, may not let any worldly lusts, any self-seeking interest, spring up in him. Here we have the concept of clericalism, or, as it may be also called in its pedagogic activity, schoolmasterliness, for the idealists play the schoolmaster over us. The clergyman is especially called to live to the idea and to work for the idea, the truly good cause. Therefore the people feel how little it befits him to show worldly haughtiness, to desire good living, to join in such pleasures as dancing and gaming. In short, to have any other than a sacred interest. Hence, too, doubtless, is derived the scanty salary of teachers, who are to feel themselves repaid by the sacredness of their calling alone, and to renounce other enjoyments. Even a directory of the sacred ideas, one or more of which man is to look upon as his calling, is not lacking. Family, fatherland, science, etc., may find in me a faithful servant to his calling. Here we come upon the old, old craze of the world, which has not yet learned to do without clericalism, that to live and work for an idea is man's calling, and according to the faithfulness of its fulfillment, his human worth is measured. This is the dominion of the idea, in other words, it is clericalism. Thus Robespierre and Jean Just were priests through and through, inspired by the idea, enthusiasts, consistent instruments of the idea, idealistic men. So Jean Just claims in a speech, there is something terrible in the sacred love of country. It is so exclusive that it sacrifices everything to the public interest without mercy, without fear, without human consideration. It hurls Manlius down the precipice. It sacrifices its private inclinations. It leads Regulus to Carthage, throws a Roman into the chasm, and sets Marat, as a victim of his devotion, in the Pantheon. Now, over these representatives of ideal or sacred interests stands a world of innumerable personal, profane interests. No idea, no system, no sacred cause is so great as never to be outrivaled and modified by these personal interests. Even if they are silent momentarily, and in times of rage and fanaticism, yet they soon come uppermost again through the sound sense of the people. Those ideas do not completely conquer till they are no longer hostile to personal interests, till they satisfy egoism. The man who is just now crying herrings in front of my window has a personal interest in good sales, and if his wife or anyone else wishes him the like, this remains a personal interest all the same. If, on the other hand, a thief deprived him of his basket, then there would at once arise an interest of the many, of the whole city, of the whole country, or, in a word, 
of all who abhor theft, an interest in which the herring seller's person would become indifferent, and in its place the category of the robbed man would come into the foreground. But even here all might yet resolve itself into a personal interest, each of the partakers reflecting that he must concur in the punishment of the thief, because unpunished stealing might otherwise become general and cause him too to lose his own. Such a calculation, however, can hardly be assumed on the part of many, and we shall rather hear the cry that the thief is a criminal. Here we have before us a judgment, the thief's action receiving its expression in the concept crime. Now the matter stands thus. Even if a crime did not cause the slightest damage either to me or to any of those in whom I take an interest, I should nevertheless denounce it. Why? Because I am enthusiastic for morality, filled with the idea of morality. What is hostile to it, I everywhere assail. Because in his mind theft ranks as abominable without any question, Proudhon, for instance, thinks that with the sentence property is theft, he has at once put a brand on property. In the sense of the priestly, theft is always a crime, or at least a misdeed. Here the personal interest is at an end. This particular person who has stolen the basket is perfectly indifferent to my person. It is only the thief, this concept of which that person represents a specimen, that I take an interest in. The thief and man are in my mind irreconcilable opposites. For one is not truly man when one is a thief. One degrades man or humanity in himself when one steals. Dropping out of personal concern, one gets into philanthropism, friendliness to man, which is usually misunderstood as if it were a love to men, to each individual, while it is nothing but a love of man, the unreal concept, the spook. It is not tus anthropus, men, but ton anthropon, man, that the philanthropist carries in his heart. To be sure, he cares for each individual, but only because he wants to see his beloved ideal realized everywhere. So there is nothing said here of care for me, you, us. That would be personal interest, and belongs under the head of worldly love. Philanthropism is a heavenly, spiritual, a priestly love. Man must be restored in us, even if thereby we poor devils should come to grief. It is the same priestly principle as that famous fiat justitia, periat mundus. Man and justice are ideas, ghosts for love of which everything is sacrificed. Therefore, the priestly spirits are the self-sacrificing ones. He who is infatuated with man leaves persons out of account as far as that infatuation extends, and floats in an ideal, sacred interest. Man, you see, is not a person, but an ideal, a spook. Now things as different as possible can belong to man and be so regarded. If one finds man's chief requirement in piety, there arises religious clericalism. If one sees it in morality, then moral clericalism raises its head. On this account, the priestly spirits of our day want to make a religion of everything, a religion of liberty, religion of equality, etc., and for them, every idea becomes a sacred cause. Even citizenship, politics, publicity, freedom of the press, trial by jury. Now what does unselfishness mean in this sense? Having only an ideal interest, 
before which no respect of persons avails. The stiff head of the worldly man opposes this, but for centuries has always been worsted at least so far as to have to bend the unruly neck and honor the higher power. Clericalism pressed it down. When the worldly egoist had shaken off a higher power, such as the Old Testament law, the Roman Pope, then at once a seven times greater one was over him again, such as faith in the place of the law, the transformation of all laymen into divines in place of the limited body of clergy, and so on. His experience was like that of the possessed man into whom seven devils passed when he thought he had freed himself from one. In the passage quoted above, all ideality is denied to the middle class. It certainly schemed against the ideal consistency with which Robespierre wanted to carry out the principle. The instinct of its interest told it that this consistency harmonized too little with what its mind was set on and that it would be acting against itself if it were willing to further the enthusiasm for principle. Was it to behave so unselfishly as to abandon all its aims in order to bring a harsh theory to its triumph? It suits the priests admirably, to be sure, when people listen to their summons, cast away everything and follow me, or sell all that thou hast and give it to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. Some decided idealists obey this call, but most act like Ananias and Sapphira, maintaining a behavior half clerical or religious and half worldly, serving God and mammon. I do not blame the middle class for not wanting to let its aims be frustrated by Robespierre, for inquiring of its egoism how far it might give the revolutionary idea a chance. But one might blame, if blame were in place here anyhow, those who let their own interests be frustrated by the interests of the middle class. However, will not they likewise sooner or later learn to understand what is to their advantage? August Becker says, To win the producers, proletarians, a negation of the traditional conception of right is by no means enough. Folks unfortunately care little for the theoretical victory of the idea. One must demonstrate to them ad oculos how this victory can be practically utilized in life, end quote. And, quote, you must get hold of folks by their real interests if you want to work upon them, end quote. Immediately after this, he shows how a fine looseness of morals is already spreading among our peasants because they prefer to follow their real interests rather than the commands of morality. Because the revolutionary priests or schoolmasters served man, they cut off the heads of men. The revolutionary laymen, those outside the sacred circle, did not feel any great horror of cutting off heads, but were less anxious about the rights of man than about their own. How comes it, though, that the egoism of those who affirm personal interest, and always inquire of it, is nevertheless forever succumbing to a priestly or schoolmasterly, that is an ideal, interest? Their person seems to them too small, too insignificant, and is so in fact, to lay claim to everything and be able to put itself completely in force. There is a sure sign of this in their dividing themselves into two persons, an eternal and a temporal, always caring either only for the one or only for the other, on Sunday for the eternal, on the workday for the temporal, in prayer for the former, in work for the latter. They have the priest in themselves, therefore they do not get rid of him, but hear themselves lectured inwardly every Sunday. How men have struggled and calculated to get at a solution regarding these dualistic essences. Idea followed upon idea, principle upon principle, system upon system, and none knew how to keep down permanently the contradiction of the worldly man, the so-called egoist. 
Does not this prove that all those ideas were too feeble to take up my whole will into themselves and satisfy it? They were and remained hostile to me, even if the hostility lay concealed for a considerable time. Will it be the same with self-ownership? Is it, too, only an attempt at mediation? Whatever principle I turned to, it might be to that of reason. I always had to turn away from it again. Or can I always be rational? Arrange my life according to reason in everything? I can, no doubt, strive after rationality. I can love it, just as I can also love God and every other idea. I can be a philosopher, a lover of wisdom, as I love God. But what I love, what I strive for, is only in my idea, my conception, my thoughts. It is in my heart, my head. It is in me like the heart, but it is not I. I am not it. To the activity of priestly minds belongs especially what one often hears called moral influence. Moral influence takes a start where humiliation begins. Yes, it is nothing else than this humiliation itself, the breaking and bending of the temper down to humility. If I call to someone to run away when a rock is to be blasted, I exert no moral influence by this demand. If I say to a child, you will go hungry if you will not eat what is put on the table, this is not moral influence. But if I say to it, you will pray, honor your parents, respect the crucifix, speak the truth, for this belongs to man and is man's calling, or even this is God's will then moral influence is complete. Then a man is to bend before the calling of man, be tractable, become humble, give up his will for an alien one which is set up as a rule and law. He is to abase himself before something higher, self-abasement. He that abaseth himself shall be exalted. Yes, yes, children must early be made to practice piety godliness, and propriety. A person of good breeding is one into whom good maxims have been instilled and impressed, poured in through a funnel, thrashed in and preached in. If one shrugs his shoulders at this, at once the good wring their hands despairingly and cry, But for heaven's sake, if one is to give children no good instruction, why, then they will run straight into the jaws of sin and become good-for-nothing hoodlums. Gently, you prophets of evil. Good-for-nothing in your sense they certainly will become, but your sense happens to be a very good-for-nothing sense. The impudent lads will no longer let anything be whined and chattered into them by you, and will have no sympathy for all the follies for which you have been raving and driveling since the memory of man began. They will abolish the law of inheritance. They will not be willing to inherit your stupidities as you inherited them from your fathers. They destroy inherited sin. Now, I've only been reading Stierner's footnotes, but here's an important footnote from the translator and editor. Footnote called in English theology, original sin, and footnote. If you command them, bend before the Most High, they will answer. If he wants to bend us, let him come himself and do it. We, at least, will not bend of our own accord. And if you threaten them with his wrath and his punishment, they will take it like being threatened with the boogeyman. If you are no more successful in making them afraid of ghosts, then the dominion of ghosts is at an end, and nurses' tales find no faith. And is it not precisely the liberals again that press for good education and improvement of the educational system? For how could their liberalism, 
their liberty within the bounds of law, come about without discipline, even if they do not exactly educate to the fear of God, yet they demand the fear of man all the more strictly, and awaken enthusiasm for the truly human calling by discipline. A long time passed away, in which people were satisfied with the fancy that they had the truth, without thinking seriously whether perhaps they themselves must be true to possess the truth. This time was the Middle Ages. With the common consciousness, the consciousness which deals with things, that consciousness which has receptivity only for things, or for what is sensuous and sense-moving, they thought to grasp what did not deal with things and what was not perceptible by the senses. As one does indeed also exert his eye to see the remote, or laboriously exercise his hand till its fingers have become dexterous enough to press the keys correctly. So they chasten themselves in the most manifold ways, in order to become capable of receiving the supersensual wholly into themselves. But what they chastened was, after all, only the sensual man, the common consciousness, so-called finite or objective thought. Yet is this thought, this understanding, which Luther decries under the name of reason, is incapable of comprehending the divine. Its chastening contributed just as much to the understanding of the truth as if one exercised the feet year in and year out in dancing and hoped that in this way they would finally learn to play the flute. Luther, with whom the so-called Middle Ages end, was the first who understood that the man himself must become other than he was if he wanted to comprehend truth, must become as true as truth itself. Only he who already has truth in his belief, only he who believes in it, can become a partaker of it. Only the believer finds it accessible and sounds its depths. Only that organ of man which is able to blow can attain the further capacity of flute playing, and only the man can become a partaker of truth who has the right organ for it. He who is capable of thinking only what is sensuous, objective, pertaining to things, figures to himself in truth only what pertains to things. But truth is spirit, stuff altogether inappreciable by the senses, and therefore only for the higher consciousness, not for that which is earthly-minded. With Luther, accordingly, dawns the perception that truth, because it is a thought, is only for the thinking man. And this is to say that man must henceforth take an utterly different standpoint, to wit, the heavenly, believing, scientific standpoint, or that of thought in relation to its object. The thought, that of mind in relation to mind. Consequently, only the like apprehend the like. You are like the spirit that you understand. Because Protestantism broke the medieval hierarchy, the opinion could take root that hierarchy in general had been shattered by it, and it could be wholly overlooked that it was precisely a reformation, and so a reinvigoration of the antiquated hierarchy. That medieval hierarchy had been only a weekly one, as it had to let all possible barbarism of unsanctified things run on uncoerced beside it, and it was the Reformation that first steeled the power of hierarchy. If Bruno Bauer thinks, quote, as the Reformation was mainly the abstract rendering of the religious principle from art, state, and science, and so its liberation from those powers with which it had joined itself in the antiquity of the Church, and in the hierarchy of the Middle Ages, 
so too the theological and ecclesiastical movements which proceeded from the Reformation are only the consistent carrying out of this abstraction of the religious principle from the other powers of humanity. End quote. I regard, precisely, the opposite as correct, and think that the dominion of spirits, or freedom of mind, which comes to the same thing, was never before so all-embracing and all-powerful, because the present one, instead of rending the religious principle from art, state, and science, lifted the latter altogether out of secularity, into the realm of spirit, and made them religious. Luther and Descartes have been appropriately put side by side in their He Who Believes in God and I Think, Therefore I Am, Cogito Ergo Sum. Man's heaven is thought, mind. Everything can be wrested from him except thought, except faith, particular faith, like faith of Zeus, Astarte, Jehovah, Allah, may be destroyed, but faith itself is indestructible. In thought is freedom. What I need and what I hunger for is no longer granted to me by any grace, by the Virgin Mary, by intercession of the saints, or by the binding and loosing church, but I procure it for myself. In short, my being, the sum, is a living in the heaven of thought, of mind, a cogitare. But I myself am nothing other than mind, thinking mind, according to Descartes, believing mind, according to Luther. My body I am not. My flesh may suffer from appetites or pains. I am not my flesh, but I am mind, only mind. This thought runs through the history of the Reformation till today. Only by the more modern philosophy since Descartes has a serious effort been made to bring Christianity to complete efficacy by exalting the scientific consciousness to be the only true and valid one. Hence it begins with absolute doubt, dubitare, with grinding common consciousness to atoms, with turning away from everything that mind, thought, does not legitimate. To it, nature counts for nothing, and it does not rest till it has brought reason into everything, and can say, the real is the rational, and only the rational is the real. Thus it has at last brought mind, reason, to victory, and everything is mind, because everything is rational, because all nature, as well as even the perversest opinions of men, contains reason, for all must serve for the best, that is, lead to the victory of reason. Descartes' dubitare contains the decided statement that only cogitare, thought, mind, is. A complete break with common consciousness, which ascribes reality to irrational things, only the rational is, only mind is. This is the principle of modern philosophy, the genuine Christian principle. Descartes, in his own time, discriminated the body sharply from the mind, and the spirit tis that builds itself the body, says Goethe. But this philosophy itself, Christian philosophy, still does not get rid of the rational, and therefore inveighs against the merely subjective, against fantasies, fortuities, arbitrariness, etc. What it wants is that the divine should become visible in everything, 
and all consciousness become a knowing of the divine. And man behold God everywhere. But God never is without the devil. For this very reason, the name of philosopher is not to be given to him who has indeed opened eyes for the things of the world, a clear and undazzled gaze, a correct judgment about the world, but who sees in the world just the world, in objects, only objects, and in short, everything prosaically as it is. But he alone is a philosopher who sees and points out or demonstrates heaven in the world, the supernal in the earthly, the divine in the mundane. The former may be ever so wise. There is no getting away from this. Quote, what wise men see not by their wisdom's art is practiced simply by a childlike heart. It takes this childlike heart, this eye for the divine, to make a philosopher. The first named man has only a common consciousness, but he who knows the divine and knows how to tell it has a scientific one. On this ground, Bacon was turned out of the realm of philosophers, and certainly what is called English philosophy seems to have got no further than to the discoveries of so-called clear heads, such as Bacon and Hume. The English did not know how to exalt the simplicity of the childlike heart to philosophic significance, did not know how to make philosophers out of childlike hearts. This is as much as to say, their philosophy was not able to become theological or theology, and yet it is only as theology that it can really live itself out, complete itself. The field of its battle to the death is in theology. Bacon did not trouble himself about theological questions and cardinal points. End of this section. The Ego and His Own by Max Stirner. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Matt Messerschmidt in Ann Arbor, Michigan, USA. Chapter 2, Section A. Continuation of Subdivision 3, The Hierarchy. Cognition as its object in life. German thought seeks, more than that of others, to reach the beginnings and fountainheads of life, and sees no life till it sees it in cognition itself. Descartes' cogito ergo sum has the meaning, one lives only when one thinks. Thinking life is called intellectual life. Only mind lives. Its life is the true life. Then, just so in nature only the eternal laws, the mind or the reason of nature, are its true life. In man, as in nature, only the thought lives, everything else is dead. To this abstraction, to the life of generalities or of that which is lifeless, the history of mind had to come. God, who is spirit, alone lives. Nothing lives but the ghost. 
How can one try to assert of modern philosophy or modern times that they have reached freedom, since they have not freed us from the power of objectivity? Or am I perhaps free from a despot, when I am not afraid of the personal potentate, to be sure, but of every infraction of the loving reverence which I fancy I owe him? The case is the same with modern times. They only changed the existing objects, the real ruler, into conceived objects, into ideas, before which the old respect not only was not lost, but increased in intensity. Even if people snapped their fingers at God and the devil in their former crass reality, people devoted only the greater attention to their ideas. Quote, they are rid of the evil one. Evil is left. The decision having once been made not to let oneself be imposed on any longer by the extant and palpable, little scruple was felt about revolting against the existing state or overturning the existing laws. But to sin against the idea of the state, not to submit to the idea of law, who would have dared that? So one remained a citizen and a law-respecting, loyal man. Yes, one seemed to himself to be only so much more law-respecting, the more rationalistically one abrogated the former defect of law in order to do homage to the spirit of the law. In all this, the objects had only suffered a change of form. They had remained in their preponderance and preeminence. In short, one was still involved in obedience and possessiveness, lived in reflection, and had an object on which one reflected, which one respected, and before which one felt reverence and fear. One had done nothing but transform the things into conceptions of the things, into thoughts and ideas whereby one's dependence became all the more intimate and indissoluble. Thus it is not hard to emancipate oneself from the commands of parents, or to set aside the admonitions of uncle and aunt, the entreaties of brother and sister. But the renounced obedience easily gets into one's conscience, and the less one does give way to the individual demands, because he rationistically, by his own reason, recognizes them to be unreasonable, so much the more conscientiously does he hold fast to filial piety and family love, and so much the harder is it for him to forgive himself a trespass against the conception which he has formed of family love and of filial duty. Released from dependence as regards the existing family, one falls into the more binding dependence on the idea of the family. One is ruled by the spirit of the family. The family consisting of John, Maggie, etc., whose dominion has become powerless, is only internalized, being left as family in general, to which one just applies the old saying, We must obey God rather than man, whose significance here is this, I cannot, to be sure, accommodate myself to your senseless requirements, but, as my family, you still remain the object of my love and care. For the family is a sacred idea, which the individual must never offend against. And this family, internalized and desensualized into a thought, a conception, now ranks as the sacred whose despotism is tenfold more grievous because it makes a racket in my conscience. This despotism is broken when the conception family also becomes a nothing to me. The Christian dicta, Woman, what have I to do with thee? I am come to stir up a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and others are accompanied by something that refers us to the heavenly or true family, and mean no more than the state's demand, in case of a collision between it and the family, the 
we obey its commands. The case of morality is like that of the family. Many a man renounces morals, but with great difficulty the conception morality. Morality is the idea of morals, their intellectual power, their power over the conscience, on the one hand, Morals are too material to rule the mind, and do not fetter an intellectual man, a so-called independent, a free thinker. The Protestant may put it as he will. The Holy Scripture, the Word of God, still remains sacred for him. He for whom this is no longer holy has ceased to be a Protestant. But herewith, what is ordained in it, the public authorities appointed by God, etc., also remain sacred for him. For him these things remain indissoluble, unapproachable, raised above all doubt. And as doubt, which in practice becomes a buffeting, is what is most man's own, these things remain raised above himself. He who cannot get away from them will believe, for to believe in them is to be bound to them. Through the fact that in Protestantism the faith becomes a more inward faith, the servitude has also become a more inward servitude. One has taken those sanctities up into himself, entwined them with all his thoughts and endeavors, made them a matter of conscience constructed out of them a sacred duty for himself. Therefore, what the Protestant's conscience cannot get away from is sacred to him, and conscientiousness most clearly designates his character. Protestantism has actually put a man in the position of a country governed by secret police. The spy and the eavesdropper, conscience, watches over every motion of the mind, and all thought and action is for it a matter of conscience, that is, police business. This tearing apart of man into natural impulse and conscience, inner populace and inner police, is what constitutes the Protestant. The reason of the Bible in place of the Catholic reason of the Church, ranks as sacred. And this feeling and consciousness that the word of the Bible is sacred is called conscience. With this, then, sacredness is laid upon one's conscience. If one does not free himself from conscience, the consciousness of the sacred, he may act unconsciously indeed but never conscienselessly. The Catholic finds himself satisfied when he fulfills the command. The Protestant acts according to his best judgment and conscience. For the Catholic is only a layman. The Protestant is himself a clergyman. Just this is the progress of the Reformation period beyond the Middle Ages, and at the same time its curse, that the spiritual becomes complete. What else was the Jesuit moral philosophy than a continuation of the sale of indulgences? Only that the man who was relieved of his burden of sin now gained also an insight into the remission of sins, and convinced himself how really his sin was taken from him, since in this or that particular case, casuists, it was so clearly no sin at all that he committed. The sale of indulgences had made all sins and transgressions permissible and silenced every movement of conscience. All sensuality might hold sway if it was only purchased from the church. This favoring of sensuality was continued by the Jesuits, while the strictly moral, dark, fanatical, repentant, contrite, praying Protestants, as the true completers of Christianity to be sure, acknowledged only the intellectual and spiritual man. Catholicism, especially the Jesuits, 
gave aid to egoism in this way. Found involuntary and unconscious adherence within Protestantism itself, and saved us from the subversion and extinction of sensuality. Nevertheless, the Protestant spirit spreads its dominion farther and farther, and as, beside it, the divine, the Jesuit spirit represents only the diabolical, which is inseparable from everything divine. The latter can never assert itself alone, but must look on and see how in France, for example, the Philistinism of Protestantism wins at last, and mind is on top. Protestantism is usually complimented on having brought the mundane into repute again, such as marriage, the state, etc. But the mundane itself as mundane, the secular, is even more indifferent to it than to Catholicism, which lets the profane world stand, yes, and relishes its pleasures, while the rational, consistent Protestant sets about annihilating the mundane altogether and that simply by hollowing it. So marriage has been deprived of its naturalness by becoming sacred, not in the sense of the Catholic sacrament, where it only receives its consecration from the Church, and so is unholy at bottom, but in the sense of being something sacred in itself to begin with, a sacred relation. Just so the state, also. Formerly the Pope gave consecration and his blessing to it and its princes. Now the state is intrinsically sacred. Majesty is sacred without needing the priest's blessing. The order of nature, or natural law, was altogether hallowed as God's ordinance. Hence it is said in the Augsburg Confession, Article 2. So now we reasonably abide by the saying, as the jurist consults have wisely and rightly said, that man and woman should be with each other is a natural law. Now, if it is a natural law, then it is God's ordinance, therefore implanted in nature, and therefore a divine law also. And is it anything more than Protestantism brought up to date? When Feuerbach pronounces moral relations sacred, not as God's ordinance indeed, but instead, for the sake of the spirit that dwells in them? Quote, but marriage, as a free alliance of love, of course, is sacred of itself by the nature of the union that is formed here. That marriage alone is a religious one, that is a true one, that corresponds to the essence of marriage, love. And so it is with all moral relations. They are ethical, are cultivated with a moral mind, only where they rank as religious of themselves. True friendship is only where the limits of friendship are preserved with religious conscientiousness, with the same conscientiousness with which the believer guards the dignity of his God. Friendship is and must be sacred for you, and property, and marriage, and the good of every man, but sacred in and of itself. That is a very essential consideration. In Catholicism, the mundane can indeed be consecrated or hallowed, but it is not sacred without this priestly blessing. In Protestantism, on the contrary, mundane relations are sacred of themselves, sacred by their mere existence. The Jesuit maxim, the end hallows the means corresponds precisely to the consecration by which sanctity is bestowed. No means are holy or unholy in themselves, but their relation to the Church, 
their use for the church hollows the means. Regicide was named as such. If it was committed for the church's behoof, it could be certain of being hollowed by the church, even if the hollowing was not openly pronounced. To the Protestant, majesty ranks as sacred. To the Catholic, only that majesty which is consecrated by the pontiff can rank as such, and it does rank as such to him only because the Pope, even though it be without a special act, confers this sacredness on it once and for all. If he retracted his consecration, the king would be left only a man of the world, or layman, an unconsecrated man to the Catholic. If the Protestant seeks to discover a sacredness in the sensual itself, that he may then be linked only to what is holy, the Catholic strives rather to banish the sensual from himself into a separate domain, where it, like the rest of nature, keeps its value for itself. The Catholic Church eliminated mundane marriage from its consecrated order, and withdrew those who were its own from the mundane family. The Protestant Church declared marriage and family ties to be holy, and therefore not unsuitable for its clergymen. A Jesuit may, as a good Catholic, hollow everything. He needs only, for example, to say to himself, I, as a priest, am necessary to the Church but serve it more zealously when I appease my desires properly. Consequently, I will seduce this girl, have my enemy there poisoned, etc. My end is holy because it is a priest. Consequently, it hollows the means. <laughs> for in the end, it is still done for the benefit of the church. Why should the Catholic priest shrink from handing Emperor Henry VII the poisoned wafer for the church's welfare? The genuinely churchly Protestants invade against every innocent pleasure, because only the sacred, the spiritual, can be innocent. What they could not point out the Holy Spirit in, the Protestants had to reject. Dancing theater, ostentation in the church, and the like. Compared with this puritanical Calvinism, Lutheranism is again more on the religious, spiritual track, is more radical. For the former excludes at once a great number of things as sensual and worldly, and purifies the church. Lutheranism, on the contrary, tries to bring spirit into all things as far as possible, to recognize the Holy Spirit as an essence in everything, and so to hollow everything worldly. No one can forbid a kiss in honor. The spirit of honor hollows it. Hence it was that the Lutheran Hegel he declares himself such in some passage or other. He, quote, wants to remain a Lutheran, unquote, was completely successful in carrying the idea through everything. In everything, there is reason, Holy Spirit, or the real is rational. For the real is, in fact, everything as in each thing, for instance, each lie, the truth, can be detected. There is no absolute lie, no absolute evil, and the like. Great works of mind were created almost solely by Protestants, as they alone were the true disciples and consummators of mind. How little 
man is able to control. He must let the sun run its course, the sea roll its waves, the mountains rise to heaven. Thus he stands powerless before the uncontrollable. Can he keep off the impression that he is helpless against this gigantic world? It is a fixed law to which he must submit. It determines his fate. Now, what did pre-Christian humanity work toward? Toward getting rid of the eruptions of the destinies, not letting oneself be vexed by them. The Stoics attained this in apathy, declaring the attacks of nature indifferent, and not letting themselves be affected by them. Horace utters the famous Nil Admirari, by which he likewise announces the indifference of the other, the world. It is not to influence us, not to rouse our astonishment. And that in Pafidium Ferient Ruinae expresses the very same imperturbability as Psalms chapter 46, verse 3. We do not fear, or the earth should perish. In all this, there is room made for the Christian proposition that the world is empty, for the Christian contempt of the world. The imperturbable spirit of the wise man, with which the old world worked to prepare its end, now underwent an inner perturbation, against which no ataraxia, no stoic courage, was able to protect it. The spirit, secured against all influence of the world, insensible to its shocks and exalted above its attacks, admiring nothing, not to be disconcerted by any downfall of the world, foamed over irrepressibly again because gases, spirits, were evolved in its own interior, and, after the mechanical shock that comes from without had become ineffective, chemical tensions that agitate within began their wonderful play. In fact, ancient history ends with this, that I have struggled till I have won my ownership of the world. All things have been delivered to me by my Father. Matthew chapter 11, verse 27. It has ceased to be overpowering, unapproachable, sacred, divine for me. It is undeified. And now I treat it so entirely as I please, that, if I cared, I could exert on it all miracle-working power, that is, power of mind. Remove mountains. Command mulberry trees to tear themselves up and transplant themselves into the sea. Luke 17, verse 6. And do everything possible thinkable. All things are possible to him who believes. Mark chapter 7 verse 23. I am the Lord of the world. Mine is the glory. The world has become prosaic, for the divine has vanished from it. It is my property, which I dispose of as I, to it, the mind, choose. When I had exalted myself to be the owner of the world, egoism had won its first complete victory, had vanquished the world, had become worldless, and put the acquisitions of a long age under lock and key. The first property the first glory has been acquired. But the Lord of the world is not yet Lord of his thoughts, his feelings, his will, 
he is not lord and owner of the spirit, for the spirit is still sacred, the Holy Spirit, and the worldless Christian is not able to become godless. If the ancient struggle was a struggle against the world, the medieval Christian struggle is a struggle against self, the mind, the former against the outer world, the latter against the inner world. The medieval man is the man whose gaze is turned inward, the thinking, meditative man. All wisdom of the ancients is the science of the world. All wisdom of the moderns is the science of God. The heathen, Jews included, got through with the world. But now the thing was to get through with self, the spirit too, to become spiritless or godless. For almost 2,000 years, we have been working at subjecting the Holy Spirit to ourselves. And little by little, we have torn off and trodden underfoot many bits of sacredness. But the gigantic opponent is constantly rising anew under a changed form and name. The spirit has not yet lost its divinity, its holiness, its sacredness. To be sure, it has long ceased to flutter over our heads as a dove. To be sure, it no longer gladdens its saints alone but lets itself be caught by the laity too, but as spirit of humanity, as spirit of man. It remains still an alien spirit to me or you, still far from becoming our unrestricted property, which we dispose of at our pleasure. However, one thing certainly happened and visibly guided the progress of post-Christian history. This one thing was the endeavor to make the Holy Spirit more human and bring it nearer to men, or men to it. Through this, it came about that at last it could be conceived as the spirit of humanity. And under different expressions like idea of humanity, mankind, humaneness, general philanthropy, appeared more attractive, more familiar, and more accessible. Would not one think that now everybody could possess the Holy Spirit, take up into himself the idea of humanity, bring mankind to form an existence in himself? No. The Spirit is not stripped of its holiness and robbed of its unapproachableness is not accessible to us, not our property. For the spirit of humanity is not my spirit. My ideal, it may be, and as a thought, I call it mine. The thought of humanity is my property, and I prove this sufficiently by propounding it quite according to my views and shaping it today so, tomorrow, otherwise. We represent it to ourselves in the most manifold ways. But it is, at the same time, an entail, which I cannot alienate nor get rid of. Among many transformations, the Holy Spirit became, in time, the absolute idea, which again, in manifold refractions, split into the different areas of philanthropy reasonableness, civic virtue, and so on. But can I call the idea my property if it is the idea of humanity? And can I consider the spirit as vanquished if I am to serve it, sacrifice myself to it? Antiquity, at its close, had gained its ownership of the world only when it had broken the world's overpoweringness and divinity, recognized the world's powerlessness and vanity. The case with regard to the spirit 
corresponds. When I have degraded it to a spook and its control over me to a cranky notion, then it is to be looked upon as having lost its sacredness, its holiness, its divinity, and then I use it as one uses nature at pleasure without scruple. The nature of the case, the concept of the relation, is to guide me in dealing with the case or in contracting the relation. As if a concept of the case existed on its own account and was not rather the concept that one forms of the case. As if a relation which we enter into was not, by the uniqueness of those who enter into it, itself unique. As if it depended on how others stamp it. But as people separated the essence of man from the real man, and judged the latter by the former, so they also separate his action from him, and appraise it by human value. Concepts are to decide everywhere, concepts to regulate life, concepts to rule. This is the religious world to which Hegel gave a systematic expression, bringing method into the nonsense and completing the conceptual precepts into a rounded, firmly based dogmatic. Everything is sung according to concepts, and the real man, I, am compelled to live according to these conceptual laws. Can there be a more grievous dominion of law, and did not Christianity confess at the very beginning that it meant only to draw Judaism's dominion of law tighter? Not a letter of the law shall be lost. Liberalism simply brought other concepts on the carpet, human instead of divine, political instead of ecclesiastical, scientific instead of doctrinal, or more generally, real concepts and eternal laws instead of crude dogmas and precepts. Now, nothing but mind rules in the world. An innumerable multitude of concepts buzz about in people's heads. And what are those doing who endeavor to get further? They are negating these concepts to put new ones in their place. They are saying, you form a false concept of right, of the state, of man, of liberty, of truth, of marriage. The concept of right, etc., is rather that one which we now set up. Thus, the confusion of concepts moves forward. The history of the world has dealt cruelly with us, and the Spirit has obtained an almighty power. You must have regard for my miserable shoes, which could protect your naked foot, my salt, by which your potatoes would become palatable, and my stage carriage, whose possession would relieve you of all need at once. You must not reach out after them. Man is to recognize the independence of all these, and innumerable other things. They are to rank his mind as something that cannot be seized or approached. They are to be kept away from him. He must have regard for it, respect it. Woe to him if he stretches out his fingers desirously. We call that being light-fingered. How beggarly little is left us. Yes, how really nothing. Everything has been removed. We must not venture on anything unless it is given us. We continue to live only by the grace of the giver. You must not pick up a pin unless you have got leave to do so. And got it from whom? From respect. Only when this lets you have it as property, only when you can respect it as property, only then may you take it. And again, you are not to conceive a thought, speak a syllable, commit an action, that should have their warrant in you alone, instead of receiving it from morality or reason or humanity. Happy unconstraint of the desirous man, how mercilessly people have tried to slay you on the altar of constraint. But around the altar rise the arches of a church, and its walls keep moving further and further out. What they enclose is sacred. 
You can no longer get to it, no longer touch it. Shrieking with the hunger that devours you, you wander round these walls in search of the little that is profane. And the circles of your course keep growing more and more extended. Soon that church will embrace the whole world, and you will be driven out to the extreme edge. Another step of the sacred has conquered. You sink into the abyss. Therefore take courage while it is yet time. Wander about no longer in the profane, where now it is dry feeding. Dare the leap, and rush in through the gates into the sanctuary itself. If you devour the sacred, you have made it your own. Digest the sacramental wafer, and you are rid of it. End of section 11「The Ego and His Own」by Max Stirner. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Matt Messerschmidt in Ann Arbor, Michigan, USA. Chapter 2, Subdivision C, The Free. The ancients and the moderns having been presented above in two divisions, it may seem as if the free were here to be described in a third division, as independent and distinct. This is not so. Free are only the more modern and most modern among the moderns, and are put in a separate division merely because they belong to the present. And what is present, above all, claims our attention here. I give the free only as a translation of the liberals, but must, with regard to the concept of freedom, as in general with regard to so many other things whose anticipatory introduction cannot be avoided, refer to what comes later. Section 1. Political Liberalism after the chalice of so-called absolute monarchy had been drained down to the dregs, in the 18th century, people became aware that their drink did not taste human. Too clearly aware, not to begin to crave a different cup. Since our fathers were human beings, after all, they at last desired also to be regarded as such. Whoever sees in us something else than in him we likewise will not see a human being, but an inhuman being, and will meet him as an inhuman being. On the other hand, whoever recognizes us as human beings and protects us against the danger of being treated inhumanly, him we will honor as our true protector and guardian. Let us then hold together and protect the man and each other. Then we find the necessary protection in our holding together, and in ourselves, those who hold together, a fellowship of those who know their human dignity and hold together as human beings. Our holding together is the state. We who hold together are the nation. In our being together as nation or state, we are only human beings. How we deport ourselves in other respects as individuals, and what self-seeking impulses we may there succumb to, belong solely to our private life. Our public or state life is a purely human one. Everything unhuman or, quote, egoistic, unquote, that clings to us is degraded to a, quote, private matter, unquote, and we distinguish the state definitely from, quote, civil society, unquote, which is the sphere of, quote, egoisms, unquote, activity. The true man is the nation. 
but the individual is always an egoist. Therefore strip off your individuality, or isolation wherein dwells discord and egoistic inequality, and consecrate yourself wholly to the true man, the nation, or the state. Then you will rank as men, and have all that is man's. The state, the true man, will entitle you to what belongs to it, and give you the rights of man. Man gives you his rights. So runs the speech of the Comalty. Editor's footnote regarding the word Comalty. Comalty, or citizenhood. The word, das Bürgertum, means either the condition of being a citizen or citizen-like principles, of the body of citizens or of the middle or business class, the bourgeoisie. End footnote. The comalty is nothing else than the thought that the state is all in all, the true man, and that the individual's human value consists in being a citizen of the state. In being a good citizen, he seeks his highest honor. Beyond that, he knows nothing higher than at most the antiquated, being a good Christian. The comalty developed itself in the struggle against the privileged classes, by whom it was cavalierly treated as third estate, and confounded with the canaille. In other words, up to this time the state had recognized caste. The son of a nobleman was selected for a post to which the most distinguished commoners aspired in vain. The civic feeling revolted against this. No more distinction. No giving preference to persons, no difference of classes, let all be alike. No separate interest is to be pursued longer, but the general interest of all. The state is to be a fellowship of free and equal men, and every one is to devote himself to the welfare of the whole, to be dissolved in the state, to make the state his end and ideal. State, state. So ran the general cry, and thenceforth people sought for the right form of state, the best constitution, and so the state in its best conception. The thought of the state passed into all hearts and awakened enthusiasm. To serve it, this mundane God, became the new divine service and worship. The properly political epoch had dawned. To serve the state or the nation became the highest ideal. The state's interest, the highest interest. State service, for which one does not by any means need to be an official, the highest honor. So then, the separate interests and personalities had been scared away, and sacrifice for the state had become the shibboleth. One must give up himself and live only for the state. One must act disinterestedly, not want to benefit himself, but the state. Hereby the latter has become the true person, before whom the individual personality vanishes. Not I live, but it lives in me. Therefore, in comparison with the former self-seeking, this was unselfishness and impersonality itself. Before this God state, all egoism vanished, and before it, all were equal. They were without any other distinction. Men, nothing but men. The revolution took fire from the inflammable material of property. The government needed money. Now it must prove the proposition that it is absolute, and so master of all property, sole proprietor. It must take to itself its money, which was only in the possession of the subjects, not their property. Instead of this, it calls states general to have this money granted to it. The shrinking from strictly logical action destroyed the illusion of an absolute government. He who must have something granted to him cannot be regarded as absolute. 
the subjects recognized that they were real proprietors and that it was their money that was demanded. Those who had hitherto been subjects attained the consciousness that they were proprietors. Bailly depicts this in a few words. If you cannot dispose of my property without my consent, how much less can you of my person, of all that concerns my mental and social position? All this is my property, like the piece of land that I till, and I have a right, an interest, to make the laws myself. By these words sound, certainly, as if everyone was a proprietor now. However, instead of the government, instead of the prince, the nation now became proprietor and master. From this time on, the ideal is spoken of as, quote, popular liberty, unquote, quote, a free people, unquote, etc. As early as July 8, 1789, the declaration of the bishop of Autun and Berer took away all semblance of the importance of each and every individual in legislation. It showed the complete powerlessness of the constituents. The majority of the representatives has become master. When on July 9th the plan for division of the work on the Constitution is proposed, Mirabeau remarks that, quote, the government has only power, no rights. Only in the people is the source of all right to be found, unquote. On July 16th, the same Mirabeau exclaims, is not the people the source of all power? The source, therefore, of all right and the source of all power. By the way, here the substance of right becomes visible. It is power. He who has power has right. The commonalty is the heir of the privileged classes. In fact, the rights of the barons, which were taken from them as usurpations, only passed over to the commonalty. For the commonalty was now called the nation. Quote, into the hands of the nation, unquote, all prerogatives were given back. Thereby they ceased to be prerogatives, they became rights. From this time on, the nation demands tithes, compulsory services. It has inherited the Lord's court, the rights of Vare and Venison, the serfs. The night of August 4th was the death night of privileges or prerogatives. Cities, communes, boards of magistrates were also privileged, furnished with prerogatives and seigneurial rights, and ended with the new morning of right the, quote, rights of the state, the, quote, rights of the nation, unquote. The monarch in the person of the royal master had been a paltry monarch compared with this new monarch, the sovereign nation. This monarchy was a thousand times severer, stricter, and more consistent. Against the new monarch, there was no longer any right, any privilege at all. How limited the absolute king of the ancient regime looks in comparison. The revolution affected the transformation of limited monarchy into absolute monarchy. From this time on, every right that is not conferred by this monarch is an assumption with every prerogative that he bestows, a right. The times demanded absolute royalty, absolute monarchy. Therefore, down fell that so-called absolute royalty, which had so little understood how to become absolute that it remained limited by a thousand little lords. What was longed for and striven for through thousands of years to wit, 
to find that absolute lord beside whom no other lords and lordlings any longer exist to clip his power the bourgeoisie has brought to pass it has revealed the lord who alone confers rightful titles and without whose warrant nothing is justified Quote, so now we know that an idol is nothing in the world and that there is no other god save the one first corinthians chapter 8 verse 4 against right one can no longer as against a right come forward with the assertion that it is quote, a wrong unquote. one can say now only that it is a piece of nonsense an illusion if one called it wrong one would have to set up another right in opposition to it and measure it by this if on the contrary one rejects right as such right in and of itself altogether then one also rejects the concept of wrong and dissolves the whole concept of right to which the concept of wrong belongs what is the meaning of the doctrine that we all enjoy equality of political rights only this that the state has no regard for my person that to it i like every other am only a man without having another significance that commands its deference i do not command its deference as an aristocrat a nobleman's son or even as heir of an official whose office belongs to me by inheritance, as in the Middle Age countships, etc., and later under absolute royalty, where hereditary offices occur. Now the state has an innumerable multitude of rights to give away. The right to lead a battalion, a company, etc., the right to lecture at a university, and so forth. It has them to give away because they are its own, namely state rights or quote, political unquote, rights withal it makes no difference to it to whom it gives them if the receiver only fulfills the duties that spring from the delegated rights to it we are all of us all right and equal one worth no more and no less than another it is indifferent to me who receives the command of the army, says the sovereign state, provided the grantee understands the matter properly. Quote, equality of political rights, unquote, has, consequently, the meaning that everyone may acquire every right that the state has to give away, if only he fulfills the conditions annexed thereto, conditions that are to be sought only in the nature of the particular right not in a predilection for the person, persona grata. The nature of the right to become an officer bears with it the necessity that one possess sound limbs and a suitable measure of knowledge, but it does not have noble birth as a condition. If, on the other hand, even the most deserving commoner could not reach that station, then an inequality of political rights would exist. Among the states of today, one has carried out that maxim of equality more, another less. The monarchy of the states, so I will call absolute royalty, the time of the kings before the revolution, kept the individual independence on a lot of little monarchies. These were fellowships, societies, like the guilds, the nobility, the priesthood, the burgher class, cities, communes. Everywhere the individual must regard himself first as a member of this little society and yield unconditional obedience to its spirit, the esprit de corps, as his monarch. More than the individual nobleman himself must his family, the honor of his race, be to him. Only by means of his corporation, his estate, 
did the individual have relation to the greater corporation, the state. As in Catholicism, the individual deals with God only through the priest. To this, the third estate now, showing courage to negate itself as an estate, made an end. It decided no longer to be and be called an estate beside other estates, but to glorify and generalize itself into the nation. Hereby it created a much more complete and absolute monarchy, and the entire previously ruled principle of estates, the principle of little monarchies inside the great, went down. Therefore it cannot be said that the revolution was a revolution against the first two privileged estates. It was against the little monarchies of estates in general, but if the estates and their despotism were broken, the king too, we know, was only a king of estates, not a citizen king. The individuals freed from the inequality of estate were left. Were they now really to be without estate and, quote, out of gear, unquote, no longer bound by any estate, without a general bond of union? No. For the third estate had declared itself the nation, only in order not to remain an estate beside other estates, but to become the sole estate. This sole estate is the nation, the, quote, state, unquote. What had the individual now become? A political Protestant for he had come into immediate connection with his God, the state. He was no longer, as an aristocrat, in the monarchy of the nobility, as a mechanic in the monarchy of the guild, but he, like all, recognized and acknowledged only one lord, the state, as whose servants they all received the equal title of honor, citizen. The bourgeoisie is the aristocracy of desert. Its motto, let desert wear its crowns. It fought against the lazy aristocracy, for according to it, the industrious aristocracy, acquired by industry and desert, it is not the, quote, born, unquote, who are free, nor yet I who am free either but the, quote, deserving, unquote, man, the honest servant of his king of the state, of the people in constitutional states. Through service, one acquires freedom, that is, acquires deserts, even if one served mammon. One must deserve well of the state, of the principle of the state, of its moral spirit. He who serves the spirit of the state is a good citizen. Let him live to whatever honest branch of industry he will. In its eyes, innovators practice a breadless art. Only the quote-unquote shopkeeper is quote-unquote practical, and the spirit that chases after public office is as much the shopkeeping spirit as is that which tries in trade to feather its nest or otherwise to become useful to itself and anybody else. But if the deserving count as the free, for what does the comfortable commoner, the faithful office holder, lack of that freedom that his heart desires, then the servants are the free, the obedient Servant is the free man. What glaring nonsense! Yet this is the sense of the bourgeoisie and its poet, Goethe, as well as its philosopher, Hegel, succeeded in glorifying the dependence of the subject on the object, obedience to the objective world. He who only serves the cause devotes himself entirely to it, 
as the true freedom. And among thinkers, the cause was reason. That which, like the state and church, gives general laws and puts the individual man in irons by the thought of humanity. It determines what is, quote, true, unquote, according to which one must then act. No more, quote, unquote, rational people than the honest servants, who primarily are called good citizens as servants of the state. Be rich as Croesus or poor as Job. The state of the commonality leaves that to your option. But only have a good disposition. This it demands of you, and counts it its most urgent task to establish this in all. Therefore it will keep you from evil promptings, holding the ill-disposed in check and silencing their inflammatory discourses under censors cancelling marks, or press penalties, and behind dungeon walls, and will, on the other hand, appoint people of, quote, good disposition, unquote, as censors, and in every way have a moral influence exerted on you by, quote, well-disposed and well-meaning, unquote, people. If it has made you deaf to evil promptings, then it opens your ears again, all the more diligently, to good promptings. With the time of the bourgeoisie begins that of liberalism. People want to see what is rational, suited to the times, etc., established everywhere. The following definition of liberalism, which is supposed to be pronounced in its honor, characterizes it completely. Quote, liberalism is nothing else than the knowledge of reason applied to our existing relations, unquote. Its aim is a, quote, rational order, unquote, a, quote, moral behavior, unquote, a, quote, limited freedom, unquote, not anarchy, lawlessness, selfhood. But if reason rules, then the person succumbs, Art has for a long time not only acknowledged the ugly, but considered the ugly as necessary to its existence, and takes it up into itself. It needs the villain. In the religious domain, too, the extremist liberals go so far that they want to see the most religious man regarded as a citizen, that is, the religious villain. They want to see no more of trials for heresy. But against the, quote, rational law, no one is to be rebel. Otherwise, he is threatened with the severest penalty. What is wanted is not free movement and realization of the person or of me, but of reason, a dominion of reason, a dominion. The liberals are zealots, not exactly for the faith or God, but certainly for reason, their master. They brook no lack of breeding, and therefore no self-development and self-determination. They play the guardian as effectively as the most absolute rulers. Quote, political liberty. Unquote. What are we to understand by that? Perhaps the individual's independence of the state and its laws? No. On the contrary, the individual's subjection in the state and the state's laws. But why, quote-unquote, liberty? Because one is no longer separated from the state by intermediaries but stands in direct and immediate relation to it. Because one is a citizen, not the subject of another, not even of the king as a person, but only in his quality as, quote, 
supreme head of the state. Unquote. Political liberty, this fundamental doctrine of liberalism, is nothing but a second phase of Protestantism and runs quite parallel with, quote, religious liberty, unquote. Or would it perchance be right to understand by the latter an independence of religion? Anything but that. Independence of intermediaries is all that it is intended to express. Independence of mediating priests, the abolition of the quote-unquote laity, and so direct and immediate relation to religion or to God. Only on the supposition that one has religion can he enjoy freedom of religion. Freedom of religion does not mean being without religion, but an inwardness of faith, unmediated intercourse with God. To him who is religiously free, religion is an affair of the heart. It is to him his own affair. It is to him a sacredly serious matter. To the, quote, politically free, unquote, man, the state is a sacredly serious matter. It is his heart's affair, his chief affair, his own affair. End of section 12. Section 13 of The Ego and His Own. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anna Simon. The Ego and His Own by Max Stirner. Section 13. Political Liberalism, Part 2. Political liberty means that the polis, the state, is free. Freedom of religion, that religion is free, as freedom of conscience signifies that conscience is free. Not, therefore, that I am free from the state, from religion, from conscience, or that I am rid of them. It does not mean my liberty, but the liberty of a power that rules and subjugates me. It means that one of my despots, like state, religion, conscience, is free. State, religion, conscience, these despots, make me a slave, and their liberty is my slavery. That in this they necessarily follow the principle, the end hallows the means, is self-evident. If the welfare of the state is the end, war is a hallowed means. If justice is the state's end, homicide is a hallowed means, and is called by its sacred name execution. The sacred state hallows everything that is serviceable to it. Individual liberty over which civic liberalism keeps jealous watch, does not by any means signify a completely free self-determination by which actions become altogether mine, but only independence of persons. Individually free is he who is responsible to no man. Taken in this sense, and we are not allowed to understand it otherwise, not only the ruler is individually free, that is, irresponsible toward men, before God we know he acknowledges himself responsible, but all who are responsible only to the law. This kind of liberty was won through the revolutionary movement of the century, to wit, independence of arbitrary will, or tel est notre plaisir. Hence the constitutional prince must himself be stripped of all personality, deprived of all individual decision, that he may not as a person, as an individual man, violate the individual liberty of others. The personal will of the ruler has disappeared in the constitutional prince. It is with a right feeling, therefore, that absolute princes resist this. Nevertheless, these very ones profess to be in the best sense Christian princes. For this, however, they must become a purely spiritual power, as the Christian is subject only to spirit. God is spirit. The purely spiritual power is consistently represented only by the constitutional prince, he who, without any personal significance, 
stands there spiritualized to the degree that he can rank as a sheer uncanny spirit, as an idea. The constitutional king is a truly Christian king, the genuine, consistent carrying out of the Christian principle. In the constitutional monarchy individual dominion, that is, a real ruler that wills, has found its end. Here, therefore, individual liberty prevails, independence of every individual dictator, of every one who could dictate to me with a tel à notre plaisir. It is the completed Christian state life, a spiritualized life. The behavior of the commonality is liberal through and through. Every personal invasion of another sphere revolts the civic sense. If the citizen sees that one is dependent on the humor, the pleasure, the will of a man as individual, that is, as not as authorized by a higher power, at once he brings his liberalism to the front and shrieks about arbitrariness. In fine, the citizen asserts his freedom from what is called orders, ordinance. No one has any business to give me orders. Orders carries the idea that what I am to do is another man's will, while law does not express the personal authority of another. The liberty of the commonality is liberty or independence from the will of another person, so-called personal or individual liberty. For being personally free means being only so free that no other person can dispose of mine, or that what I may or may not do does not depend on the personal decree of another. The liberty of the press, for example, is such a liberty of liberalism liberalism fighting only against the coercion of the censorship as that of personal willfulness, but otherwise showing itself extremely inclined and willing to tyrannize over the press by press laws, that is, the civic liberals want liberty of writing for themselves, for, as they are law-abiding, their writings will not bring them under the law. Only liberal matter, that is, only lawful matter, is to be allowed to be printed, Otherwise, the press laws threaten press penalties. If one sees personal liberty assured, one does not notice at all how, if a new issue happens to arise, the most glaring unfreedom becomes dominant. For one is rid of orders, indeed, and no one has any business to give his orders. But one has become so much the more submissive to the law. One is enthralled now in due legal form. In the citizen-state there are only free people, who are compelled to thousands of things, for example, to deference, to a confession of faith, etc. But what does that amount to? Why, it is only the state, the law, not any man that compels them. What does the commonality mean by inveighing against every personal order, that is, every order not founded on the cause, on reason? It is simply fighting in the interest of the cause, footnote, sache, which commonly means thing, and footnote, against the dominion of persons. But the mind's cause is the rational, good, lawful, etc. That is the good cause. The commonality wants an impersonal ruler. Furthermore, if the principle is this, that only the cause is to rule man, to wit, the cause of morality, the cause of legality, etc., then no personal balking of one by the other may be authorized either, as formerly, for example, the commoner was balked of the aristocratic offices, the aristocrat of common mechanical trades, etc. Free competition must exist. Only through the thing, footnote, sache, end footnote, can one bark another, for example, the rich man barking the impecunious man by money, a thing, not as a person. Henceforth, only one lordship, the lordship of the state, is admitted. Personally, no one is any longer lord of another. Even at birth, the children belong to the state, and to the parents only in the name of the state, which, for example, does not allow infanticide, demands their baptism, etc. But all the state's children, furthermore, are of quite equal account in its eyes, civic or political equality and they may see to it themselves how they get along with each other. They may compete. Free competition means nothing else than that every one can present himself, assert himself, fight against another. Of course, the feudal party set itself against this, as its existence depended on an absence of competition. 
the contests in the time of the Restoration in France had no other substance than this, that the bourgeoisie was struggling for free competition, and the feudalists were seeking to bring back the guild system. Now free competition has won, and against the guild system it had to win. See below for the further discussion. If the revolution ended in a reaction, this only showed what the revolution really was. For every effort arrives at reaction when it comes to discrete reflection, and storms forward in the original action only so long as it is an intoxication, an indiscretion. Discretion will always be the cue of the reaction, because discretion sets limits and liberates what was really wanted, that is, the principle, from the initial unbridledness and unrestrainedness. Wild young fellows, bumptious students, who set aside all considerations, are really philistines, since with them, as with the latter, considerations form the substance of their conduct, only that as swaggerers they are mutinous against considerations, and in negative relations to them, but as philistines, later, they give themselves up to considerations, and have positive relations to them. In both cases, all their doing and thinking turns upon considerations. But the Philistine is reactionary in relation to the student. He is the wild fellow come to discreet reflection, as the latter is the unreflecting Philistine. Daily experience confirms the truth of this transformation, and shows how the swaggerers turn to Philistines in turning grey. So, too, the so-called reaction in Germany gives proof that it was only the discreet continuation of the warlike jubilation of liberty. The revolution was not directed against the established, but against the establishment in question, against a particular establishment. It did away with this ruler, not with the ruler. On the contrary, the French were ruled most inexorably. It killed the old vicious rulers, but wanted to confer on the virtuous ones a securely established position, that is, it simply set virtue in the place of vice. Vice and virtue, again, are on their part distinguished from each other only as a wild young fellow from a philistine, etc. To this day, the revolutionary principle has gone no farther than to assail only one or another particular establishment, that is, be reformatory. Much as may be improved, strongly as discreet progress may be adhered to, always there is only a new master set in the old one's place, and the overturning is a building up. We are still at the distinction of the young Philistine from the old one. The revolution began in bourgeois fashion with the uprising of the third estate, the middle class. In bourgeois fashion it dries away. It was not the individual man, and he alone is man, that became free, but the citizen, the citoyen, the political man, who for that very reason is not man, but a specimen of the human species, and more particularly, a specimen of the species citizen, a free citizen. In the revolution it was not the individual who acted so as to affect the world's history, but a people. The nation, the sovereign nation, wanted to affect everything. A fancied I, an idea, for example the nation, is, appears, acting. The individuals contribute themselves as tools of this idea, and act as citizens. The commonality has its power, and at the same time its limits, in the fundamental law of the state, in a charter, in a legitimate or just prince, who himself is guided and rules according to rational laws, in short, in legality. Footnote. Legitimate or righteous. German. Rechtlich. Just. Gerecht. End footnote. The period of the bourgeoisie is ruled by the British spirit of legality. An assembly of provincial estates, for example, is ever recalling that its authorization goes only so and so far, and that it is called at all only through favor, and can be thrown out again through disfavor. It is always reminding itself of its vocation. It is certainly not to be denied that my father begot me, but now that I am once begotten, surely his purposes in begetting do not concern me a bit, and whatever he may have called me to do, I do what I myself will. Therefore, even a called assembly of estates, the French assembly in the beginning of the revolution, recognized quite rightly that it was independent of the caller. It existed, 
and would have been stupid if it did not avail itself of the right of existence, but fancied itself dependent as on a father. The cold one no longer has to ask, what did the caller want when he created me? But what do I want after I have once followed the call? Not the caller, not the constituents, not the charter according to which their meeting was called out. Nothing will be to him a sacred, inviolable power. He is authorized for everything that is in his power. He will know no restrictive authorization, will not want to be loyal. This, if any such thing could be expected from chambers at all, would give a completely egoistic chamber, severed from all navel string and without consideration. But chambers are always devout, and therefore one cannot be surprised if so much halfway or undecided, that is, hypocritical, egoism parades in them. The members of the estates are to remain within the limits that are traced for them by the charter, by the king's will, etc. If they will not or cannot do that, then they are to step out. What dutiful man could act otherwise, could put himself, his conviction, and his will as the first thing? Who could be so immoral as to want to assert himself, even if the body corporate and everything should go to ruin over it? People keep carefully within the limits of their authorization. Of course, one must remain within the limits of his power anyhow, because no one can do more than he can. My power, or, if it be so, powerlessness, be my sole limit, but authorizations only restraining precepts? Should I profess this all supposed view? No, I am a law-abiding citizen. The commonality professes a morality which is most closely connected with its essence. The first demand of this morality is to the effect that one should carry on a solid business, an honorable trade, lead a moral life. Immoral to it is the sharper, the demi rap the thief, robber, and murderer, the gamester, the penniless man without a situation, the frivolous man. The doughty commoner designates the feeling against these immoral people as his deepest indignation. All these lack settlement, the solid quality of business, a solid, seemly life, a fixed income, etc. In short, they belong because their existence does not rest on a secure basis to the dangerous individuals or isolated persons, to the dangerous proletariat. They are individual bowlers, who offer no guarantee, and have nothing to lose, and so nothing to risk. The forming of family ties, for example, binds a man. He who is bound furnishes security, can be taken hold of, not so the street-walker. The gamester stakes everything on the game, ruins himself and others, no guarantee. All who appear to the commoner suspicious, hostile and dangerous, might be comprised under the name vagabonds. Every vagabondish way of living displeases him. For there are intellectual vagabonds, too, to whom the hereditary dwelling-place of their fathers seems too cramped and oppressive for them to be willing to satisfy themselves with the limited space any more. Instead of keeping within the limits of a temperate style of thinking, and taking as inviolable truth what furnishes comfort and tranquillity to thousands, they overlap all bounds of the traditional, and run wild with their impudent criticism and untamed mania for doubt, these extravagating vagabonds. They form the class of the unstable, restless, changeable, that is, of the proletariat, and, if they give voice to their unsettled nature, are called unruly fellows. Such a broad sense has the so-called proletariat, or pauperism, how much one would err if one believed the commonality to be desirous of doing away with poverty, pauperism, to the best of its ability. On the contrary, the good citizen helps himself with the incomparably comforting conviction that the fact is that the good things of fortune are unequally divided and will always remain so, according to God's wise decree. The poverty which surrounds him in every alley does not disturb the true commoner further than that at most he clears his account with it by throwing an alms, or finds work and food for an honest and serviceable fellow. But so much the more does he feel his quiet enjoyment clouded by innovating and discontented poverty, by those poor who no longer behave quietly and endure, but begin to run wild and become restless. Lock up the vagabond, thrust the breeder of unrest into the darkest dungeon, he wants to arouse dissatisfaction and incite people against existing institutions in the state. 
stone him, stone him. But from these identical discontented ones comes a reasoning somewhat as follows. It need not make any difference to the good citizens who protects them and their principles, whether an absolute king, or a constitutional one, a republic, if only they are protected. And what is their principle, whose protector they always love? Not that of labour, not that of birth either, but that of mediocrity, of the golden mean, a little birth and a little labour, that is, an interest-bearing possession. Possession is here the fixed, the given, inherited, birth. Interest-drawing is the exertion about it, labour, labouring capital, therefore. Only no immoderation, no ultra, no radicalism. Right of birth, certainly, but only hereditary possessions. Labour, certainly, yet little or none at all of one's own, but labour of capital, and of the subject labourers. If an age is imbued with an error, some always derive advantage from the error, while the rest have to suffer from it. In the Middle Ages the error was general among Christians that the Church must have all power, or the supreme lordship on earth. The hierarchs believed in this truth not less than the laymen, and both were spellbound in the like error. But by it the hierarchs had the advantage of power, the laymen had to suffer subjection. However, as the saying goes, one learns wisdom by suffering and so the layman at last learned wisdom and no longer believed in the medieval truth. A like relation exists between the commonality and the labouring class. Commoner and labourer believe in the truth of money. They who do not possess it believe in it no less than those who possess it, the layman, therefore, as well as the priests. Money governs the world, is the keynote of the civic epoch. A destitute aristocrat and a destitute labourer as starvelings, amount to nothing so far as political consideration is concerned. Birth and labour do not do it, but money brings consideration. Footnote. Das Geld gibt Geld zum. End footnote. The possessors rule, but the state trains up from the destitute its servants, to whom, in proportion as they are to rule, govern, in its name, it gives money, a salary. I receive everything from the state. Have I anything without the state's assent? What I have without this it takes from me as soon as it discovers the lack of a legal title. Do I not, therefore, have everything through its grace, its assent? On this alone, on the legal title, the commonality rests. The commoner is what he is through the protection of the state, through the state's grace. He would necessarily be afraid of losing everything if the state's power were broken. But how is it with him who has nothing to lose? How with the proletarian? As he has nothing to lose, he does not need the protection of the state for his nothing. He may gain, on the contrary, if that protection of the state is withdrawn from the protégé. Therefore, the non-possessor will regard the state as a power protecting the possessor, which privileges the latter, but does nothing for him, the non-possessor to suck his blood. The state is a commoner's state, is the estate of the commonality. It protects man not according to his labour, but according to his tractableness, loyalty, to wit, according to whether the rights entrusted to him by the state are enjoyed and managed in accordance with the will, that is, laws, of the state. Under the regime of the commonality, the labourers always fall into the hands of the possessors, of those who have at their disposal some bit of the state domains, and everything possessible in state domain belongs to the state, and is only a fief of the individual. Especially money and land, of the capitalist, therefore. The labourer cannot realise on his labour to the extent of the value that it has for the consumer. Labour is badly paid. The capitalist has the greatest profit from it, well paid, and more than well paid, are only the labours of those who heighten the splendour and dominion of the state, the labours of high state servants. The state pays well that its good citizens, the possessors, may be able to pay badly without danger. It secures to itself by good payment its servants, out of whom it forms a protecting power, a police. Open brackets. To the police belong soldiers, officials of all kinds, for example, those of justice, education, etc., 
in short, the whole machinery of the state, close brackets, for the good citizens, and the good citizens gladly pay high tax rates to it in order to pay so much lower rates to their laborers. But the class of laborers, because unprotected in what they essentially are, open brackets, for they do not enjoy the protection of the state as laborers, but as its subjects they have a share in the enjoyment of the police, a so-called protection of the law, close brackets, remains a power hostile to this state, this state of possessors, this citizen kingship. Its principle, labor, is not recognized as to its value. It is exploited, a spoil of the possessors, the enemy. Footnote. Exploited is ausgebeutet. Spoil is kriegsbeute. End footnote. The laborers have the most enormous power in their hands, and, if they once became thoroughly conscious of it and used it, nothing would withstand them. They would only have to stop labor, regard the product of labor as theirs, and enjoy it. This is the sense of the labor disturbances which show themselves here and there. The state rests on the slavery of labor. If labor becomes free, the state is lost. End of section 13「Section 14 of The Ego and His Own. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anna Simon. The Ego and His Own by Max Stirner. Section 14. Social Liberalism. We are free-born men, and wherever we look we see ourselves made servants of egoists. Are we, therefore, to become egoists, too? Heaven forbid! We want rather to make egoists impossible. We want to make them all ragamuffins. All of us must have nothing that quote, all may have. End quote. So say the socialists. Who is this person that you call all? It is society. But is it corporeal then? We are its body. You? Why, you are not a body yourselves. You, sir, are corporeal to be sure. You, too, and you. But you altogether are only bodies, not a body. Accordingly, the united society may indeed have bodies at its service, but no one body of its own. Like the nation of the politicians, it will turn out to be nothing but a spirit, its body only semblance. The freedom of man is, in political liberalism, freedom from persons, from personal dominion, from the master, securing of each individual person against other persons, personal freedom. No one has any orders to give. The law alone gives orders. But even if the persons have become equal, yet their possessions have not, and yet the poor man needs the rich, the rich the poor, the former the rich man's money, the latter the poor man's labor. So no one needs another as a person, but needs him as a giver, and thus as one who has something to give, as holder or possessor. So what he has makes the man, and in having, or in possessions, people are unequal. Consequently, social liberalism concludes no one must have, as according to political liberalism, no one was to give orders, that is, as in that case the state alone obtained the command, so now society alone obtains the possessions. For the state, protecting each one's person and property against the other, separates them from one another. Each one is his special part and has his special part. He who is satisfied with what he is and has finds this state of things profitable. But he who would like to be and have more looks around for this more, and finds it in the power of other persons. Here he comes upon a contradiction. As a person, no one is inferior to another. And yet one person has what another has not, but would like to have. So, he concludes, the one person is more than the other. After all, for the former has what he needs, the latter has not. The former is a rich man, the latter a poor man. He now asks himself further, are we to let what we rightly buried come to life again? Are we to let this circuitously restored inequality of persons pass? 
No, on the contrary, we must bring quite to an end what was only half accomplished. Our freedom from another's person still lacks the freedom from what the other's person can command, from what he has in his personal power, in short, from personal property. Let us then do away with personal property. Let no one have anything any longer. Let everyone be a ragamuffin. Let property be impersonal. Let it belong to society. Before the supreme ruler, the sole commander, we had all become equal, equal persons, that is, nullities. Before the supreme proprietor, we all become equal, ragamuffins. For the present, one is still in another's estimation a ragamuffin, a have-nothing. But then this estimation ceases. We are all ragamuffins together, and as the aggregate of communistic society, we might call ourselves a ragamuffin crew. When the proletarian shall really have founded his proposed society, in which the interval between rich and poor is to be removed, then he will be a ragamuffin, for then he will feel that it amounts to something to be a ragamuffin, and might lift ragamuffin to be an honourable form of address, just as the revolution did with the word citizen. Ragamuffin is his ideal. We are all to become ragamuffins. This is the second robbery of the personal in the interest of humanity. Neither command nor property is left to the individual. The state took the former, society the latter. Because in society the most oppressive evils make themselves felt, therefore the oppressed especially, and consequently the members of the lower regions of society, think they found the fault in society, and make it their task to discover the right society. This is only the old phenomenon, that one looks for the fault first in everything but himself, and consequently in the state, in the self-seeking of the rich, etc., which yet have precisely our fault to thank for their existence. The reflections and conclusions of communism look very simple. As matters lie at this time, in the present situation with regard to the state, therefore, some, and they the majority, are at a disadvantage compared to others, the minority. In this state of things, the former are in a state of prosperity, the latter in state of need. Hence the present state of things, that is, the state itself, must be done away with. And what in its place? Instead of the isolated state of prosperity, a general state of prosperity, a prosperity of all, through the revolution, the bourgeoisie became omnipotent, and all inequality was abolished by every one's being raised or degraded to the dignity of a citizen. The common man raised, the aristocrat degraded. The third estate became sole estate, that is, namely, the estate of citizens of the state. Now communism responds, our dignity and our essence consist not in our being all, the equal children of our mother, the state all born with equal claim to her love and her protection, but in our all existing for each other. This is our equality, or herein we are equal in that we, I as well as you, and you, and all of you, are active, or labour each one for the rest, in that each of us is a labourer, then. The point for us is not what we are for the state, citizens, not our citizenship, therefore, but what we are for each other, that each of us exists only through the other, who, caring for my wants, at the same time sees his own satisfied by me. He labours, for example, for my clothing, tailor, I for his need of amusement, comedy writer, rope dancer, he for my food, farmer, I for his instruction, scientist. It is labour that constitutes our dignity and our equality. What advantage does citizenship bring us? burdens, and how high is our labour appraised, as low as possible. But labour is our sole value all the same, that we are labourers is the best thing about us, this is our significance in the world, and therefore it must be our consideration too, and must come to receive consideration. What can you meet us with? Surely nothing but labour too. Only for labour or services do we owe you a recompense, not for your bare existence, not for what you are for yourselves either, but only for what you are for us. By what have you claims on us? Perhaps by your high birth? No, only by what you do for us that is desirable or useful. Be it thus, then. 
We are willing to be worth to you only so much as we do for you, but you are to be held likewise by us. Services determine value. That is, those services that are worth something to us, and consequently labours for each other, labours for the common good. Let each one be in the other's eyes a labourer. He who accomplishes something useful is inferior to none, or all labourers, labourers, of course, in the sense of labourers for the common good, that is, communistic labourers, are equal. But, as the labourer is worth his wages, let the wages too be equal. Footnote. In German, an exact quotation of Luke 10, 7. End footnote. As long as faith sufficed for man's honour and dignity, no labour, however harassing, could be objected to, if it only did not hinder a man in his faith. Now, on the contrary, when every one is to cultivate himself into man, condemning a man to machine-like labour amounts to the same thing as slavery. If a factory worker must tire himself to death, twelve hours and more, he is cut off from becoming man. Every labour is to have the intent that the man be satisfied. Therefore he must become a master in it too, that is, be able to perform it as a totality. He who in a pin factory only puts on the heads, only draws the wire, works as it were mechanically, like a machine. He remains half trained, does not become a master. His labour cannot satisfy him, it can only fatigue him. His labour is nothing by itself, has no object in itself, is nothing complete in itself. He labours only into another's hands, and is used, exploited, by this other. For this labourer in another's service there is no enjoyment of a cultivated mind, at most crude amusements. Culture, you see, is barred against him. To be a good Christian one needs only to believe, and that can be done under the most oppressive circumstances. Hence the Christian-minded take care only of the oppressed labourer's piety, their patience, submission, etc. Only so long as the downtrodden classes were Christians could they bear all their misery, for Christianity does not let their murmurings and exasperation rise. Now the hushing of desires is no longer enough, but their sating is demanded. The bourgeoisie has proclaimed the gospel of the enjoyment of the world, of material enjoyment, and now wonders that this doctrine finds adherence among us poor. It has shown that not faith and poverty, but culture and possessions, make a man blessed. We proletarians understand that too. The commonality freed us from the orders and arbitrariness of individuals, but that arbitrariness was left which springs from the conjuncture of situations, and may be called the fortuity of circumstances, favouring fortune and those favoured by fortune still remain. When, for example, a branch of industry is ruined and thousands of labourers become breathless, people think reasonably enough to acknowledge that it is not the individual who must bear the blame, but that the evil lies in the situation. Let us change the situation, then, but let us change it thoroughly, and so that its fortuity becomes powerless and a law. Let us no longer be slaves of chance, let us create a new order that makes an end of fluctuations. Let this order then be sacred. Formerly, one had to suit the lords to come to anything. After the revolution, the word was grasp fortune. Luck hunting or hazard playing, civil life was absorbed in this. Then, alongside this, the demand that he who has obtained something shall not frivolously stake it again. Strange and yet supremely natural contradiction competition in which alone civil or political life unrolls itself is a game of luck through and through, from the speculations of the exchange down to the solicitation of offices, the hunt for customers, looking for work, aspiring to promotion and decorations, the second-hand dealer's petty haggling, etc. If one succeeds in supplanting and outbidding his rivals, then the lucky throw is made for it must be taken as a piece of luck to begin with that the victor sees himself equipped with an ability, even though it has been developed by the most careful industry, against which the others do not know how to rise, consequently that no abler ones are found. And now those who ply their daily lives in the midst of these changes of fortune without seeing any arm in it are seized with the most virtuous indignation when their own principle appears in naked form and breeds misfortune as hazard-playing. Hazard-playing, you see, is too clear, 
too barefaced a competition, and, like every decided nakedness, offends honourable modesty. The socialists want to put a stop to this activity of chance, and to form a society in which men are no longer dependent on fortune, but free. In the most natural way in the world, this endeavour first utters itself as hatred of the unfortunate against the fortunate, that is, of those for whom fortune has done little or nothing, against those for whom it has done everything. But properly the ill-feeling is not directed against the fortunate, but against fortune, this rotten spot of the commonality. As the communists first declare free activity to be man's essence, they, like all workday dispositions, need a Sunday. Like all material endeavours, they need a God, an uplifting and edification alongside their witless labour. That the communist sees in you the man, the brother, is only the Sunday side of communism. According to the workday side, he does not by any means take you as man simply, but as human labourer or labouring man. The first view has in it the liberal principle. In the second, illiberality is concealed. If you were a lazy-bones, he would not indeed fail to recognise the man in you, but would endeavour to cleanse him, as a lazy man, from laziness, and to convert you to the faith that labour is man's destiny and calling. Therefore he shows a double face. With the one he takes heed that the spiritual man be satisfied, with the other he looks about him for means for the material or corporeal man. He gives man a twofold post an office of material acquisition and one of spiritual. The commonality had thrown open spiritual and material goods and left it with each one to reach out for them if he liked. Communism really procures them for each one, presses them upon him and compels him to acquire them. It takes seriously the idea that, because only spiritual and material goods make us men, we must unquestionably acquire these goods in order to be man. The commonality made acquisition free. Communism compels to acquisition, and recognizes only the acquirer, him who practices a trade. It is not enough that the trade is free, but you must take it up. So all that is left for criticism to do is to prove that the acquisition of these goods does not yet by any means make us man. With a liberal commandment that every one is to make a man of himself, or every one to make himself man, there was posited the necessity that every one must gain time for his labour of humanization, that is, that it should become possible for every one to labour on himself. The commonality thought it had brought this about if it handed over everything human to competition, but gave the individual a right to every human thing. Each may strive after everything. Social liberalism finds that the matter is not settled with the may, because may means only it is forbidden to none, but not it is made possible to every one. Hence it affirms that the commonality is liberal only with the mouth and in words, supremely illiberal in act. It, on its part, wants to give all of us the means to be able to labour on ourselves. By the principle of labour, that of fortune or competition is certainly outdone but at the same time the labourer, in his consciousness that the essential thing in him is the labourer, holds himself aloof from egoism and subjects himself to the supremacy of a society of labourers, as the commoner clung with self-abandonment to the competition state. The beautiful dream of a social duty still continues to be dreamed. People think again that society gives what we need, and we are under obligations to it on that account, owe it everything. Footnote. Proudhon, Création de l'Ordre, cries out, page 414, In industry, as in science, the publication of an invention is the first and most sacred of duties. End footnote. They are still at the point of wanting to serve a supreme giver of all good. That society is no ego at all which could give, bestow, or grant, but an instrument or means from which we may derive benefit. That we have no social duties, but solely interests for the pursuance of which society must serve us, that we owe society no sacrifice, but, if we sacrifice anything, sacrifice it to ourselves, of this the socialists do not think, because they, as liberals, are imprisoned in the religious principle, and zealously aspire after a sacred society, for example, the state was hitherto. 
society from which we have everything is a new master a new spook a new supreme being which takes us into its service and allegiance the more precise appreciation of political as well as social liberalism must wait to find its place further on for the present we pass this over in order first to summon them before the tribunal of humane or critical liberalism End of section 14「Section 3, Part 1 As liberalism is completed in self-criticizing, critical liberalism, in which the critic remains a liberal and does not go beyond the principle of liberalism, man, this may distinctively be named after man and called the humane. The laborer is counted as the most material and egoistical man. He does nothing at all for humanity, does everything for himself, for his welfare. The commonalty, because it proclaimed the freedom of man only as to his birth, had to leave him in the claws of the unhuman man, the egoist, for the rest of life. Hence, under the regime of political liberalism, Egoism has an immense field for free utilization. The laborer will utilize society for his egoistic ends as the commoner does the state. You have only an egoistic end after all, your welfare, is the humane liberal's reproach to the socialist. Take up a purely human interest, then I will be your companion. But to this, there belongs a consciousness stronger, more comprehensive than a laborer consciousness. The laborer makes nothing, therefore he has nothing, but he makes nothing because his labor is always a labor that remains individual, calculated strictly for his own want, a labor day by day. In opposition to this one might, e.g., consider the fact that Gutenberg's labor did not remain individual, but begot innumerable children, and still lives today. It was calculated for the want of humanity, and was an eternal, imperishable labor. The humane consciousness despises the commoner consciousness, as well as the laborer consciousness. For the commoner is indignant only at vagabonds, at all who have no definite occupation, and their immorality. The laborer is disgusted by the idler, lazybones, and his immoral, because parasitic and unsocial principles. To this the humane liberal retorts, the unsettledness of many is only your product, Philistine, but that you, proletarian, demand the grind of all and want to make drudgery general is a part, still clinging to you, of your pack-mule life up to this time. Certainly you want to lighten drudgery itself by all having to drudge equally hard, yet only for this reason, that all may gain leisure to an equal extent. But what are they to do with their leisure? What does your society do that this leisure may be passed humanly? It must leave the gained leisure to egoistic preference again, and the very gain that your society furthers falls to the egoist as the gain of the commonality. The masterlessness of man could not be filled with a human element by the state, and therefore was left to arbitrary choice. 
It is assuredly necessary that man be masterless, but therefore the egoist is not to become master over man again either, but man over the egoist. Man must assuredly find leisure, but if the egoist makes use of it, it will be lost for man. Therefore, you ought to have given leisure a human significance, but you laborers undertake even your labor from an egoistic impulse because you want to eat, drink, live. How should you be less egoist in leisure? You labor only because having your time to yourselves, idling, goes well after work done, and what you are to while away your leisure time with is left to chance. But if every door is to be bolted against egoism, it would be necessary to strive after completely disinterested action, total disinterestedness. This alone is human, because only man is disinterested, the egoist always interested. If we let disinterestedness pass unchallenged for a while, then we ask, do you mean not to take an interest in anything, not to be enthusiastic for anything, not for liberty, humanity, etc.? Oh, yes, but that is not an egoistic interest, not interestedness, but a human, i.e. a theoretical interest, to wit, an interest not for an individual or individuals, all, but for the idea, for man. And you do not notice that you too are enthusiastic only for your idea, your idea of liberty. And further, do you not notice that your disinterestedness is again, like religious disinterestedness, a heavenly interestedness? Certainly benefit to the individual leaves you cold, and abstractly you could cry, Fiat libertas periat mundus. You do not take thought for the coming day either, and take no serious care for the individual's wants anyhow, not for your own comfort, nor for that of the rest. But you make nothing of all this, because you are a dreamer. Do you suppose the humane liberal will be so liberal as to aver that everything possible to man is human? On the contrary, he does not indeed share the Philistine's moral prejudice against the strumpet, but that this woman turns her body into a money-getting machine makes her despicable to him as human being. His judgment is, the strumpet is not a human being, or so far as a woman is a strumpet, so far as she unhuman, dehumanized. Further, the Jew, the Christian, the privileged person, the theologian, etc., is not a human being. So far as you are a Jew, etc., you are not a human being. Again, the imperious postulate, cast from you everything peculiar, criticize it away. Be not a Jew, not a Christian, but be a human being, nothing but a human being. Assert your humanity against every restrictive specification. Make yourself by means of it a human being and free from those limits. Make yourself a free man, i.e. recognize humanity as your all-determining essence. I say, you are indeed more than a Jew, more than a Christian, etc., but you are also more than a human being. Those are all ideas, but you are corporeal. Do you suppose, then, that you can ever become a human being as such? Do you suppose our posterity will find no prejudices and limits to clear away, for which our powers were not sufficient? Or do you perhaps think that in your fortieth or fiftieth year you have come so far that the following days have nothing more to dissipate in you 
and that you are a human being. The men of the future will yet fight their way to many a liberty that we do not even miss. What do you need that later liberty for? If you meant to esteem yourself as nothing before you had become a human being, you would have to wait till the last judgment, till the day when man or humanity shall have attained perfection. But, as you will surely die before that, what becomes of your prize of victory? Rather, therefore, invert the case and say to yourself, I am a human being. I do not need to begin by producing the human being in myself, for he belongs to me already, like all my qualities. But, asked the critic, how can one be a Jew and a man at once? In the first place, I answer, one cannot be either a Jew or a man at all, if one and Jew or man are meant to the same thing. One always reaches beyond those specifications, and let Isaacs be ever so Jewish, a Jew, nothing but a Jew he cannot be, just because he is this Jew. In the second place, as a Jew, one assuredly cannot be a man, if being a man means being nothing special. But, in the third place, and this is the point, I can, as a Jew, be entirely what I can be. From Samuel or Moses and others, you hardly expect that they should have raised themselves above Judaism, although you must say that they were not yet men. They simply were what they could be. Is it otherwise with the Jews of today? Because you have discovered the idea of humanity, does it follow from this that every Jew can become a convert to it? If he can, he does not fail to, and if he fails to, he cannot. What does your demand concern him? What the call to be a man which you address to him? As a universal principle, in the human society which the humane liberal promises, nothing special which one or another has is to find recognition. Nothing which bears the character of private is to have value. In this way, the circle of liberalism, which has its good principle in man and human liberty, its bad in the egoist and everything private, its god in the former, its devil in the latter, rounds itself off completely. And if the special or private person lost his value in the state, no personal prerogative, if in the laborer's or ragamuffin society, special private property is no longer recognized, so in human society, everything special or private will be left out of account, and when pure criticism shall have accomplished its arduous task, then it will be known just what we must look upon as private, and what, penetrated with a sense of our nothingness, we must let stand. Because state and society do not suffice for humane liberalism, it negates both, and at the same time retains them. So at one time the cry is that the task of the day is not a political, but a social one. And then again, the free state is promised for the future. In truth, human society is both the most general state and the most general society. Only against the limited state is it asserted that it makes too much stir about spiritual private interests, e.g., people's religious belief, and against limited society that it makes too much of material private interests. Both are to leave private interests to private people, and, as human society, concern themselves solely about general human interests. The politicians thinking to abolish personal will, self-will, or arbitrariness, did not observe that through property our self-will gained a secure place of refuge. The socialists, 
taking away property too, do not notice that this secures itself a continued existence in self-ownership. Is it only money and goods then that are a property, or is every opinion something of mine, something of my own? So every opinion must be abolished or made impersonal. The person is entitled to no opinion, but as self-will was transferred to the state, property to society, so opinion too must be transferred to something general, man, and thereby become a general human opinion. If opinion persists, then I have my God. Why, God exists only as my God. He is an opinion, or my faith, and consequently my faith, my religion, my thoughts, my ideals. Therefore, a general human faith must come into existence, the fanaticism of liberty. For this would be a faith that agreed with the essence of man. And because only man is reasonable, you and I might be very unreasonable. A reasonable faith. As self-will and property become powerless, so must self-ownership or egoism in general. In this supreme development of free man egoism, self-ownership is combated on principle and such subordinate ends as the social welfare of the socialists, etc., vanish before the lofty idea of humanity. Everything that is not a general human entity is something separate, satisfies only some or one, or, if it satisfies all, it does this to them only as individuals, not as men, and is therefore called egoistic. To the socialists, welfare is still the supreme aim, as free rivalry was the approved thing to the political liberals. Now welfare is free too, and we are free to achieve welfare, just as he who wanted to enter into rivalry, competition, was free to do so. But to take part in the rivalry, you need only to be commoners. To take part in the welfare, only to be laborers. Neither reaches the point of being synonymous with man. It is truly well with man only when he is also intellectually free. For man is mind. Therefore, all the powers that are alien to him, the mind, all superhuman, heavenly, unhuman powers must be overthrown and the name man must be above every name. So in this end of the modern age, age of the moderns, there returns again as the main point, what had been the main point at its beginning, intellectual liberty. To the communist in particular, the humane liberal says, if society prescribes to you your activity, then this is indeed free from the influence of the individual, i.e. the egoist. But it still does not on that account need to be a purely human activity, nor you to be a complete organ of humanity. What kind of activity society demands of you remains accidental, you know. It might give you a place in building a temple or something of that sort, or even if not that, you might yet on your own impulse be active for something foolish, therefore unhuman. Yes, more yet, you really labor only to nourish yourself in general to live for dear life's sake, not for the glorification of humanity. Consequently, free activity is not attained till you make yourself free from all stupidities from everything non-human, i.e. egoistic, pertaining only to the individual, not to the man in the individual. Dissipate all untrue thoughts that obscure man or the idea of humanity. In short, when you are not merely unhampered in your activity, but the substance too of your activity is only what is human, 
and you live and work only for humanity. But this is not the case so long as the aim of your effort is only your welfare and that of all. What you do for the society of ragamuffins is not yet anything done for human society. Laboring does not alone make you a man, because it is something formal and its object accidental. The question is who you that labor are. As far as laboring goes, you might do it from an egoistic, material impulse, merely to procure nourishment and the like. It must be a labor furthering humanity, calculated for the good of humanity, serving historical, i.e. human, evolution. In short, a human labor. This implies two things. One, that it be useful to humanity. Next, that it be the work of a man. The first alone may be the case with every labor, as even the labors of nature, e.g. of animals, are utilized by humanity for the furthering of science, etc. The second requires that he who labors should know the human object of his labor, and as he can have this consciousness only when he knows himself as man, the crucial condition is self-consciousness. Unquestionably much is already attained when you cease to be a fragment laborer, yet therewith you only get a view of the whole of your labor and acquire a consciousness about it, which is still far removed from a self-consciousness, a consciousness about your true self or essence, man. The laborer has still remaining the desire for a higher consciousness, which because the activity of labor is unable to quiet it, he satisfies in a leisure hour. Hence, leisure stands by the side of his labor, and he sees himself compelled to proclaim labor and idling human in one breath. Yes, to attribute the true elevation to the idler, the leisure enjoyer. He labors only to get rid of labor. He wants to make labor free, only that he may be free from labor. In fine, his work has no satisfying substance, because it is only imposed by society, only a stint, a task, a calling, and conversely, his society does not satisfy, because it only gives work. His labor ought to satisfy him as a man. Instead of that, it satisfies society. Society ought to treat him as a man, and it treats him as a ragtag laborer or a laboring ragamuffin. Labor and society are of use to him not as he needs them as a man, but only as he needs them as an egoist. Such is the attitude of criticism toward labor. It points to mind wages the war, of mind with the masses and pronounces communistic labor unintellectual mass labor. Averse to labor as they are, the masses love to make labor easy for themselves. In literature, which is today furnished in mass, this aversion to labor begets the universally known superficiality, which puts from it the toil of research. Therefore, humane liberalism says, you want labor? All right. We want it likewise, but we want it in the fullest measure. We want it not that we may gain spare time, but that we may find all satisfaction in it in self. We want labor because it is our self-development. But then the labor too must be adapted to that end. Man is honored only by human self-conscious labor, only by the labor that has for its end no egoistic purpose, but man and is man's self-revelation, so that the saying should be, laboro ergo sum, I labor, therefore I am a man. The humane liberal wants that labor of the mind which works up all material. He wants the mind that leaves no thing quiet or in its existing condition, that acquiesces in nothing, analyzes everything, 
criticizes anew every result that has been gained. This restless mind is the true laborer. It obliterates prejudices, shatters limits and narrownesses, and raises man above everything that would like to dominate over him, while the communist labors only for himself, and not even freely, but from necessity. In short, represents a man condemned to hard labor. The laborer of such a type is not egoistic, because he does not labor for individuals, neither for himself nor for other individuals, not for private men, therefore, but for humanity and its progress. He does not ease individual pains, does not care for individual wants, but removes limits within each humanity is pressed, dispels prejudices which dominate an entire time, vanquishes hindrances that obstruct the path of all, clears away errors in which men entangle themselves, discovers truths which are found through him for all and for all time. In short, he lives and labors for humanity. End of Section 3, Part 1 Recorded by Eris Allen. Section 16 of The Ego and His Own. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Ego and His Own by Max Stirner. Humane Liberalism, Part 2. Now, in the first place, the discoverer of a great truth doubtless knows that it can be useful to the rest of men, and as a jealous withholding furnishes him no enjoyment, he communicates it, but even though he has the consciousness that his communication is highly valuable to the rest, yet he has in no wise sought and found his truth for the sake of the rest but for his own sake because he himself desired it because darkness and fancies left him no rest till he had procured for himself light and enlightenment to the best of his powers he labours therefore for his own sake and for the satisfaction of his want that along with this he was also useful to others yes to posterity does not take from his labour the egoistic character in the next place if he did labour only on his own account like the rest why should his act be human those of the rest of the unhuman i e egoistic perhaps because this book painting sympathy etc is the labour of his whole being because he has done his best in it has spread himself out wholly, and is wholly to be known from it, while the work of a handicraftsman mirrors only the handicraftsman, i.e. the skill in handicraft, not the man. In his poems we have the whole skiller, in so many hundred stoves. On the other hand, we have before us only the stove-maker, not the man. But this does mean more than in the one work you see me as completely as possible in the other only my skill it is not me again that the act expresses and it is not more egoistic to offer oneself to the world in a work to work out and shape oneself than to remain concealed behind one's labour you say to be sure that you are revealing man but the man that you reveal is you you reveal only yourself yet with this distinction from the handicraftsman that he does not understand how to compress himself into one labour but in order to be known as himself must be searched out in his other relations of life and that your want through whose satisfaction that work came into being was a theatrical want but you will reply that you reveal quite another man a worthier higher greater a man that is more man than that other i will assume that you accomplish all that is possible to man that you bring to pass what no other succeeds in 
wherein then does your greatness consist precisely in this that you are more than other men the masses more than men ordinarily are more than ordinary men precisely in your elevation above men you are distinguished beyond other men not by being man but because you are a unique man doubtless you show what a man can do but because you a man do it this by no means show that others also men are able to do as much you have executed it only as a unique man and are unique therein it is not man that makes up your greatness but you create it because you are more than man and mightier than other men it is believed that one cannot be more than man rather one cannot be less it is believed further that whatever one attains is good for man in so far as i remain at all times a man or like Skiller, a swabium like kant a prusian like gustav adolphus a near-sighted person i certainly become my superior qualities a notable man swabian prusian or near-sighted person but the case is not much better with that than with frederick the great king which became famous for frederick's sake to give god the glory corresponds to the modern give man the glory but i mean to keep it for myself criticism issuing the summons to man to be human enunciates the necessary condition of sociability for only as man among men is one companionable herewith it makes known its social object the establishment of humane society among social theories criticism is indisputably the most complete because it removes and deprives the value everything that separates man from man all prerogatives down to the prerogative of faith in it the love principle of christianity the true social principle comes to the purest fulfilment and the last possible experiment is tried to take away any exclusiveness and repulsion from men a fight against egoism in its simplest and therefore hardest form in the form of singleness exclusiveness itself how can you live a truly social life so long as even one exclusive still exists between you i ask conversely how can you be truly single so long as even one connection still exists between you if you are connected you cannot leave each other if a tie clasps you you are something only with another and twelve of you make a dozen thousands of you a people millions of you humanity only when you are human can you keep company with each other as men just as you can understand each other as patriots only when you are patriotic all right then i answer only when you are single can you have intercourse with each other as what you are it is precisely the keenest critic who is hit hardest by the curse of his principle putting from him one exclusive thing after another shaking off churchliness patriotism etc he undoes one tie after another and separates himself from the churchly man from the patriot until at last when all ties are undone he stands alone he of all men must exclude all that have anything exclusive or private and when you get to the bottom what can be more exclusive than the exclusive single person himself or does he perhaps think that the situation would be better if all became man and gave up exclusiveness why for the very reason that all means every individual the most glaring contradiction is still maintained for the individual is exclusiveness itself if the humane liberal no longer concedes to the individual anything private or exclusive any private thought any private folly he criticizes everything away from him before his face since his hatred of the private is an absolute and fanatical hatred 
if he knows no tolerance toward what is private, because everything private is unhuman, yet he cannot criticise away the private person himself, since the hardness of the individual person resists his criticism, and he must be satisfied with declaring this person a private person, and really leaving everything private to him again. What will the society that no longer cares about anything private do? Make the private impossible? No, but subordinate it to the interests of society and, e.g., leave it to private will to constitute holidays as many as it chooses, if only it does not come in collision with the general interest. Everything private is left free, i.e. it has no interest for society. By their raising barriers against science, the church and the religiousness have declared that they are what they always were, only that this was hidden under another semblance when they were proclaimed to be the bias and necessary foundation of the state, a matter of purely private concern. Even when they were connected with the state and made a Christian, they were only the proof that the state had not yet developed his general political idea that it was only in situating private rights they were only the highest expression for the fact that the state was a private affair and had to do only with private affairs when the state shall at last have the courage and strength to fulfil its general destiny and to be free for ever when therefore it is also able to give separate interests and private concerns their true position then religion and the church will be free as they never have been hitherto. As a matter of the most purely private concern and a satisfaction of purely personal want, they will be left to themselves and every individual, every congregation and ecclesiastical communion will be able to take care for the blessedness of their souls as they choose and as they think necessary. Everyone will care for his soul's blessedness so far as it is to him a personal want and will accept and pay as spiritual caretaker the one who seems to him to offer the best guarantee for the satisfaction of his want science is at last left entirely out of the game what is to happen though is social life to have an end and all affiliability all fraternization everything that is created by the love or society principle to disappear as if one will not always seek the other because he needs him as if one must accommodate himself to the other when he needs him but the difference is that then the individual really unites with the individual while formerly they were bound together by a tie son and father are bound together before majority after it they can come together independently before it they belong together as members of the family after it they unite as egoists sonship and fatherhood remain but son and father no longer pin themselves down to these the last privilege in truth is man with it all are privileged or invested for as bruno bearer himself says privilege remains even when it is extended to all thus liberalism runs its course in the following transformations first the individual is not man therefore his individual personality is of no account no personal will no arbitrariness no orders or mandates second the individual has nothing human therefore no mine and thine or property is valid third as the individual neither is man nor has anything human, he shall not exist at all. He shall, as an egoist, with his egotistic belongings, be annihilated by criticism to make room for man, man just discovered. But although the individual is not man, man is yet present in the individual, and like every spook and everything divine, has its existence in him. Hence, political liberalism awards to the individual everything that pertains to him as a man by birth, as born by man, 
among which there are counted liberty of conscience the progression of goods etc in short the rights of man socialism grants to the individual what pertains to him as an active man as a labouring man finally humane liberalism gives the individual what he has as a man i e everything that belongs to humanity accordingly the single one has nothing at all humanity everything and the necessity of the regeneration preached in christianity is demanded unambiguously and in the completest measure become a new creature become man one might even think himself reminded of the close of the lord's prayer to man belongs the lordship the power or dynamis therefore no individual may be lord but man is the lord of individuals man's is the kingdom i e the world consequently the individual is not to be proprietor but man all commanded the world as property to man is due renown glorification or glory doxa from all for man or humanity is the individual's end for which he labours thinks lives and for whose glorification he must become man hitherto men have always striven to find out a fellowship in which their inequalities in other respects should become non-essential they strove for equalization consequently for equality and wanted to come all under one hat which means nothing less than that they were seeking for one lord on one tie one faith tis in one god we all believe there cannot be for men anything more fellowly or more equal than man himself and in this fellowship the love craving has found its contentment it did not rest till it had brought on this last equalization levelled all inequality laid man on the breast of man but under this very fellowship decay and ruin becomes most glaring in a more limited fellowship the frenchman still stood against the german the christian against the mohammedan etc now on the contrary man stands against men or as men are not man man stands against the unman the sentence god has become man is now followed by the other man has become i this is the human eye but we invert it and say i was not able to find myself so long as i sought myself as man but now that it appears that man is aspiring to become i and to gain a corpority in me i note that after all everything depends on me and man is lost without me but i do not care to give myself up to be the shrine of this most holy thing and i shall not ask henceforward whether i am man or unman in what i set about let this spirit keep off my neck humane liberalization goes to work radically if you want to be or have anything especial given in one point if you want to retain for yourself even one prerogative above others to claim even one right that is not a general right of man you are an egoist very good i do not want to have or be anything special above others i do not want to claim any prerogative against them but i do not measure myself by others either and do not want to have any right whatever i want to be all and have all that i can be and have whether others are and have anything similar what do i care the equal the same they can neither be nor have i cause no detriment to them as i cause no detriment to the rock by being ahead of it in having motion if they could have it they would have it to cause other men no detriment is the point of the demand to possess no prerogative to renounce all being ahead the strictest theory of renunciation one is not to count himself as anything especial e g a jew or a christian 
well, I do not count myself as anything special, but as unique. Doubtless I have similarity with others, yet that holds good only for comparison or reflection. In fact, I am incomparable, unique. My flesh is not their flesh, my mind is not their mind. If you bring them under the generalities, flesh, mind, those are your thoughts, which have nothing to do with my flesh, my mind, and can least of all issue a call to mine. I do not want to recognise or respect in you anything, neither the proprietor nor the ragamuffin, nor even the man, but to use you. In salt I find that it makes food palatable to me, therefore I dissolve it. In the fish I recognise an element, therefore I eat it. In you I discover the gift of making my life agreeable, therefore I choose you as a companion. Or in salt I study crystallisation, in the fish animality, in you men, etc. But to me you are only what you are for me to wit my object, and because my object, therefore my property. In humane liberalism, ragamuffinhood is completed. We must first come down to the most ragamuffin-like, most poverty-stricken condition, if we want to arrive at ownness, for we must strip off everything alien, but nothing seems more ragamuffin-like than naked man. It is more than ragamuffinhood, However, when I throw away man too, because I feel that he too is alien to me, and that I can make no pretensions on that basis, this is no longer mere ragamuffinhood, because even the last rag has fallen off. Here stands real nakedness, the nutrition of everything alien. The ragamuffin has stripped off ragamuffinhood itself and therewith has ceased to be what he was, a ragamuffin. I am no longer a ragamuffin, but have been one. Up to this time the discord could not come to an outbreak, because probably there is current only a contention of modern liberals with antiquated liberals, a contention of those who understand freedom in a small measure, and those who want the full measure of freedom, of the moderate and measureless, therefore everything turns on the question, how free must man be, that man must be free, in this or believe, therefore all are liberal too, but the unman who is somewhere in every individual, how is he blocked, how can it be arranged not to leave the unman free, at the same time with a man, Liberalism, as a whole, has a deadly enemy, an invincible opposite, as God has the devil, by the side of man stands always the unman, the individual, the egotist, state, society, humanity, do not master this devil. Humane liberalism has undertaken the task of showing the other liberals that they still do not want freedom. If the other liberals had before their eyes only isolated egoism and were for the most part blind radical liberation has again its egoism in mass throws among the masses all who do not make the cause of freedom their own as it does so that now man and unman rigorously separated stand over each other as enemies to wit the masses and criticism namely free human criticism as it is called in opposition to crude, that is, religious criticism. Criticism expresses the hope that it will be victorious over all the masses and give them a general certificate of insolvency. So it means finally to make itself out in the right and to represent all connection of the faint-hearted and timorous, as an egoistic stubbornness, as pettiness, paltriness. All wrangling losses, significance, and pretty dissensions are given up, because in criticism a common enemy enters the field. You are egoists altogether, no one better than another. Now the egoists stand together against criticism. Really, the egoists? No, they fight against criticism precisely because 
it accuses them of egoism. They do not plead guilty of egoism. Accordingly, criticism and the masses stand on the same basis. Both fight against egoism. Both repudiated for themselves and charged it to each other. Criticism and the masses pursue the same goal, freedom from egoism, and wrangle only other which of them approaches nearest to the goal or even attains it. The Jews, the Christians, the absolutists, the men of darkness and men of light, politicians, communicists, all in sort, hold the reproach of egoism far from them, and as criticism brings against them this reproach in plain terms and in the most extended sense, all justify themselves against the accusation of egoism, and combat egoism, the same enemy with whom criticism wages war. Both criticism and masses are enemies of egoists, and both seek to liberate themselves from egoism as well by clearing or whitewashing themselves as by ascribing to the opposite party the critic is the true spokesman of the masses who gives them the simple concept and the phrase of egoism while the spokesman to whom the triumph is denied were only bunglers he is their prince and general in the war against egoism for freedom what he fights against they fight against but at the same time he is their enemy too, not only the enemy before them, but the friendly enemy who wields the knot behind the timorous to force courage into them. Hereby the opposition of criticism and the masses is reduced to the following contradiction. You are egoists. No, we are not. I will prove it to you. You shall have our justification let us then take both for what they give themselves out for non-egoists and what they take each other for egoists they are egoists and are not probably criticism says you must liberate your ego from all limitness so entirely that it becomes a human ego i say liberate yourself as far as you can and you have done your part for it is not given to every one to break through all limits, or more expressively, not to every one is that a limit which is a limit for the rest. Consequently, do not tire yourself with toiling at the limits of others. Enough if you tear down yours. Who has ever succeeded in tearing down even one limit for all men? Are not countless persons today, as at all times, running about with all the limitations of humanity? he who overturns one of his limits may have shown others the way and the means the overturning of their limits remains their affair nobody does anything else either to demand of people that they become holy men is to call on them to cast down all humane limits that is impossible because man has no limits i have some indeed but then it is only mine that concern me any and only they can be overcome by me. A human ego I cannot become, just because I am. I am not merely man. Yet let us still see whether criticism has not taught us something that we can lay to heart. I am not free if I am not without interests, not man if I am not disinterested. Well, even if it makes little difference to me to be free or man, I do not want to leave unused any occasion to realise myself or make myself count. Criticism offers me this occasion by the teaching that, if anything plants itself firmly in me and becomes indissoluble, I become its prisoner and servant, i.e. a possessed man. An interest, be it for what it may, has kidnapped a slave in me if I cannot get away from it, and is no longer my property but I am it. Let us therefore accept criticism's lesson to let no part of our property become stable and to feel comfortable only in dissolving it. So if criticism says you are man only when you are restlessly criticising and dissolving, then we say man I am without that, and I am I likewise, 
therefore i want only to be careful to secure my property to myself and in order to secure it i continually take it back into myself annihilate it in every movement toward independence and swallow it before it can fix itself and become a fixed idea or a mania but i do that not for the sake of my humane calling but because i call myself to do it i do not strut about dissolving everything that is possible for a man to dissolve and e g while not yet ten years old i do not criticise the nonsense of the commandments but i am man all the same and act humanely in just this that i still leave them uncriticised in short i have no calling and follow none not even that to be a man End of section sixteen recording by elaine webb bristol england Section 17 of The Ego and His Own, Humane Liberalism, Part 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Morgan Gull French. The Ego and His Own by Max Stirner. Do I now reject what liberalism has won in its various exertions? Far be the day that anything won should be lost, only after man has become free through liberalism. I turn my gaze upon myself and confess to myself openly. What man seems to have gained, I alone have gained. Man is free when man is to man the supreme being. So it belongs to the completion of liberalism that every other supreme being be annulled. Theology overturned by anthropology, God and his grace laughed down, atheism universal. The egoism of property has given up the last that it had to give, when even the my God has become senseless, for God exists only when he has at heart the individual's welfare, as the latter seeks his welfare in him. Political liberalism abolished the inequality of masters and servants. It made people masterless, anarchic. The master was now removed from the individual, the egoist, to become a ghost, the law or the state, Social liberalism abolishes the inequality of possession or the poor and rich and makes people possessionless or propertyless. Property is withdrawn from the individual and surrendered to ghostly society. Humane liberalism makes people godless, atheistic. Therefore the individual's god, my god, must be put an end to. Now masterlessness is indeed at the same time freedom from service, possessionlessness at the same time freedom from care and godlessness at the same time freedom from prejudice but with the master the servant falls away with possession the care about it with the firmly rooted god prejudice but since the master rises again as state the servant appears again as subject since possession becomes the property of society care is to be gotten anew as labour and since god as man becomes a prejudice there arises a new faith faith in humanity or liberty for the individual's god the god of all vis-a-vis -vis, man is now exalted for it is the highest thing in all of us to be man but as nobody can become entirely what the idea man imports man remains to the individual a lofty other world an unattained supreme being a god but at the same time this is the true god because he is fully adequate to us to wit our own self, we ourselves, but separated from us and lifted above us. Postscript. The foregoing review of Free Human Criticism was written by Bits immediately after the appearance of the books in question, as was also that which elsewhere refers to writings of this tendency, and I did little more than bring together the fragments but criticism is restlessly pressing forward, and thereby makes it necessary for me to come back to it once more. Now that my book is finished, and insert this concluding note, I have before me the latest eighth number of the Allgemeine Literatur Zeitung of Bruno Bauer. There again, 
the general interests of society stand at the top. But criticism has reflected and given this society a specification by which it is discriminated from a form which previously had still been confused with it, the state. In former passages still celebrated as free state, quite is given up, given up because it can in no wise fulfil the task of human society. Criticism only saw itself compelled to identify for a moment human and political affairs in 1842, but now it has found that the state, even as free state, is not human society, or as it could likewise say, that the people is not man. We saw how it got through with theology and showed clearly that God sinks into dust before man. We see it now come to a clearance with politics in the same way and show that before man, peoples and nationalities fall. So we see how it has its explanation with church and state, declaring them both unhuman, and we shall see, for it betrays this to us already, how it can also give proof that before man the masses, which it even calls a spiritual being, appear worthless, and how should the lesser spiritual beings be able to maintain themselves before the supreme spirit? Man casts down the false idols. So what the critic has in view for the present in the scrutiny of the masses which he will place before man in order to combat them from the standpoint of man. What is now the object of criticism? The masses, a spiritual being, these the critic will learn to know and will find that they are in contradiction with man. He will demonstrate that they are unhuman and will succeed just as well in this demonstration as in the former ones, that the divine and the national, or the concerns of church and of state, were the unhuman. The masses are defined as the most significant product of the revolution, as the deceived multitude which the illusions of political illumination, and in general the entire illumination movement of the 18th century, have given over to boundless disgruntlement. The revolution satisfied some by its result and left others unsatisfied. The satisfied part is the commonality, bourgeoisie, etc. The unsatisfied is the masses. Does not the critic, so placed, himself belong to the masses? But the unsatisfied are still in great mistiness, and their discontent utters itself only in, in a boundless disgruntlement. This the likewise unsatisfied critic now wants to master. He cannot want and attain more than to bring that spiritual being, the masses, out of its disgruntlement and to uplift those who were only disgruntled, i.e. to give them the right attitude toward those results of the revolution which are to be overcome. He can become the head of the masses, their decided spokesman. Therefore he wants also to abolish the deep chasm which parts him from the multitude, from those who want to uplift the lower classes of the people. He is distinguished by wanting to deliver from disgruntlement, not merely these, but himself too. But assuredly his consciousness does not deceive him either. When he takes the masses to be the natural opponents of theory, and foresees that the more this theory shall develop itself, so much the more will it make the masses compact, for the critic cannot enlighten or satisfy the masses with his presupposition, man. If over against the commonality they are only the lower classes of the people, politically insignificant masses, over against man they must still more be mere masses, humanly insignificant, yes, unhuman masses, or a multitude of unmen. The critic clears away everything human, and starting from the presupposition that the human is the true, he works against himself, denying it wherever it had been hitherto found. He proves only that the human is to be found nowhere except in his head, but the unhuman everywhere. The unhuman is the real, the extant on all hands, and by the proof that it is not human, the critic only enunciates plainly the tautological sentence that is the unhuman. But what if the unhuman, turning its back on itself with resolute heart, 
should at the same time turn away from the disturbing critic and leave him standing, untouched and unstung by his remonstrance. You call me the unhuman, it might say to him, and so I really am, for you. But I am so only because you bring me into opposition to the human, and I could despise myself only so long as I let myself be hypnotised into this opposition. I was contemptible because I sought my better self outside me. I was the unhuman because I dreamed of the human. I resembled the pious who hunger for their true self and always remain poor sinners. I thought of myself only in comparison to another. Enough. I was not all in all, was not unique. Note, original German for unique, Einzig, end of note. But now I cease to appear to myself as the unhuman, cease to measure myself and let myself be measured by man, cease to recognise anything above me. Consequently, adieu, humane critic, I only have been the unhuman, am it now no longer, but am the unique, yes, to your loathing, the egoistic, yet not the egoistic as it lets itself be measured by the human, humane and unselfish by the egoistic as the unique. We have to pay attention to still another sentence of the same number. Criticism sets up no dogmas and wants to learn to know nothing but things. The critic is afraid of becoming dogmatic or setting up dogmas, of course, why thereby he would become the opposite of the critic, the dogmatist. He would now become bad as he is good as critic or would become from an unselfish man an egoist, etc. Of all things, no dogma. This is his dogma. For the critic remains on one and the same ground with the dogmatist, that of thoughts. Like the latter, he always starts from a thought, but varies in this, that he never ceases to keep the principal thought in the process of thinking, and so does not let it become stable. He only asserts the thought process against the thought faith the progress of thinking against stationariness in it. From criticism no thought is safe, since criticism is thought or the thinking mind itself. Therefore I repeat that the religious world, and this is the world of thought, reaches its completion in criticism, where thinking extends its encroachments over every thought, no one of which may egoistically establish itself. Where would the purity of criticism, the purity of thinking, be left if even one thought escaped the process of thinking? This explains the fact that the critic has even begun already to jibe gently here and there at the thought of man, of humanity and humaneness, because he suspects that here a thought is approaching dogmatic fixity. But yet he cannot decompose this thought till he has found a higher in which it dissolves, for he moves only in thought. This higher thought might be enunciated as that of the movement or process of thinking itself, i.e. as the thought of thinking or of criticism, for example. Freedom of thinking has in fact become complete hereby. Freedom of mind celebrates its triumph. For the individual, egoistic thoughts have lost their dogmatic truculence. There is nothing left but the dogma of free thinking or of criticism. Against everything that belongs to the world of thought, criticism is in the right, i.e. in might. It is the victor. Criticism and criticism alone is up to date. From the standpoint of thought there is no power capable of being an overmatch for criticisms. And it is a pleasure to see how easily and sportively this dragon swallows all other serpents of thought. Each serpent twists, to be sure, but criticism crushes it in all its turns. I am no opponent of criticism, I am no dogmatist, and do not feel myself touched by the critic's tooth with which he tears the dogmatist to pieces. If I were a dogmatist, I should place at the head a dogma, i.e. a thought, an idea, a principle, and should complete this as a systematist, spinning it out to a system, a structure of thought. Conversely, if I were a critic, vis-a-vis, -vis, an opponent 
of the dogmatist. I should carry on the fight of free thinking against the enthralling thought. I should defend thinking against what was thought. But I am neither the champion of a thought nor the champion of thinking, for I, from whom I start, am not a thought, nor do I consist in thinking. Against me, the unnameable, the realm of thoughts, thinking and mind is shattered. Criticism is the possessed man's fight against possession as such, against all possession, a fight which is founded in the consciousness that everywhere possession, or, as the critic calls it, a religious and theological attitude, is extant. He knows that people stand in a religious or believing attitude not only toward God, but toward other ideas as well, like right, the state, law, i.e. he recognises possession in all places, so he wants to break up thoughts by thinking. But I say, only thoughtlessness really saves me from thoughts. It is not thinking, but my thoughtlessness, or I the unthinkable, incomprehensible, that frees me from possession. A jerk does me the service of the most anxious thinking. A stretching of the limbs shakes off the torment of thought. A leap upward hurls from my breast the nightmare of the religious world. A jubilant hoopla throws off year-long burdens, but the monstrous significance of unthinking jubilation could not be recognised in the long night of thinking and believing. What clumsiness and frivolity to want to solve the most difficult problems, acquit yourself of the most comprehensive tasks by a breaking off. But have you tasks if you do not set them to yourself? So long as you set them, you will not give them up. And I certainly do not care if you think, and thinking create a thousand thoughts. But you who have set the tasks, are you not to be able to be upset them again? Must you be bound to these tasks, and must they become absolute tasks? To cite only one thing, the government has been disparaged on account of its resorting to forcible means against thoughts interfering against the press by means of the police power of the censorship and making a personal fight out of a literary one, as if it were solely a matter of thought and as if one's attitude toward thoughts must be unselfish, self-denying and self-sacrificing. Do not these thoughts attack the governing parties themselves and so call out egoism? And do the thinkers not set before the attacked ones the religious demand to reverence the power of thought, of ideas? They are to succumb voluntarily and resignedly because the divine power of thought, Minerva, fights on their enemy's side. Why, that would be an act of possession, a religious sacrifice, to be sure. The governing parties are themselves held fast in a religious bias and follow the leading power of an idea or a faith, but they are at the same time unconfessed egoists, and right there, against the enemy, their pent-up egoism breaks loose. Possessed in their faith, they are at the same time unpossessed by their opponent's faith, i.e. they are egoists towards this. If one wants to make them a reproach, it could only be the converse, to wit, that they are possessed by their ideas. Against thoughts, no egoistic power is to appear, no police power, etc. So the believers in thinking believe, but thinking and its thoughts are not sacred to me, and I defend my skin against them as against other things. That may be an unreasonable defence, but if I am in duty bound to reason, then I, like Abraham, must sacrifice my dearest to it. In the kingdom of thought which like that of faith, is the kingdom of heaven. Everyone is assuredly wrong who uses unthinking force, just as everyone is wrong who in the kingdom of love behaves unlovingly, although he is a Christian and therefore lives in the kingdom of love, yet acts unchristianly in these kingdoms, to which he supposes himself to belong though, he nevertheless throws off their laws. He is a sinner or egoist, but it is only when he becomes a criminal against these kingdoms that he can throw off their dominion. Here too the result is this, that the fight of the thinkers against the government is indeed in the right, namely in might, so far as it is carried on against the government's thoughts. The government is dumb, 
and does not succeed in making any literary rejoinder to speak of, but is, on the other hand, in the wrong, to wit, in impotence, so far as it does not succeed in bringing into the field anything but thoughts against a personal power. The egoistic power stops the mouth of the thinkers. The theoretical fight cannot complete the victory. And the sacred power of thought succumbs to the might of egoism. Only the egoistic fight, the fight of egoists on both sides, clears up everything. This last now, to make thinking an affair of egoistic option, an affair of the single person. Note, original German, des Einzigen. End note. A mere pastime or hobby, as it were, and to take from it the importance of being the last decisive power, this degradation and desecration of thinking, this equalisation of the unthinking and thoughtful ego, at this clumsy but real equality, criticism is not able to produce, because it itself is only the priest of thinking, and sees nothing beyond thinking but the deluge. Criticism does indeed affirm, e.g., that free criticism may overcome the state, but at the same time it defends itself against the reproach which is laid upon it by the state government, that it is self-will and impudence. It thinks, then, that self-will and impudence may not overcome. It alone may. The truth is rather the reverse. The state can be really overcome only by impudent self-will. It may now, to conclude with this, be clear that in the critic's new change of front, he has not transformed himself, but only made good an oversight, disentangled a subject, and is saying too much when he speaks of criticism criticising itself. It, or rather he, has only criticised its oversight and cleared it of its inconsistencies. If he wanted to criticise criticism, he would have to look and see if there was anything in its presupposition. I, on my part, start from a presupposition in presupposing myself, but my presupposition does not struggle for its perfection like man struggling for his perfection, but only serves me to enjoy it and consume it. I consume my presupposition and nothing else, and exist only in consuming it. But that presupposition is therefore not a presupposition at all, for as I am the unique, I know nothing of the duality of a presupposing and a presupposed ego, an incomplete and a complete ego or man. But this, that I consume myself, means only that I am. I do not presuppose myself, because I am every moment just positing or creating myself, and am I only by being not presupposed but posited, and again posited only in the moment when I posit myself, i.e. I am creator and creature in one. If the presuppositions that have hitherto been current are to melt away in a full dissolution, they must not be dissolved into a higher presupposition again, i.e. a thought, or thinking self, criticism. For that dissolution is to be for my good, otherwise it would belong only in the series of the innumerable dissolutions which, in favour of others, e.g. this very man, God, the state, pure morality, etc., declared old truths to be untruths, and did away with long-fostered presuppositions. End of section 17 Humane Liberalism Part 3 Recording by Morgan Gulf French Section 18 of The Ego and His Own This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org The Ego and His Own by Matt Sterner Section 18. Part 2nd. Onus. Part 1. At the entrance of the modern time stands the God-man. At its exit will only the God in the God-man evaporate? And can the God-man really die if only the God in him dies? 
they did not think of this question, and thought they were through when in our days they brought to a victorious end the work of the illumination, the vanquishing of God. They did not notice that man has killed God in order to become now, soul God on high. The other world outside us is indeed brushed away, and the great undertaking of the illuminators completed. But the other world in us has become a new heaven, and calls us forth to renewed heaven storming. God has had to give place, yet not to us, but to man. How can you believe that the God-man is dead before the man in him, besides the God is dead? 1. Onus Subtitle this is a literal translation of the German word Einheit, which, with its primitive Ein, own, is used in this chapter in a way that the German dictionaries do not quite recognize. The author's conception being new, he had to make an innovation in the German language to express it. The translator is under the like necessity. In most passages, self-ownership or else personality would translate the word but there are some where the thought is so ein i e so peculiar or so thoroughly the author's own that no english word i can think of would express it i will explain itself to one who has read part first intelligently end of footnote does not the spirit first for freedom alas not my spirit alone, my body to thirst for it hourly. When before the odorous castle kitchen my nose tells my palate of the savoury dishes that are being prepared therein, it feels a fearful pining as its dry bread. When my eyes tell the hardened back about soft down on which one may lie more delightfully than on its compressed straw, a suppressed rage seizes it when but let us not follow the pains further. And you call that a longing for freedom? What do you want to become free from then? From your heart attack and your straw bed? Then throw them away. But that seems not to serve you. You want rather to have the freedom to enjoy delicious foods and downy beds. Are men to give you this freedom? Are they to permit it to you? You do not hope that from their philanthropy, because, you know, they all think like you. Each is the nearest to himself. How, therefore, do you mean to come to the enjoyment of those foods and beds, evidently not otherwise than in making them your own property? If you think it over rightly, you do not want the freedom to have all these fine things, for with this freedom you still do not have them. You want really to have them, to call them yours and possess them as your property. Of what use is a freedom to you, indeed, if it brings in nothing, and if you become free from everything, you would no longer have anything, for freedom is empty of substance. Whoso knows not how to make use of it, for him it has no value, this useless permission, but how I make use of it depends on my personality. I have no objection to freedom, but I wish more than freedom for you. You should not merely be rid of what you do not want. You should only be a freeman. You should be an owner too. Free? From what? Oh, what is there that cannot be shaken off? The yoke of serfdom, of sovereignty, of aristocracy, and prince, the dominant of the desires and passions. Yes, even the dominion of the desires and passions, yes, even the domain of one's own will, of self-will, for the completest self-denial is nothing but freedom, freedom to wit, from self-determination, from one's own self, and the craving for freedom, as for something absolute, worthy of every praise, deprived us of onness. It created self-denial. However, the freer I become, the more compulsion piles up before my eyes, and the more impotent I feel myself. 
the unfree son of the wilderness does not yet feel anything of all the limits that crowd a civilized man he seems to himself freer than this latter in the measure that i conquer freedom for myself i create for myself new bounds and new tasks if i have invented railroads i feel myself weak again because i cannot yet sail through the skies like a bird and if i have solved a problem whose obscurity disturbed my mind at once there await me innumerable others whose perplexities impede my progress dim my free gaze make the limits of my freedom painfully sensible to me now that you have become free from your sin you have become servants of righteousness republicans in their broad freedom do they not become servants of the law how true christian hearts at all times long to become free how they pined to see themselves delivered from the bonds of this earth life they looked out toward the land of freedom the jerusalem that is above is free woman she is the mother of all us galatians four twenty six being free from anything means only being clear or rid he is free from headache is equal to he is rid of it he is free from his prejudice is equal to he has never conceived it or he has got rid of it unless we complete the freedom recommended by christianity in sinless godless moralityless etc freedom is the doctrine of christianity ye dear brethren are called to freedom so speak and so do as those who are to be judged by the law of freedom must we then because freedom betrays itself as a christian ideal give it up no nothing is to be lost freedom no more than the rest but it is to become our own and in the form of freedom it cannot what a difference between freedom and ownness one can get rid of a great many things one yet does not get rid of all one becomes free from much not from everything inwardly one may be free in spite of the condition of slavery although too it is again only from all sorts of things not from everything but from the whip the domineering temper of the master one does not as a slave become free freedom lives only in the realm of dreams ownness on the contrary is my whole being and existence it is i myself i am free from what i am rid of owner of what i have in my power or what i control my own i am at all times and under all circumstances if i know how to have myself and do not throw myself away on others to be free is something that i cannot truly will because i cannot make it cannot create it i can only wish it and aspire toward it for it remains an ideal a spook the fetters of reality cut the sharpest welts in my flesh every moment but my own i remain given up as serf to a master i think only of myself and my advantage his blows strike me indeed i am not free from them but i endure them only for my benefit perhaps in order to deceive him and make him secure by the semblance of patience or again not to draw worse upon myself by contumacy but as i keep my eye on myself and my selfishness i take by the forelock the first good opportunity to trample the slaveholder into the dust that i then become free from him and his whip is only the consequence of my antecedent egoism here one perhaps says i was free even in the condition of slavery to wit intrinsically or inwardly but intrinsically free is not really free and inwardly is not outwardly i was own on the other hand my own altogether inwardly and outwardly under the dominion of a cruel master my body is not free from torments and lashes 
but it is my bones that moan under the torture, my fibres that quiver under the blows, and I moan because my body moans. That I sigh and shiver proves that I have not yet lost myself, that I am still my own. My leg is not free from the master's stick, but it is my leg and is inseparable. Let him tear it off me and look and see if he still has my leg. He retains in his hand nothing but the corpse of my leg, which is as little my leg as a dead dog is still a dog. A dog has a pulsating heart. A so-called dead dog has none, and is therefore no longer a dog. If one opines that a slave may yet be inwardly free, he says in fact only the most indisputable and trivial thing. For who is going to assert that any man is holy without freedom? If I am an eye-servant, can I therefore not be free from innumerable things, e.g. from faith in Zeus, for the desire for fame, etc.? Why then should not a whipped slave also be able to be inwardly free from unchristian sentiments, from hatred of his enemy, etc. He then has Christian freedom, is rid of the unchristian, but has he absolute freedom, freedom from everything, e.g. from the Christian delusion or from bodily pain? In the meantime, all this seems to be said more against names than against the thing but it is the name of indifferent, and has not a word, a syllable, always inspired and fooled men. Yet between freedom and ownness there lies still a deeper chasm than the mere difference of the words. All the world desires freedom, all long for its reign to come, an enchantingly beautiful dream of a blooming reign of freedom, a free human race, who has not dreamed of it, so men shall become free, entirely free, free from all constraint. From all constraint? Really, from all? Are they never to put constraint on themselves any more? Oh yes, that of course. Don't you see? That is no constraint at all. Well then, at any rate, they are to become free from religious faith, from the strict duties of morality, from the inerexibility of the law, from what a fearful misunderstanding well what are they to be free from then and what not the lovely dream is dissipated awakened one rubs his half-opened eyes and stares at the prosaic questioner what men are to be free from from blind credulity cries one what's that exclaims another all faith is blind credulity they must become free from all faith no, no, for God's sake, invades the first again. Do not cast all faith from you, else the power of brutality breaks in. We must have the Republic, a third makes himself heard, and become free from all commanding lords. There is no help in that, says a fourth. We only get a new lord then, a dominant majority. Let us rather free ourselves from this dreadful inequality. O oh, hapless equality, already I hear you plebeian roar again. How I had dreamed so beautifully just now of a paradise of freedom, and what impudence and licentiousness now raises its wild clamour. Thus the first laments, and gets on with his feet to grasp the sword against unmeasured freedom. Soon we no longer hear anything but the clashing of the swords of the disagreeing dreamers of freedom. What the craving for freedom has always come to has been the desire for a particular freedom, e.g. freedom of faith, i.e. the believing man wanted to be free and independent. Of what? Of faith, perhaps? No, but of the inquisitors of faith, so now political or civil freedom. The citizen wants to become free, not from citizenhood, but from bureaucracy, the arbitrineries of princes, etc. Prince Metternich once said he had found a way that was adapted to guide men in the path of genuine freedom for all of the future. The Count of Provence ran away from France precisely at the time when he was preparing the reign of freedom, and said, 
my imprisonment had become intolerable to me. I had only one passion, the desire for freedom. I thought only of it. The craving for a particular freedom always includes the purpose of a new dominion, as it was with the revolution, which indeed could give its defenders the uplifting feeling that they were fighting for freedom, but in truth only because they were after a particular freedom, therefore a new dominion, the dominion of the law. Freedom you all want, you want freedom. Why then do you haggle over a more or less? Freedom can only be the whole of freedom. A piece of freedom is not freedom. You despair of the possibility of obtaining the whole of freedom. Freedom from everything. Yes, you consider it insanity even to wish this. Well, then leave off chasing after the phantom and spend your pains on something better than the unattainable. Ah, but there is nothing better than freedom. What have you then when you have freedom, viz? For I will not speak here of your piecemeal bits of freedom, complete freedom. Then you are rid of everything that embraces you, everything, and there is probably nothing that does not once in your life embarrass you and cause you inconvenience. And for whose sake, then, did you want to be rid of it? Doubtless for your sake, because it is in your way. But if something were not inconvenient to you, if, on the contrary, it was quite to your mind, e.g. a gently but irresistibly commanding look of your loved one, then you would not want to be rid of it and free from it. Why not? For your sake again, so you take yourselves as measure and judge over all. You gladly let freedom go when unfreedom, the sweet service of love, suits you, and you take up your freedom again on occasion when it begins to suit you better, i.e., supposing, which is not the point here, that you are not afraid of such a repel of the union for other, perhaps religious, reasons. Why will you not take courage now to really make yourselves the central point and the main thing altogether? Why grasp in the air at freedom in your dream? Are you your dream? Do not begin by inquiring of your dreams, your notions, your thoughts, for that is all hollow theory. Ask yourselves and ask after yourselves. That is practical, and you know you want very much to be practical. But there the one hearkens with his God. Of course, what he thinks at the name God is his God. May be going to say to it, and another what his moral feelings, his conscience, his feeling of duty may determine about it, and a third calculates what folks will think of it, and when each has thus asked his Lord God, folks are a Lord God just as good as, nay, even more compact than the other worldly imaginary one, vox pulpi, vox di. Then he accommodates himself to his Lord's will, and listens no more at all for what he himself would like to say and decide. Therefore turn to yourselves, rather than to your gods or idols. Bring out from yourselves what is in you, bring it to the light, bring yourselves to revelation. How one acts only from himself, and asks after nothing further, the Christians have realised in the notion, God, he acts as it pleases him, and foolish man who could do just so, is to act as it pleases God. Instead, if it is said that even God proceeds according to eternal laws, that too fits me, since I too cannot get out of my skin, but have my law in my whole nature, i.e. in myself. But one needs only admonish you of yourself to bring you to despair at once. What am I? each of you asks himself. An abyss of lawless and unregulated impulses, desire, wishes, passions, a chaos without light or guiding star. How am I to obtain a correct answer, if without regard to God's commandments or to the duties which morality prescribes, without regard to the voice of reason, which in the course of history, after bitter experiences, has exalted the best and most reasonable thing into law. 
I simply appeal to myself. My passion would advise me to do the most senseless thing possible. Thus each deems himself the devil, for if so far as he is unconcerned about religion, etc., he only deemed himself a beast, as he would easily find that the beast, which does follow only its impulse, as it were its advice, does not advise and impel itself to do the most senseless things, but takes very correct steps. But the habit of the religious way of thinking has biased our mind so grievously that we are terrified at ourselves in our nakedness and naturalness. It has degraded us so that we deem ourselves depraved by nature, born devils. Of course it comes into your head at once that your calling requires you to do the good, the moral, the right. Now, if you ask yourselves what is to be done, how can the right voice sound forth from you, the voice which points the way of the good, the right, the true, etc.? What concord have God and Belial? But what would you think if one answered you by saying that one is to listen to God, conscience, duties, laws, and so forth, is flim-flam with which people have stuffed your head and heart and made you crazy? And if he asked you how it is that you know so surely that the voice of nature is a seducer, and if he even demanded of you to turn the thing about and actually to deem the voice of God and conscience to the devil's work, there are such graceless men, how will you settle them? You cannot appeal to your parsons, parents, and good men, for precisely these are designated by them as your seducers, as the true seducers and corruptors of youth, who busily so broadcast the terrors of self-contempt and reverence to God, who fill young hearts with mud and young heads with stupidity. But now those people go on and ask, for whose sake do you care about God's and the other commandments? You surely do not suppose that this is done merely out of compliance toward God? No, you are doing it for your sake again. Here too, therefore you are the main thing and each must say to himself i am everything to myself and i do everything on my account if it ever became clear to you that god the commandments etc only harm you that they reduce and ruin you to a certainty you would throw them from you just as the christians once condemned apollo or minerva or heathen morality they did indeed put in the place of these Christ and afterwards Mary, as well as a Christian morality, but they did this for the sake of their souls, welfare too, therefore out of egoism or onus. And it was by this egoism, this onus, that they got rid of the old world of gods and became free from it. Onus created a new freedom, for onus is the creator of everything, as genius, a uh, definite onus, which is always originality, has for a long time already been looked upon as the creator of the new productions that have a place in the history of the world. End of section 20 Recording by Elaine Webb, Bristol, England Section 19 of The Ego and His Own this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Morgan Gold French. The Ego and His Own by Max Stirner. Section 19. Ownness Part 2. If your efforts are ever to make freedom the issue, then exhaust freedom's demands. Who is it that is to become free? You? I? We? Free from what? from everything that is not you, not I, not we. I, therefore, am the kernel that is to be delivered from all wrappings and freed from all cramping shells. What is left when I have been freed from everything that is not I? Only I, nothing but I, but freedom has nothing to offer to this I himself. As to what is now to happen further after I have become free, freedom is silent, as our government, when the prisoner's time is up, 
merely let him go, thrusting him out into abandonment. Now why, if freedom is striven after for love of the I after all, why not choose the I himself as beginning, middle and end? Am I not worth more than freedom? Is it not I that make myself free? Am not I the first? Even unfree, even laid in a thousand fetters, I yet am, and I am not. Like freedom, extant only in the future and in hopes. But even as the most abject of slaves, I am present. Think that over well and decide whether you will place on your banner the dream of freedom or the resolution of egoism, of ownness. Freedom awakens your rage against everything that is not you. Egoism calls you to joy over yourselves, to self-enjoyment. Freedom is and remains a longing, a romantic plaint, a Christian hope for unearthliness and futurity. Ownness is a reality which of itself removes just so much unfreedom as by barring your own way hinders you. What does not disturb you? you will not want to renounce, and if it begins to disturb you, why, you know that you must obey yourselves rather than men. Freedom teaches only. Get yourselves rid, relieve yourselves of everything burdensome. It does not teach you who you yourselves are. Rid, rid, so call, get rid even of yourselves, deny yourselves, but onus calls you back to yourselves. It says, come to yourself. Up under the aegis of freedom you get rid of many kinds of things, but something new pinches you again. You are rid of the evil one. Evil is left. Note. See note. Page 112. End note. As own, you are really rid of everything, and what clings to you, you have accepted. It is your choice and your pleasure. The own man is the freeborn. The man free to begin with, the free man, on the contrary, is only the eleutheromaniac, the dreamer and enthusiast. The former is originally free, because he recognises nothing but himself. He does not need to free himself first, because at the start he rejects everything outside himself, because he prizes nothing more than himself, rates nothing higher, because, in short, he starts from himself and comes to himself. Constrained by childish respect, he is nevertheless already working at freeing himself from his constraint. Ownness works in the little egoist and procures him the desired freedom. Thousands of years of civilization have obscured to you what you are, have made you believe you are not egoist but are called the, to be idealist, good men. Shake that off. Do not seek for freedom, which has precisely deprived you of yourselves in self-denial, but seek for yourselves. Become egoists. Become each of you an almighty ego, or more clearly, just recognise yourselves again, just recognise what you really are, and let go your hypocritical endeavours, your foolish mania to be something else than you are. Hypocritical, I call them, because you have yet remained egoists uh, all these thousands of years, but sleeping, self-deceiving, crazy egoists, you... Hyoton Timorum Enoses you self-tormentors. Never yet has a religion been able to dispense with promises, whether they referred us to the other world or to this, long life, etc. For man is mercenary and does nothing gratis. But how about that doing the, the good for the good's sake, without prospect of reward, as if here to the pay was not contained in the satisfaction that it is to afford? Even religion, therefore, is founded on our egoism and exploits it, calculated for our desires, stifles many others for the sake of one. This then gives the phenomenon of cheated egoism, where I satisfy not myself but one of my desires, e.g. the impulse towards blessedness. Religion promised me the supreme good. To gain this, I no longer regard any other of my desires and do not slate them. All your doings are unconfessed, secret, covert and concealed egoism, but because they are egoism that you are unwilling to confess to yourselves, that you keep secret from yourselves, hence not manifest and public egoism, consequently unconscious egoism, therefore they are not egoism, but thraldom, service, self-renunciation, you are egoists and you are not, since you renounce egoism, where you seem most to be such, 
you have drawn upon the word egoist, loathing and contempt. I secure my freedom with regard to the world in the degree that I make the world my own, i.e. gain it and take possession of it for myself, by whatever might, by that of persuasion, of petition, of categorical demand, yes, even by hip hypocrisy, cheating, etc., for the means that I use for it are determined by what I am. If I am weak, I have only weak means, like the aforesaid, which yet are good enough for a considerable part of the world. Besides, cheating, hypocrisy, lying look worse than they are. Who has not cheated the police, the law? Who has not quickly taken on an air of honourable loyalty before the sheriff's officer who meets him, in order to conceal an illegality that may have been committed, etc.? He who has not done it has simply let violence be done to him. He was a weakling for conscience. I know that my freedom is diminished even by my not being able to carry out my will on another object, be this other something without will, like a rock, or something with will, like a government, an individual. I deny my ownness then, in presence of another I give myself up, i.e. give away, desist, submit, therefore by loyalty, submission. For it is one thing when I give up my previous course because it does not lead to the goal, and therefore turn out of a wrong road. It is another when I yield myself a prisoner. I get around a rock that stands in my way, till I have powder enough to blast it. I get around the laws of a people, till I have gathered strength to overthrow them. Because I cannot grasp the moon, is it therefore to be sacred to me, an astarte? If I only could grasp you, I surely would. And if I only find a means to get up to you, you shall not frighten me, you inapprehensible one. You shall remain inapprehensible to me only till I have acquired the might for apprehension and call you my own. I do not give myself up before you, but only bide my time. Even if for the present I put up with my inability to touch you, I yet remember it against you. Vigorous men have always done so. When the loyal had exalted and unsubdued power to be their master and had adored it, when they had demanded adoration from all, then there came some such son of nature who would not loyally submit and drove the adored power from its inaccessible Olympus. He cried his stand still to the rolling sun and made the earth go round. The loyal had to make the best of it. He laid his axe to the sacred oaks and the loyal were astonished that no heavenly fire consumed him. He threw the Pope off Peter's chair and the loyal had no way to hinder it. He is tearing down the divine right business, and the loyal croak in vain, and at last are silent. My freedom becomes complete only when it is my might, but by this I cease to be a merely free man, and become an own man. Why is the freedom of the peoples a hollow word? Because the peoples have no might. With the breath of the living ego I blow peoples over be it by the breath of a Nero, a Chinese emperor, or a poor writer. Why is it that the G note, meaning German, written in this form because of the censorship, original form in text, G dot dot dot, end note, legislatures pine in vain for freedom and are lectured for it by the cabinet ministers because they are not the mighty. Might is a fine thing, and useful for many purposes, for one goes further with a handful of might than a, with a bag full of right. You long for freedom? You fools! If you took might, freedom would come of itself. See, he who has might stands above the law. How does this prospect taste to you, you law-abiding people? But you have no taste. The cry of, for freedom rings loudly all around. But is it felt and known what a donated or chartered freedom must mean? It is not recognised in the full amplitude of the word that all freedom is essentially self-liberation, i.e. that I can have only so much freedom as I procured for myself by my ownness. Of what use is it to sheep that no one abridges their freedom of speech? They stick to bleating. Give one who is inwardly a Mohammedan 
a Jew or a Christian, permission to speak what he likes, he will yet utter only narrow-minded stuff. If, on the contrary, certain others rob you of the freedom of speaking and hearing, they know quite rightly wherein lies their temporary advantage, as you would perhaps be able to say and hear something whereby those certain persons would lose their credit. If they nevertheless give you freedom, they are simply knaves who give more than they have, for then they give you nothing of their own, but stolen wares. They give you your own freedom, the freedom that you must take for yourselves, and they give it to you only that you may not take it and call the thieves and cheats to an account to boot. In their slyness, they know well that given, chartered freedom is no freedom, since only the freedom one takes for himself, therefore the egoist freedom, rides with full sails. Donated freedom strikes its sails as soon as there comes a storm, or calm. It requires always a gentle and moderate breeze. Here lies the difference between self-liberation and emancipation, manumission, setting free. Those who today stand in the opposition are thirsting and screaming to be set free, and princes are to declare their peoples of age, i.e. emancipate them. Behave as if you were of age, and you are so without any declaration of majority. If you do not behave accordingly, you are not worthy of it, and would never be of age even by a declaration of majority. When the Greeks were of age, they drove out their tyrants, and when the son is of age, he makes himself independent of his father. If the Greeks had waited till their tyrants graciously allowed them their majority, they might have waited long. A sensible father throws out a son who will not come of age, and keeps the house to himself. It serves the noodle right. The man who is set free is nothing but a freed man, a libertinus, a dog dragging a piece of chain with him. He is an unfree man in the garment of freedom, like the ass in the lion's skin. Emancipated Jews are nothing bettered in themselves, but only relieved as Jews. Although he who relieves their condition is certainly more than a churchly Christian, as the latter can do this without inconsistency. But emancipated or not emancipated, Jew remains Jew. He who is not self-freed is merely an emancipated man. The Protestant state can certainly set free, emancipate the Catholics, but because they do not make themselves free, they remain simply Catholics. Selfishness and unselfishness have already been spoken of. The friends of freedom are exasperated against selfishness because in their religious striving after freedom they cannot free themselves from that sublime thing, self-renunciation. The liberal's anger is directed against egoism, for the egoist, you know, never takes trouble about a thing for the sake of the thing, but for his sake, the thing must serve him. It is egoistic to ascribe to no thing a value of its own, an absolute value, but to seek its value in me. One often hears that pot-boiling study, which is so common, counted among the most repulsive traits of egoistic behaviour, because it manifests the most shameful desecration of science. But what is science for but to be consumed? If one does not know how to use it for anything better than to keep the pot boiling, then his egoism is a petty one indeed, because this egoist power is a limited power, but the egoistic element in it and the desecration of science only a possessed man can blame, because Christianity, incapable of letting the individual count as an ego, note, original German for ego, Einziger, end note, thought of him only as a dependent, and was properly nothing but a social theory, a doctrine of living together, and that of man with God as well as of man with man, therefore in it everything own must fall into most woeful disrepute, Selfishness, self-will, ownness, self-love, etc. The Christian way of looking at things has on all sides gradually re-stamped honourable words into dishonourable. Why should they not be brought into honour again? So Schimpf, brackets, contumely, end brackets, is in its old sense equivalent to jest, but for Christian seriousness, pastime became a dishonour. Note, I take Enf Baron destitution to be a misprint of enterung. End note. 
for that serious cannot take a joke. Freck, impud impudent, formerly meant only bold, brave, frevel, wanton outrage, was only daring. It is well known how Askins the word reason was looked at for a long time. Our language has settled itself pretty well to the Christian standpoint, and the general consciousness is still too Christian not to shrink in terror from everything unchristian as from something incomplete or evil. Therefore, selfishness is in a bad way too. Selfishness, note, eigenuts, literally, own use, end note, in the Christian sense means something like this. I look only to see whether anything is of use to me as a sensual man, but is the sensuality then the whole of my ownness? Am I in my own senses when I am given up to sensuality? Do I follow myself, my own determination, when I follow that? I am my own only when I ma am master of myself, instead of being mastered either by sensuality or by anything else, God, man, authority, law, state, church, etc. What is of use to me, this self-owned or self-appertaining one, my selfishness pursues? Besides, one sees himself every moment compelled to believe in that constantly blasphemed selfishness as an all-controlling power. In the session of February 10, 1844, Welker argues a motion on the dependence of the judges and sets forth in a detailed speech that removable, dismissible, transferable and pensionable judges, in short, such members of a court of justice as can by mere administrative process be damaged and endangered, are wholly without reliability. Yes, lose all respect and all confidence among the people. The whole bench, Welker cries, is demoralised by this dependence. In blunt words, this means nothing else than that the judges find it more to their advantages to give judgment as the ministers would have them than to give it as the law would have them. How is that to be helped? Perhaps by bringing home to the judges' hearts the ignominiousness of their venality, and then cherishing the confidence that they will repent and henceforth prize justice more highly than their selfishness? No, the people does not soar to this romantic confidence, for it feels that selfishness is mightier than any other motive. Therefore the same person who have been judges hitherto may remain so however thoroughly one has convinced himself that they behaved as egoists, only they must not any longer find their selfishness favoured by the venality of justice, but must stand so independent of the government that by a judgment in conformity with the facts they do not throw into the shade their own cause, their well-understood interest, but rather secure a comfortable combination of a good salary with respect among citizens. So Welker and the commoners of Baden consider themselves secured only when they can count on selfishness. What is one to think, then, of the countless phrases of unselfishness with which their mouths overflow at other times? To a cause which I am pushing selfishly, I have another relation than to one which I am serving unselfishly. The following criterion might be cited for it. Against the one I can sin or commit a sin, the other I can only trifle away, push from me, deprive myself of, i.e. commit an imprudence. Free trade is looked at in both ways, being regarded partly as a freedom which may, under certain circumstances, be granted or withdrawn, partly as one which is to be held sacred under all circumstances. If I am not concerned about a thing in and for itself, and do not desire it for its own sake, then I desire it solely as a means to an end, for its usefulness, for the sake of another end, e.g. oysters for a pleasant flavour. Now will not everything whose final end he himself is serve the egoist as means? And is he to protect a thing that serves him for nothing, e.g. the proletarian to protect the state? Ownness includes in itself everything owned and brings to honour again what Christian language dishonoured. But ownness has not any alien standard either, as it is not in any sense an idea like freedom, morality, humanity, etc. It is only a description of the owner.
End of section 19. Ownness part 2. Recording by Morgan Golf French. Section 20 of The Ego and His Own. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Ego and His Own by Max Stirner. Section 20. The Owner. I. Do I come to myself and mine through liberalism? Whom does the liberal look upon as his equal? Man. The only man and that you are anyway, and the liberal calls you his brother. He asks very little about your private opinions and private follies, if only he can espy man in you. But as he takes little heed of what you are privating, nay, in a strict following out of his principles, sets no value at all on it, he sees in you only what you are generating. In other words, he sees in you not you, but the species, not Tom or Jim, but man, not the real or unique one, but your essence, your concept, not the bodily man, but the spirit. As Tom, you would not be his equal, because he is Jim, therefore not Tom. As man, you are the same that he is, and since as Tom, you virtually do not exist at all for him so far to wit as he is a liberal and not unconsciously an egoist he has really made brother love very easy for him he loves in you not tom of whom he knows nothing and wants to know nothing but man to see in you and me nothing further than men that is running the christian way of looking at things according to which one is for the other nothing but a concept e g a man called to salvation etc into the ground christianity probably so called gathers us under a less utterly general concept there we are sons of god and led by the spirit of god yet not all can boast of being god's sons but the same spirit which witnesses to our spirit that we are sons of god reveals also who are the sons of the devil consequently to be a son of god one must not be a son of the devil the sonship of god excluded certain men to be sons of men i e men on the contrary we need nothing but to belong to the human species need only to be specimens of the same species what i am as this i is no concern of yours as a good liberal but it is my private affair alone enough that we are both sons of one and the same mother to wit the human species as a son of man i am your equal what am i now to you perhaps this bodily i as i walk and stand anything but that this bodily i with its thoughts decisions and passions is in your eyes a private affair which is no concern of yours it is an affair by itself as an affair for you there exists only my concept my generic concept only the man who as he is called tom could just as well be joe or dick you see in me not me the bodily man but an unreal thing the spook i e a man in the course of the christian centuries we declared the most various persons to be our equals but each time in the measure of that spirit which we expected from them e g each one in whom the spirit of the need of redemption may be assumed then latter each one who has the spirit of integrity finally each one who shows a human spirit and a human face thus the fundamental principle of equality varied equality being now conceived as equally of the human spirit there has certainly been discovered an equality that includes all men for who could deny that we men have a human spirit i e no other than a human 
but are we on that account further on now than in the beginning of christianity then we were to have a divine spirit now a human but if the divine did not exhaust us how should the human wholly express what we are feuerbach e g thinks that if he humanizes the divine he has found the truth no if god has given us pain man is capable of pinching us still more torturingly the long and the short of it is this that we are men is the slightest thing about us and has significance only in so far as it is one of our equalities i e our property i am indeed among other things a man as i am e g a living being therefore an animal or a european a berliner etc but he who chose to have regard for me only as a man or as a berliner would pay me a regard that would be very unimportant to me and wherefore because he would have regarded only for one of my qualities not for me it is just so with the spirit too a christian spirit an upright spirit etc may well be my acquired quality my property but i am not this spirit it is mine not i it hence we have in liberalism only the continuation of the old christian depreciation of the i the bodily tom instead of taking me as i am one looks solely at my property my qualities and enters into marriage bonds with me only for the sake of my possessions one marries as it were what i have not what i am the christian takes hold of my spirit the liberal of my humanity but if the spirit which is not regarded as the property of the bodily ego but as the proper ego itself is a ghost then the man too who is not recognized as my quality but as the proper i is nothing but a spook a thought a concept therefore the liberal too revolves in the same circle as the christian because the spirit of mankind i e man dwells in you you are a man as when the spirit of christ dwells in you you are a christian but because it dwells in you only as a second ego even though it be as your proper or better ego it remains otherworldly to you and you have to strive to become holy man a striving just as fruitless as the christians too became wholly a blessed spirit one can now after the liberalism have proclaimed man declare openly that herewith was only completed the constant carrying out of christianity and that in truth christianity set itself no other task from the start than to realize man the true man hence then the illusion that christianity ascribes an infinite value to the ego as e g in the doctrine of immortality in the cure of souls etc comes to light no it assigns this value to man alone only man is immortal and only because i am man am i too immortal in fact christianity had to teach that no one is lost just as a liberalism too puts on all equality as men but that eternity like this equality applied only to the man in me not to me only as the bearer and harbourer of man do i not die as notoriously the king never dies louis dies but the king remains i die but my spirit man remains to identify me now entirely with man the demand has been invented and stated that i must become a real generic being the human religion is only the last metamorphosis of the christian religion for liberalism is a religion because it separates my essence from me and sets it above me because it exalts man to the same extent as any other religion does its god or idol because it makes what is mine into something otherworldly because in general it makes out of what is mine out of my qualities and my property something alien to wit an essence in short 
because it sets me beneath man and thereby creates for me a vocation but liberalism declares itself a religion in form too when it demands for this supreme being man a zeal of faith a faith that some day will at last provide its fiery zeal too a zeal that will be invincible but as liberalism is a human religion its professor takes a tolerant attitude towards the professor of any other catholic jewish etc as frederick the great did towards every one who performed his duties as a subject whatever fashion of becoming blessed he might be inclined towards this religion is now to be raised to the rank of the generally customary one and separated from the others as mere private follies toward which besides one takes a highly liberal attitude on account of their unessentialness one may call it the state religion the religion of the free state not in the sense hitherto current that it is the one favoured or privileged by the state but as that religion which the free state not only has the right but is compelled to demand from each of those who belong to it let him be privatim a jew a christian or anything else for it does the same service to the state as flinial of piety to the family if the family is to be recognised and maintained in its existing condition by each one of those who belong to it then to him the tie of blood must be sacred and his feeling for it must be that of piety of respect for the ties of blood by which every blood relation becomes to him a concentrated person so also as to every member of the state community this community must be sacred and the concept which is the highest to the state must likewise be the highest to him but what concept is the highest to the state doubtless that of being a really human society a society in which every one who is really a man i e not an unman can obtain admission as a member let a state's tolerance go ever so far toward an unman and toward what is inhuman it ceases and yet this unman is a man yet the inhuman itself is something human yes possibly only to a man not to any beast it is in fact something possible to man but although every unhuman is a man yet the state excludes him i e locks him up or transforms him from a fellow of the state into a fellow of the prison fellow of the lunatic asylum or hospital according to communism to say in blunt words what an unman is not particularly hard it is a man who does not correspond to the conceptions of man as the inhuman is something human which is not conformed to the concept of the human logic calls this a self-contradictory judgment would it be permissible for one to pronounce this judgment that one can be a man without being a man if he did not admit the hypotheses that the concept of man can be separated from the existence the essence from the appearance they say he appears indeed as a man but is not a man men have passed this sad contradictory judgment through a long line of centuries nay what is still more in this long time there were only unmen what individual can have corresponded to his concept christianity knows only one man and this one christ is at once an unman again in the reverse sense to wit a superhuman man a god only the unman is a real man men that are not men what should they be but ghosts every real man because he does not correspond to the concept of man or because he is not a generic man is a spook but do i still remain an unman even if i bring man who towered above me and remained otherworldly to me only as my ideal my task my essence or concepts down to be my quality 
my own and inherent in me, so that man is nothing else than my humanity, my human existence, and everything that I do is human precisely because I do it, but not because it corresponds to the concept man. I am really man, and the unman in one, for I am a man, and the same time more than a man, i.e., I am the ego of this my mere quality. It had to come to this at last, but it was no longer merely demanded of us to be Christians, but to become men, for though we could never really become even Christians, but always remained poor sinners, for the Christian was an unattainable ideal too, yet in this the contradictionness did not come before our conscience so, and the illusion was easier than now one of us, who are men, act humanely, yes, cannot do otherwise than be such an act so. The demand is made that we are to men, real men. Our states of the day, because they still have all sorts of things sticking to them, left from their churchly mother, do indeed load those who belong to them with various obligations, e.g. churchly religiousness which properly do not a bit concern them. The states, yet on the whole, they do not deny their significance, since they want to be looked upon as human societies, in which man as man can be a member, even if he is less privileged than other members. Most of them admit adherence of every religious sect, and receive people without distinction of race or nation, Jews, Turks, Moors, etc., can become French citizens in the act of reception. Therefore, the state looks only to see whether one is a man. The church, as a society of believers, could not receive every man into her bosom. The state, as a society of men, can. But when the state has carried its principle clear through, of presupposing in its constituents, nothing but that they are men even the north americans still presuppose in theirs that they have religion at least the religion of integrity of responsibility then it has dug its grave while it will fancy that those whom it possesses are without exception men these have meanwhile become without exception egoists each of whom utilizes it according to his egoistic powers and ends. Against the egoists, human society is wrecked, for they no longer have to do with each other now as men, but appear egoistically as an I against a you, altogether different from me and in opposition to me. If the state must count on our humanity, it is the same if one says it must count on our morality seeing man in each other and acting as men toward each other is called moral behaviour this is every whit the spiritual love of christianity for if i see man in you as in myself i see man and nothing but man then i care for you as i would care for myself for we represent you see nothing but the mathematical proposition a equals c and b equals c consequently a equals b i e i nothing but man and you nothing but man consequently and i you the same morality is incompatible with egoism because the former does not allow validity to me but only to the man in me but if the state is a society of men not a union of egos, each of whom has only himself before his eyes, then it cannot last without morality, and must insist on morality. Therefore we two, state and I, are enemies. I, the egoist, have not at heart the welfare of this human society. I sacrifice nothing to it. I only utilize it. But to be able to utilize it completely, I transform it rather into my property and my creature, i.e., I annihilate it, and form in its place the union of egoists. 
so to the state betrays its enmity to me by demanding that i be a man which presupposes that i may also not be a man but rank it for as an unman it imposes being a man upon me as a duty further it desires me to do nothing along with which it cannot last so its permanence is to be sacred for me then i am not to be an egoist but a respectable upright i e moral man enough before it and its permanence i am to be important and respectful this state not a present one indeed but still in need of being first created is the ideal of advancing liberalism there is to come to essence a true society of men in which every man finds room liberalism means to realize man i e create a world for him and this should be the human world or the general communistic society of men it was said the church could regard only the spirit the state is to regard the whole man but is not man spirit the kernel of the state is simply man this unreality and itself is only a society of men the world which the believer believing spirit creates is called church the world which the man human or humane spirit creates is called state but that is not my world i never execute anything human in the abstract but always my own things my human act is diverse from every other human act and only by this diversity is it a real act belonging to me the human in it is an abstraction and as such spirit i e abstracted essence bruno brar states e g judenfrange page eighty four that the church of criticism is the final truth and in fact the truth sought for by christianity itself to wit man he says the history of the christian world is the history of the supreme fight for truth for in it and in it only the thing at issue is the discovery of the final or the primal truth man and freedom all right let us accept this game and let us take man as the ultimately found resort of christian history and of the religious or ideal efforts of man in general now who is man i am man the end and outcome of christianity is as i the beginning and raw material of the new history a history of enjoyment after the history of sacrifices a history not of man or humanity but of me man ranks as the general now then i and the egoistic are the really general since every one is an egoist and of paramount importance to himself the jewish is not the purely egoistic because the jew still divides himself to jehovah the christian is not because the christian lives on the grace of god and subjects himself to him as jew and as christian alike a man satisfies only certain of his wants only a certain need not himself a half egoism because the egoism of half a man who is half he half jew or half his own proprietor half a slave therefore too jew and christian always halfway exclude each other i e as men they recognize each other as slaves they exclude each other because they are servants of two different masters if they could be complete egoists they would exclude each other wholly and hold together so much the more firmly their ignominy is not that they exclude each other but that this is done only half way bruno Bure, on the contrary thinks jews and christians cannot regard and treat each other as men till they give up the separate essence which parts them and obligates them to eternal separation recognize the general essence of man and regard this as their true essence 
according to his representations the defect of the jews and the christians alike lies in their wanting to be and have something particular instead of only being men and endeavouring after what is human to wit the general rights of man he thinks their fundamental error consists in the belief that they are privileged possesses prerogatives in general in the belief of prerogative in opposition to this he holds up to them the general rights of man the rights of man man is man in general and in so far every one who is a man now every one is to have the eternal rights of man and according to the opinion of the communism enjoy them in the complete democracy or as it ought more correctly to be called anthropocracy but it is i alone who have everything that i procure for myself as man i have nothing people would like to give every man an affluence of all good merely because he has the title man but i put the accent on me not on my being man man is something only as my quality property like masculinity or femininity the ancients found the ideal in one's being male in the full sense their virtue is virtues anarity i.e manliness what is one to think of a woman who should want only to be a perfectly woman that is not given to all and many a one would therein be fixing for herself an unattainable goal femininity on the other hand she is anyhow by nature femininity is her quality and she does not need true femininity i am a man just as the earth is a star as ridiculous as it would be to set the earth the task of being a thorough star so ridiculous is it to burden me with the call to be a thorough man when fiche says the ego is all this seems to harmonize perfectly with my thesis but it is not that the ego is all but the ego destroys all and only the self-dissolving ego the never being ego the finite ego is really i fiche speaks of the absolute ego but i speak of me the transitory ego how natural is the supposition that man and ego mean the same and yet one sees e g by feuerbach that the expression in man is to designate the absolute ego the species not the transitorily individual ego egoism and humanity humaneness ought to mean the same but according to feuerbach the individual can only lift himself above the limits of his individuality but not above the laws the positive ordinances of his species but the species is nothing and if the individual lifts himself above the limits of his individuality this is rather his very self as an individual he exists only in raising himself he exists only in not remaining what he is otherwise he would be done dead man with the great m is only an ideal the species only something thought of to be a man is not to realize the ideal of man but to present oneself the individual it is not how i realize the generally human that needs to be my task but how i satisfy myself i am my species i am without norm without law without model etc it is possible that i can make very little out of myself but this little is everything and it is better than what i allow to be made out of me by the might of others by the training of custom religion the laws the state better if the talk is to be of better at all better an unmannerly child than an old head on young shoulders better a mulish man than a man compliant in everything the unmannerly and mulish fellow is still on the way to form himself according to his own will the prematurely knowing and compliant one is determined by the species the general demands 
the species is law to him he is determined by it for what else is the species to him but his destiny his calling whether i look to humanity the species in order to strive toward this ideal or to god and christ with like endeavour where is the essential dissimilarity at most the former is more washed out than the latter as the individual is the whole of nature so he is the whole of the species too everything that i do think in short my expression or manifestation is indeed conditioned by what i am the jew e g can will only thus or thus can present himself only thus the christian can present and manifest himself only christianly etc if it were possible that you could be a jew or christian you would indeed bring out only what was jewish or christian but it is not possible in the most rigorous conduct you yet remain an egoist a sinner against that concept i e you are not the precise equivalent of jew now because the egoistic always keeps peeping through people have inquired for a more perfect concept which should really wholly express what you are and which because it is your true nature should contain all the laws of your activity the most perfect thing of the kind has been attained in man as a jew you are too little and the jewish is not your task to be a greek a german does not suffice but be a man then you have everything look upon the human as your calling now i know what is expected of me and the new catechism can be written the subject is again subjected to the predicate the individual to something general the dominion is again secured to an idea and the foundation laid for a new religion this is a step forward in the domain of religion and in particular of christianity not a step out beyond it to step out beyond it leads into the unspeakable for me poultry language has no word and the word the logos is to me a mere word my essence is sought for if not the jew the german etc then at any rate it is the man man is my essence i am repulsive or repugnant to myself i have a horror and loathing of myself i am a horror to myself or i am never enough for myself and never do enough to satisfy myself from such feelings spring self-dissolution or self-criticism religiousness begins with self-renunciation ends with completed criticism i am possessed and want to get rid of the evil spirit how do i set about it i fearlessly commit the sin that seems to the christian the most dire the sin and blasphemy against the holy spirit he who blasphemes the holy spirit has no forgiveness for ever but is liable to the eternal judgment i want no forgiveness and am not afraid of the judgment man is the last evil spirit or spook the most deceptive or most intimate the craftiest liar with honest mien the father of lies the egoist turning against the demands and concepts of the present executes pitilessly the most measureless desecration nothing is holy to him it would be foolish to assert that there is no power above mine only the attitude that i take toward it will be quite another than that of the religious age i shall be the enemy of every high power while religion teaches us to make it our friend and be humble toward it the desecrator puts forth his strength against every fear of god for fear of god would determine him in everything that he left standing as sacred whether it is the god or the man that exercises the hallowing power in the god man whether therefore anything is held sacred for god's sake or humanity's this does not change the fear of god since man is revered as supreme essence 
as much as on the specifically religious standpoint god as supreme essence calls for our fear and reverence both over all us the fear of god in the proper sense was shaken long ago and a more or less conscious atheism externally recognisable by a widespread unchurchliness has involuntarily become the mode but what was taken from god has been superadded to man and the power of humanity grew greater in just the degree that of piety lost weight man is the god of to-day and fear of man has taken the place of the old fear of god but because man represents only another supreme being nothing in fact has taken place but a metamorphosis in the supreme being and the fear of man is merely an altered form of the fear of god our atheists are pious people in the so-called feudal times we held everything as a fife from god in the liberal period the same feudal relation exists with man god was the lord now man is the lord god was the mediator now man is god was the spirit now man is in this threefold met god the feudal relation has experienced a transformation for now firstly we hold as a thief from all powerful man our power which because it comes from a higher it is not called power or might but right the rights of man we further hold as a thief from him our position in the world for he the mediator mediates our intercourses with others which therefore may not be otherwise than human finally we hold as a thief from him ourselves to wit our own value for all that we are worth inasmuch as we are worth nothing when he does not dwell in us and when or where we are not human the power is man's the world is man's i am man's but i am not still unrestrained from declaring myself the entitler the mediator and the own self then it runs thus my power is my property my power gives me property my power am i myself and through it am i my property end of section twenty recording by elaine webb bristol england Section 21 of The Ego and His Own. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Morgan Golf French. The Ego and His Own by Max Stirner. Section 21, My Power, Part 1. Right. Note, this word has also, in German, the meaning of common law and will sometimes be translated law in the following paragraphs. End note. Is the spirit of society. If society has a will, this will is simply right. Society exists only through right. But as it endures only exercising a sovereignty over individuals, right is its sovereign will. Aristotle says justice is the advantage of society. All existing right is foreign law some one makes me out to be in the right does right by me but should i therefore be in the right if all the world made me out so and yet what else is the right that i obtain in the state in society but a right of those foreign to me when a blockhead makes me out in the right i grow distrustful of my rightness i don't like to receive it from him but even when a wise man makes me out in the right I nevertheless am not in the right on that account. Whether I am in the right is completely independent of the fool's making out and of the wise man's. All the same, we have coveted this right till now. We seek for right and turn to the court for that purpose. To what? To a royal, a papal, a popular court, etc. Can a sultanic court declare another right than that which the sultan has ordained to be right? 
Can it make me out in the right if I seek for a right that does not agree with the Sultan's law? Can it, e.g., concede to me high treason as a right, since it is assuredly not a right according to the Sultan's mind? Can it, as a court of censorship, allow me the free utterance of opinion as a right, since the Sultan will hear nothing of this my right? What am I seeking for in this court, then? I am seeking for Sultanic right not my right, I am seeking for foreign right. As long as this foreign right harmonises with mine, to be sure, I shall find in it the latter too. The state does not permit pitching into each other man to man, it opposes the duel. Even every ordinary appeal to blows, notwithstanding that neither of the fighters calls the police to it, is punished, except when it is not an eye whacking away at a you, but say, the head of a family at the child. The family is entitled to this, and in its name the father. I as ego am not. The Vosishka Zeitung presents to us the commonwealth of right. There everything is to be decided by the judge and a court. It ranks the supreme court of censorship as a court where right is declared. What sort of right? The right of the censorship. To recognise the sentences of that court as right, one must regard the censorship as right. But it is thought, nevertheless, that this court offers a protection. Yes, protection against an individual censor's error. It protects only the censorship legislator against false interpretation of his will, at the same time making his statute, by the sacred power of right, all the firmer against writers. Whether I am in the right or not, there is no judge but myself. Others can judge only whether they endorse my right, and whether it exists as right for them too. In the meantime, let us take the manner yet another way. I am to reverence sultanic law in the sultanate, popular law in the republics, canon law in Catholic communities. To these laws I am to subordinate myself. I am to regard them as sacred a sense of right and law-abiding mind of such a sort is so firmly planted in people's heads that the most revolutionary persons of our days want to subject us to a new sacred law the law of society the law of mankind the right of all and the like the right of all is to go before my right as a right of all it would indeed be my right among the rest since i with the rest am included in all but that it is at the same time a right of others, or even of all others, does not move me to its upholding. Not as a right of all will I defend it, but as my right, and then every other may see to it how he shall likewise maintain it for himself. The right of all, e.g. to eat, is a right of every individual. Let each keep this right unabridged for himself, and all exercise it spontaneously. Let him not take care for all, though. Let him not grow zealous for it as for a right of all. But the social reformers preach to us a law of society. There the individual becomes society's slave, and is in the right only when society makes him out in the right, i.e. when he lives according to society's statutes and so is loyal. Whether I am loyal under a despotism or in a society a la rightling, it is the same absence of right in so far as in both cases I have not my right but foreign right. In consideration of right, the question is always asked, what or who gives me the right to it? Answer, God, love, reason, nature, humanity, etc. No, only your might your power gives you the right, your reason, e.g., may give it to you. Communism, which assumes that men have equal rights by nature, contradicts its own proposition till it comes to this, that men have no rights at all by nature, for it is not willing to recognise, e.g., that parents have by nature rights as against their children, or the children as against their parents. It abolishes the family. Nature gives parents, brothers, etc. no right at all. Altogether, this entire revolutionary or babuvist principle, note, see, Die Kommunisten in der Schweiz, Committee Report, 
page three, rests on a religious, i.e. false, view of things. Who can ask after right if he does not occupy the religious standpoint himself? Is not right a religious concept, i.e. something sacred? Why, a quality of right, as the revolution propounded it, is only another name for Christian equality, the equality of the brethren, of God's children, of Christians, in short, fraternité. Each and every inquiry after right deserves to be lavished with Schiller's words. Many a year I've used my nose to smell the onion and the rose. Is there any proof which shows that I have a right to that same nose? When the revolution stamped equality as a right, it took flight into the religious domain, into the region of the sacred, of the ideal. Hence, since then, the fight for the sacred, inalienable rights of man against the eternal rights of man, the well-earned rights of the established order, are quite naturally, and with equal right, brought to bear, right against right, where, of course, one is decried by the other as wrong. This has been the contest of rights. Note, Rex strikes a word which usually means lawsuit, since the revolution. You want to be in the right as against the rest. That you cannot as against them you remain forever in the wrong. For they surely would not be your opponents if they were not in their right too. They will always make you out in the wrong, but as against the right of the rest, yours is a higher, greater, more powerful right, is it not? No such thing. Your right is not more powerful if you are not more powerful. Have Chinese subjects a right to freedom? Just bestow it on them, and then look how far you have gone wrong in your attempt, because they do not know how to use freedom, they have no right to it. Or, in clearer terms, because they have not freedom, they have not the right to it. Children have no right to the condition of majority, because they are not of age, i.e., because they are children. People that let themselves be kept in nonage have no rights to the condition of majority. If they ceased to be in nonage, then only would they have the right to be of age. This means nothing else than what you have the power to be, you have the right to. I derive all right and all warrant from me. I am entitled to everything that I have in my power. I am entitled to overthrow Zeus, Jehovah, God, etc., if I can. If I cannot, then these gods will always remain in the right and in power as against me. And what I do will be to fear their right and their power in impotent God-fearingness, to keep their commandments and believe that I do right in everything that I do according to their right, about as the Russian boundary sentinels think themselves rightfully entitled to shoot dead the suspicious persons who are escaping since they murder by superior authority, i.e. with right. But I am entitled by myself to murder if I myself do not forbid it to myself, if I myself do not fear murder as a wrong. This view of things lies at the foundation of Camisso's poem, The Valley of Murder where the grey-haired Indian murderer compels reverence from the white man whose brethren he has murdered. The only thing I am not entitled to is what I do not do with a free cheer, i.e. what I do not entitle myself to. I decide what is the right thing in me. There is no right outside me. If it is right for me, note, a common German phrase for it suits me, end note, it is right. Possibly this may not suffice to make it right for the rest, i.e. their care, not mine. Let them defend themselves, and if for the whole world something were not right, but it were right for me, i.e. I wanted it, then I would ask nothing about the whole world. So everyone does who knows how to value himself, everyone in the degree that he is an egoist, for might goes before right and that with perfect right. Because I am, by nature, a man, I have an equal right to the enjoyment of all goods, 
says Babioff. Must he not also say, because I am by nature a first-born prince, I have a right to the throne? The rights of man and the well-earned rights come to the same thing in the end, i.e. to nature, which gives me a right, i.e. to birth, and further inheritance, etc. I am born as a man is equal to, I am born as a king's son. The natural man has only a natural right, because he has only a natural power and natural claims. He has right of birth and claims of birth, but nature cannot entitle me, i.e. give me capacity or might, to that to which only my act entitles me. That the king's child sets himself above other children, even this is his act, which secures to him the precedence, and that the other children approve and recognise this act is their act, which makes them worthy to be subjects. Whether nature gives me a right, or whether God, the people's choice, etc., does so, all of, i.e., the same foreign right, a right that I do not give or take to myself. Thus the communists say, equal labour entitles man to equal enjoyment. Formerly, the question was raised whether the virtuous man must not be happy on earth, the Jews actually drew this inference, that it may go well with thee on earth. No, equal labour does not entitle you to it, but equal enjoyment alone entitles you to equal enjoyment. Enjoy, then you are entitled to enjoyment. But if you have laboured and let the enjoyment be taken from you, then it serves you right. If you take the enjoyment, it is your right. If, on the contrary, you only pine for it without laying hands on it, it remains, as before, a well-earned right. Of those who are privileged for enjoyment, it is their right, as by laying hands on it would become your right. The conflict over the right of property wavers in vehement commotion. The communists affirm, note, A. Becker, Volksphilosophie, page 22f, end note, that the earth belongs rightfully to him who tills it, and its products to those who bring them out. I think it belongs to him who knows how to take it, or who does not let it be taken from him, does not let himself be deprived of it. If he appropriates it, then not only the earth, but the right to it too belongs to him. This is egoistic right, i.e. it is right for me, therefore it is right. Aside from this, right does have a wax nose. The tiger that assails me is in the right, and I who strike him down am also in the right. I defend against him not my right, but myself. As human right is always something given, it always, in reality, reduces to the right which men give, i.e. concede to each other. If the right to existence is conceded to newborn children, then they have the right. If it is not conceded to them, as was the case among the Spartans and ancient Romans, then they do not have it, for only society can give or concede it to them. They themselves cannot take it or give it to themselves. It will be objected the children had nevertheless by nature the right to exist. Only the Spartans refused recognition to this right. But then they simply had no right to this recognition, no more than they had to recognition of their life by the wild beasts to which they were thrown. People talk so much about birthright and complain. There is, alas, no mention of the rights that were born with us. Note, Mephistopheles in Faust. End note. What sort of right, then, is there that was born with me? The right to receive an entailed estate? to inherit a throne, to enjoy a princely or noble education, or, again, because poor parents begot me, to get free schooling, be clothed out of contributions of arms, and at last earn my bread and my herring in the coal mines or at the loom. Are these not birthrights, rights that have come down to me from my parents through birth? You think no. You think these are only rights improperly so called. It is just these rights that you aim to abolish through the real birthright, 
to give a basis for this, you go back to the simplest thing and affirm that everyone is by birth equal to another, to wit, a man. I will grant you that everyone is born a man, hence the newborn are therein equal to each other. Why are they? Only because they do not yet show and exert themselves as anything but bare, children of men, naked little human beings, but thereby they are at once different from those who have already made something out of themselves, who thus are no longer bare, children of man, but children of their own creation. The latter possesses more than bare birthrights, they have earned rights. What an antithesis! What a field of combat! The old combat of the birthrights of man, and well-earned rights. Go right on appealing to your birthrights. People will not fail to oppose to you the well-earned. Both stand on the ground of right, for each of the two has a right against the other. The one the birthright of natural right, the other the earned or well-earned right. If you remain on the ground of right, you remain in rectarberi. Note, I beg you, spare my lungs. He who insists on proving himself right, if he but has one of those things called tongues, can hold his own in all the world's despite. False words to Mephistopheles, slightly misquoted. For right haberi, see note on page 185, end note. The other cannot give you your right. He cannot mete out right to you. He who has might has right. If you have not the former, neither have you the latter. Is this wisdom so hard to attain? Just look at the mighty and their doings. We are talking here only of China and Japan, of course. Just try at once, you Chinese and Japanese, to make them out in the wrong, and learn by experience how they throw you into jail. Only do not confuse with this the well-meaning counsels which in China and Japan are permitted, because they do not hinder the mighty one, but possibly help him on. For him who should want to make them out in the wrong, there would stand open only one way thereto, that of might. If he deprives them of their might, then he has really made them out in the wrong. Deprive them of their right in any other case, he can do nothing but clench his little fist in his pocket, or fall a victim as an obtrusive fool. In short, few Chinese or Japanese did not ask after right, and in particular if you did not ask after the right that were born with you, then you would not need to ask at all after the well-earned rights either. You start back in fright before others because you think you see beside them the ghosts of right, which, as in the Homeric combat, seems to fight as a goddess at their side, helping them. What do you do? Do you throw the spear? No, you creep around to gain the spook over to yourselves, that it may fight on your side. You woo for the ghost's favour. Another would simply ask thus, Do I will what my opponent wills? No! Now then, there may fight for him a thousand devils or gods. I go at him all the same. The Commonwealth of Right, as the Vosishka Zeitung, among others, stands for it, asks that office holders be removable only by the judge, not by the administration. Vain illusion, if it were settled by law, that an office holder who is once seen drunken shall lose his office, then the judges would have to condemn him on the word of the witnesses. In short, the lawgiver would only have to state precisely all the possible grounds which entail the loss of office, however laughable they might be, e.g. he who laughs in his superior's faces, who does not go to church every Sunday, who does not take the communion every four weeks, who runs in debt, who has disreputable associates, who shows no determination, etc., shall be removed. These things the lawgiver might take it into his head to prescribe, e.g. for a court of honour. Then the judge would solely have to investigate whether the accused had become guilty of those offences, and, on presentation of the proof, pronounce sentence of removal against him. 
in the name of the law. The judge is lost when he ceases to be mechanical. When he is forsaken by the rules of evidence, then he no longer has anything but an opinion like everybody else, and if he decides according to his opinion, his action is no longer an official action. As judge, he must decide only according to the law. Commend me rather to the old French parliaments, which wanted to examine for themselves what was to be matters of right, and to register it only after their own approval. They at least judge according to a right of their own, and were not willing to give themselves up to, to be machines of the lawgiver, although as judges they must, to be sure, become their own machines. It is said that punishment is the criminal's right, but impunity is just as much his right. If his undertaking proceeds, it serves him right, and if it does not succeed, it likewise serves him right. You make your bed and lie in it. If some one goes foolhardily into dangers and perishes in them, we are apt to say it serves him right. He would have it so. But if he conquered the dangers, i.e., if his might was victorious, then he would be in the right too. If a child plays with the knife and gets cut, it is served right. But if it doesn't get cut, it is served right too. Hence right befalls the criminal, doubtless, when he suffers what he risked. Why, what did he risk it for? since he knew the possible consequences, but the punishment that we decree against him is only our right, not his. Our right reacts against his, and he is in the wrong at last, because we get the upper hand. End of section 21. Recording by Morgan Gold French, Leeds. Section 22 of The Ego and His Own. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Ego and His Own by Max Stirner. Section 22. My Power. Part 2. But what is right, what is matter of right in a society, is voice too in the law. Whatever the law may be, it must be respected by the local citizen. Thus the law-abiding mind of old England is eulogised. To this that Euripidean sentiment, or sitters, 418, entirely corresponds. We serve the gods, whatever the gods are. Law as such, God as such. Thus far we are today. People are at pains to distinguish law from arbitrary orders, from an ordinance. The former comes from a duly entitled authority, but a law over human action, ethical law, state law, etc., is always a declaration of will, and so an order. Yes, even if I myself gave myself the law, it would yet be only my order, to which in the next moment I can refuse obedience one may well enough declare what he will put up with and so depreciate the opposite of the law making known that in the contrary case he will treat the transgressor as his enemy but no one has any business to command my actions to say what course i shall pursue and set up a code to govern it i must put up with it that he treats me as his enemy but never that he makes free with me as his creature, and that he makes his reason, or even unreason, my plumb line. States last only so long as there is a ruling will, and this ruling will is looked upon as tantamount to the own will. The Lord's will is law. What do your laws amount to if no one obeys them? What your orders if nobody lets himself be ordered? The state cannot forbear the claim to determine the individual's will, to speculate and count on this. For the state it is indispensable that nobody have an own will. If one had, the state would have to exclude, lock up, banish, etc., this one. If all had, they would do away with the state. The state is not thinkable 
without lordship and servitude, subjection. For the state must will to be the lord of all that it embraces, and this will is called the will of the state. He who has to hold his own must count on the absence of will in others, is a thing made by these others, as the master is a thing made by the servant. If submissiveness ceased, it would be over with all lordship. The own will of me is the state's destroyer. It is therefore branded by the state as self-will. Own will and the state are powers in deadly hostility, between which no eternal peace is possible. As long as the state asserts itself, it represents own will, its ever hostile opponent as unreasonable evil, and the latter lets itself be talked into believing this. Nay, it really is such, for no more reason than this, that it still lets itself be talked into such belief. It has not yet come to itself and to the consciousness of its dignity. Hence it is still incomplete, still amenable to fine words, etc. Every state is a despotism, be the despot one or many, or as one is likely to imagine about a republic, if all be lords, i.e. despotize one over another, for this is the case when the law given at any time, the expressed violation of, it may be, a popular assembly, is thenceforth to be law for the individual, to which obedience is due from him or toward which he has the duty of obedience. If one were even to conceive the case that every individual in the people had expressed the same will, and hereby a complete collective will, had come into being the matter would still remain the same. Would I not be bound today and henceforth to my will of yesterday? My will would in this case be frozen. Wretched stability. My creature, to wit, the particular expression of will, would have become my commander. But I, in my will, I, the creator, should be hindered in my flow and my dissolution. Because I was a fool yesterday, I must remain such my life long. So in the state life I am at best, I might just as well say, at worst, a bondman of myself. Because I was a willer yesterday, I am today without will. Yesterday voluntary, today involuntary. How change it? Only be recognising no duty, no binding myself, nor letting myself be bound. If I have no duty, then I know no law either. But they will bind me. My will nobody can bind, and my disinclination remains free. Why everything must go topsy-turvy if every one could do what he would? Well, who says that every one can do everything? What are you there for, pray, do you who do not need to put up with everything? Defend yourself, and no one will do anything to you. He who would break your will has to do with you, and is your enemy. Deal with him as such. If there stand behind you for your own protection some millions more, then you are an imposing power, and will have an easy victory. But even if as a power you overawe your opponent, still you are not on that account a hallowed authority to him, unless he be a simpleton. He does not owe you respect and regard even though he will have to consider your might. We are accustomed to classify states according to the different ways in which the supreme being is distributed. If an individual has its monarchy, of all have it, democracy, etc., supreme might then. Might against whom? Against the individual and his self-will. The state practices violence. The individual must not do so. The state's behaviour is violence, and it calls its violence law. That of the individual crime. Crime then, so the individual's violence is called, and only by crime 
does he overcome the state's violence when he thinks that the state is not above him but he is above the state now if i wanted to act ridiculously i might as a well-meaning person admonish you not to make laws which impair my self-development self-activity self-creation i do not give this advice for if you should follow it you would be unwise and i should have been cheated of my entire profit i request nothing at all from you for whatever i might demand you would still be dictatorial lawgivers and must be so because a raven cannot sing nor a robber live without robbery rather do i ask those who would be egoists that they think the more egoistic to let laws be given them by you and to respect those that are given or to practise refractoriness yes complete disobedience good-hearted people think the laws ought to prescribe only what is accepted in the people's feeling as right and proper but what concern is it of mine what is accepted in the nation and by the nation the nation will perhaps be against the blasphemer therefore a law against blasphemy am i not to to blaspheme on that account is this law to be more than an order to me I put the question solely from the principle that all right and all authority belong to the collectively of the people to all forms of government arise for none of them lacks this appeal to the collectivity and the despot as well as the president or any aristocracy acts and commands in the name of the state they are in possession of the authority of the state and it is perfectly indifferent whether were this possible the people as a collectivity all individuals exercise their state authority or whether it is only the representatives of this collectivity be there many of them as in aristocracies or one as in monarchies always the collectivity is above the individual and has a power which is called legitimate i e which is law over against the sacredness of the state the individual is only a vessel of dishonour in which exuberance malevolence mania for ridicule and slander frivolity etc are left as soon as he does not deem that object of veneration the state to be worthy of recognition the spiritual haughtiness of the servants and subjects of the state has fine penalties against unspiritual exuberance when the government designates as punishable all play of mind against the state the moderate liberals come and opine that fun satire wit humour must have free play anyhow and genius must enjoy freedom so not the individual man indeed but still genius is to be free here the state or in its name the government says with perfect right he who is not for me is against me fun wit etc in short the turning of the state affairs into a comedy have undermined the states from of old they are not innocent and further what boundaries are to be drawn between guilty and innocent wit etc at this question the moderates fall into great perplexity and everything reduces itself to the prayer that the state government would please not be so sensitive so ticklish that it would not immediately send malevolence in harmless things and would in general be a little more tolerant exaggerated sensitiveness is certainly a weakness its avoidance may be praiseworthy virtue but in time of war one cannot be sparing and what may be allowed under peaceable circumstances ceases to be permitted as soon as a state of siege is declared because the well-meaning liberals feel this plainly they hasten to declare that considering the devotion of the people there is assuredly no danger to be feared 
but the government will be wiser and not let itself be talked into believing anything of that sort it knows too well how people stuff one with fine words and will not let itself be satisfied with the barmecide dish but they are bound to have their playground for they are children you know and cannot be so staid as old folks boys will be boys only for this playground only for a few hours of jolly running about they bargain they ask only that the state should not like a splenetic papa be too cross it should permit some possessions of the ass and plays of fools as the church allowed them in the middle ages but the times when it could grant this without danger are past children that now once come into the open and live through an hour without the rod of discipline are no longer willing to go into the cell for the open is now no longer a supplement to the cell no longer a refreshing recreation but its opposite and ought in short the state must either no longer put up with anything or put up with everything and perish it must be either sensitive through and through or like a dead man insensitive tolerance is done with if the state but gives a finger they take the whole hand at once there can be no more jesting and all jest such as fun wit humour becomes bitter earnest the clamour of the liberals for freedom of the press runs counter to their own principle their proper will they will what they do not will i e they wish they would like hence it is too that they fall away so easily when once so-called freedom of the press appears then they would like censorship quite naturally the state is sacred even to them likewise morals they behave toward it only as ill-bred brats as tricky children who seek to utilize the weaknesses of their parents papa state is to permit them to say many things that do not please him but papa has the right by a stern look to blue pencil their impertinent gabble if they recognize in him their papa they must in his presence put up with the censorship of speech like every child if you let yourself be made out in the right by another you must no less let yourself be made out in the wrong by him if justification and reward come to you from him accept also his arraignment and punishment alongside right goes wrong alongside legality crime what are you you are a criminal the criminal is in the utmost degree the state's own crime says bettina one may let this sentiment pass even if bettina herself does not understand it exactly so for in the state of the unbridled i i as i belong to myself alone cannot come to my fulfilment and realization every ego is from birth a criminal to begin with against the people the state hence it is that it does really keep watch over all it sees in each one an egoist and it is afraid of the egoist it presumes the worst about each other and takes care police care that no harm happens to the state ni quid mis publica detrimente cape the unbridled ego and this we originally are and in our secret inward parts we remain so always is never ceasing criminal in the state the man whom his boldness his will his inconsiderateness and fearlessness lead is surrounded with spies by the state by the people i say by the people the people think it something wonderful you good-hearted folks what you have in the people the people is full of police sentiments through and through only he who renounces his ego who practices self-renunciation is acceptable to the people in the book cited bettina is throughout good-natured enough to regard the state as only sick and to hope for its recovery a recovery which she would bring about 
through their demagogies, but it is not sick, rather it is in its full strength, when it puts from the demagogues who want to acquire something for the individual, for all in its believers is provided with the best demagogues, leaders of people. According to Bettina, the state is to develop mankind's germ of freedom, otherwise it is a raven mother, and caring for raven fodder. It cannot do otherwise, for in its very caring for mankind, which besides would have to be the humane or free state to begin with, the individual is raven fodder for it. How rightly speaks the burgomaster, on the other hand, what? The state has no other duty than to be merely the attendant of incurable invalids? That isn't to the point. From of old the healthy state has relieved itself of the deceased matter, and not mixed itself with it. It does not need to be so economical with its juices, cut off the robber branches without hesitation, that the others may bloom. Do not shiver at the state's harshness. Its morality, its policy and religion point it to that. Accuse it of no want of feeling. Its sympathy revolts against this, but its experience finds safety only in this severity. There are diseases in which only drastic remedies will help. The physician who recognises the disease as such, but timidly turns to palliatives, will never remove the disease, but may well cause the patient to succumb after a shorter or longer sickness. Through Rark's question, if you apply death as a drastic remedy, how is the cure to be wrought then? Isn't to the point. Why the state does not apply death against itself, but against an offensive member, it tears out an eye that offends it, etc. For the individual state, the only way of salvation is to make man flourish in it. If one here, like Bettina, understands by man the concept, man, she is right. The invalid state will recover by the flourishing of man, for the more infatuated the individuals are with man, the better it serves the state's turn. But if one referred it to the individuals, to all, and the authoress half does this too, because about man she is still involved with vagueness, then it would sound somewhat like the following. For an individual band of robbers, the only way of salvation is to make the loyal citizen nourish in it. Why thereby the band of robbers would simply go to ruin as bad of robbers, and because it receives this, it prefers to shoot every one who has a leaning toward becoming a steady man. In this book, Bettina is a patriot, or what is little more, a philanthropist, a worker for human happiness. She is discontented with the existing order in quite the same way as is the title ghost of her book, along with all who would like to bring back the good old faith and what goes with it. Only she thinks, counterwise, that the politicians, placeholders, and diplomats ruined the state, while those lay it at the door of the malviant, the seducers of the people. End of section 22. Recording by Elaine Webb, Bristol, England. Section 23 of The Ego and His Own. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Ego and His Own by Max Stirner. My Power, Part 3. What is the ordinary criminal but one who has committed the fatal mistake of endeavouring after what is the people's instead of seeking for what is his? He has sought despicable alien goods, has done what believers do who seek after what is God's. What does the priest who admonishes the criminal do? He sets before him the great wrong of having desecrated by his act what was hallowed by the state, its property, in which, of course, 
must be included even the life of those who belong to the state. Instead of this, he might rather hold up to him the fact that he has befouled himself in not despising the alien thing, but thinking it worth stealing, if he could, if he were not a parson. Talk with a so-called criminal as with an egoist, and he will be ashamed, not that he transgressed against your laws and goods, but that he considered your laws worth evading, your goods worth desiring. He will be ashamed that he did not despise you and yours together, that he was too little an egoist. But you cannot talk egoistically with him, for you are not so great as a criminal. You commit no crime. You do not know that an ego who is his own cannot desist from being a criminal, that crime is his life. And yet you should know it, since you believe that we are all miserable sinners, but you think surreptitiously to get beyond sin. You do not comprehend, for you are devil-fearing. That guilt is the value of a man. Oh, if you were guilty, but now you are righteous. Well, just put everything nicely to rights. For your master, when the Christian consciousness or the Christian man draws up a criminal code, what can the concept of crime be there but simply heartlessness? Each severing and wounding of a heart relation, each heartless behaviour toward a sacred being is crime. The more heartfelt the relation is supposed to be, the more scandalous is the deriding of it, and the more worthy of punishment the crime. Everyone who is subject to the Lord should love him. To deny this love is a high treason worthy of death. Adultery is a heartlessness, worthy of punishment. One has no heart, no enthusiasm, no pathetic feeling for the sacredness of marriage. So long as the heart or soul detects laws, only the heartful or soulful man enjoys the protection of the laws. That the man of soul makes laws means probably that the moral man makes them. What contradicts these men's moral feeling, this they penalise. How, e.g., should disloyalty, secession, breach of oaths, in short, all radical breaking off, all tearing asunder of venerable ties, not be infligitous and criminal in their eyes? He who breaks with these demands of the soul has for enemies all the moral or the men of soul, only Krumenacher and his mates are the right people to set up consciously a penal code of the heart, as a certain bill sufficiently proves. The consistent legislation of the Christian state must be placed wholly in the hands of the parsons, and will not become pure and coherent as long as it is worked out only by the parson-ridden, who are always only half-parsons. Only then will every lack of soulfulness, every heartlessness, be certified as an unpardonable crime. Only then will every agitation of the soul become condemnable, every objection of criticism and doubt be anathematized. Only then is the own man, before the Christian consciousness, a convicted criminal to begin with. The men of the revolution often talked of the people's just revenge, as its right. Revenge and right coincide here. Is this an attitude of an ego to an ego? The people cries that the opposite party has committed crimes against it. Can I assume that one commits a crime against me without assuming that he has to act as I see fit? And this action I call the right the good, etc., the divergent action, a crime. So I think that the others must aim at the same goal with me, i.e., I do not treat them as unique beings, who bear their law in themselves and live according to it, but as beings who are to obey some rational law. I set up what man is, 
and what acting in a truly human way is, and I demand of every one that this law become norm and ideal to him, otherwise he will expose himself as a sinner and criminal. But upon the guilty falls the penalty of the law. One sees here how it is man against who sets on foot even the concept of crime, of sin, and therewith that of right. A man in whom I do not recognize man is a sinner, a guilty one. Only against a sacred thing are there criminals. You against me can be never a criminal, but only an opponent. But not to hate him who injures a sacred thing is in itself a crime. As Saint Just cries out against Danton, Are you not a criminal? and responsible for not having hated the enemies of the fatherland? If, as in the revolution, what man is apprehended as good citizen, then from this concept of man we have the well-known political offences and crimes. In all this the individual, the individual man, is regarded as refuse, and on the other hand the general man, man, is honoured. Now, according to how this ghost is named, as Christian, Jew, Mussulman, good citizen, loyal subject, freeman, patriarch, etc., just so do those who would like to carry through a divergent concept of man, as well as those who want to put themselves through, fall behind victorious man. And with what function the butchery goes on here in the name of the law, of the sovereign people, of God, etc. Now, if the persecuted trickily conceal and protect themselves from the stern parsonical judges, people stigmatize them as Saint Just, e.g., does not those whom he accuses in the speech against Danton, one is to be a fool and deliver himself up to their Moloch. Crimes spring from fixed ideas. The sacredness of marriage is a fixed idea. From the sacredness it follows that infidelity is a crime, and therefore a certain marriage law imposes upon it a shorter or longer penalty. But by those who proclaim freedom as sacred, this penalty must be regarded as a crime against freedom, and only in this sense has public opinion in fact branded the marriage law. Society would have every one come to his right indeed, but yet only to that which is sanctioned by society, to the society right, not really to his right. But I give or take to myself the right out of my own plenitude of power, and against every superior power I am the most impenitent criminal, owner and creator of my right. I recognize no other source of right than me, neither God, nor the state, nor nature, nor even man himself, with his eternal rights of man, neither the divine nor human right. Right, in and for itself, without relation to me, therefore, absolute right, separated from me, therefore, a thing that exists in and for itself, an absolute, an eternal right, like an eternal truth, According to the liberal way of thinking, right is to be obligatory, for me because it is thus established by human reason, against which my reason is unreason. Formerly people invade in the name of divine reason against weak human reasons, now in the name of a strong human reason against egoistic reason, which is rejected as unreason and yet none is real because this very unreason, neither divine nor human reason, but only you and my reason existing at my given time, is real, as and because you and I are real. The thought of right is originally my thought, or it has its origin in me, but when it has sprung from me, when the word is out, then it has become flesh, it is a fixed idea. Now I no longer get rid of the thought, however I turn, it stands before me. 
thus men have not become masters again of the thought right which they themselves created their creature is running away with them this is absolute right that which is absolved or unfastened from me we revering it as absolute cannot devour it again and it takes from us the creative power the creature is more than the creator it is in and for itself once you no longer let right run around free once you draw it back into its origin into you it is your right and that is right which suits you right has had to suffer an attack within itself i.e. from the standpoint of right war being declared on the part of liberalism against privilege privileged and endowed with equal rights on these two concepts turns a stubborn fight excluded or admitted would mean the same but where should there be a power be it in an imaginary one like god law or real one like i you of which it should not be true that before it all are endowed with equal rights i e no respect of personal holds every one is equally dear to god if he adores him equally agreeable to the law if only he is a law-abiding person whether the lover of god and the law is humpbacked and lame whether poor or rich etc that amounts to nothing for god and the law just so when you are at the point of drowning you like a negro as rescuer as well as the most excellent occasion yes in this situation you esteem a dog not less than a man but to whom will not every one be also counterwise a preferred or disregarded person god punishes the wicked with his wrath the law chastises the lawless you let one visit you every moment and show the other the door the equality of right is a phantom just because right is nothing more and nothing less than admission a matter of grace which be it said one may also acquire by his desert for desert and grace are not contradictory since even grace wishes to be deserved and our gracious smile falls only to him who knows how to force it from us so people dream all of citizens of the state having to stand side by side with equal rights as citizens of the state they are certainly all equal for the state but it will divide them and advance them or put them in the rear according to its special ends if on no other account and still more must it distinguish them from one another as good and bad citizens bruno Bier disposes of the due question from the standpoint that privilege is not justified because jew and christian have each some point of advantage over the other and in having this point of advantage are exclusive therefore before the critics gaze they crumble into nothingness with them the state lies under the like blame since it justifies their having advantages and stamps it as a privilege or prerogative but thereby derogates from its calling to become a free state but now every one has something of advantage over another viz himself or his individuality in this everybody remains exclusive and again before a third party everyone makes his pecuniary count for as much as possible and if he wants to win him at all tries to make it appear attractive before him now is the third party to be insensible to the differences of the one from the other do they ask that of the free state or of humanity then these would have to be absolutely without self-interest and incapable of taking an interest in any one whatever neither god who divides his own from the wicked nor the state which knows how to separate good citizens from bad was thought of as so indifferent but they are looking for this very third party that bestows no more privilege then it is called perhaps the free state or humanity 
or whatever else it may be. As Christian and Jew are ranked low by Bruno Bure on account of their certain privileges, it must be that they could and should free themselves from the narrow standpoint by self-renunciation or unselfishness. If they threw off their egoism, the mutual wrong would cease, and with it Christian and Jewish religiousness in general. It would be necessarily only that either of them should any longer want to be anything peculiar. But if they gave up this exclusiveness, with that the ground on which their hostilities were waged would in truth not yet be forsaken. In case of need they would indeed find a third thing on which they could unite, a general religion, a religion of humanity, etc. In short, an equalization, which need not be better than that which would result if all Jews became Christians, by this likewise the privilege of one over the other would have an end. The tension would indeed be done away, but in this consisted not of the essence of the two, but only their neighbourhood. As being distinguished from each other, they must necessarily be mutually resistant, and the disparity will always remain. Truly it is not a failing in you that you stiffen yourselves against me, and assert your distinctness or peculiarity, you need not give away or renounce yourself. People conceive the significance of the opposition too formally and weakly when they want only to dissolve it in order to make room for a third thing that shall unite. The opposition deserves rather to be sharpened. As Jew and Christian, you are in too slight an opposition, and are contending only about religion as it were about the emperor's beard, about a fiddlestick's end. Enemies in religion, indeed, in the rest, you still remain good friends and equal to each other, e.g. as men. Nevertheless, the rest too is unlike in each, and the time when you no longer merely dissemble your opposition will be only when you entirely recognise it, and everybody asserts himself from top to toe as unique then the former opposition will assuredly be dissolved, but only because a stronger has taken it up into itself. Our weakness consists not in this, that we are in opposition to others, but in this, that we are not completely so, that we are not an entirely severed from them, or that we seek a communion, a bond, that in communion we have an ideal one faith, one God, one idea, one hat, for all. If all were brought under one hat, certainly no one would any longer need to take off his hat before another. The last and most decided opposition, that of unique against unique, is at bottom beyond what is called opposition, but without having sunk back into the unity and unison. As unique, you have nothing in common with the other any longer, and therefore nothing divisive or hostile either. You are not seeking to be in the right against him before a third party, and are standing with him neither on the ground of right nor on any other common ground. The opposition vanishes in complete severance or singleness. This might indeed be regarded as the new point in common, or a new parity. But here the parity consists precisely in the disparity, and it's itself nothing but a disparity, a par of disparity, and that only for him who institutes a comparison. The polemic against privilege forms a characteristic feature of liberalism, which fumes against privilege because it itself appeals to right. Further than to fuming, it cannot carry this, for privileges do not fall before right falls, as they are only forms of right. But right falls apart into its nothingness when it is swallowed up by might, i.e., when one understands what is meant by might goes before right. All right explains itself then as privilege, and privilege itself as power, 
as superior power. But must not the mighty combat against superior power show quite another face than the modest combat against privilege, which is to be fought out before a first judge, right, according to the judge's mind? Now, in conclusion, I have still to take back the halfway form of expression, of which I was willing to make use only so long as I was still rooting among the entrails of right, and letting the word at least stand. But, in fact, with the concept the word too loses its meaning, what I called my right is no longer right at all, because right can be bestowed only by a spirit, be it the spirit of nature or that of the species, of mankind, the spirit of God, or that of his holiness, or his highness, etc. What have I without an entitling spirit? I have without right. I have it solely and alone through my power. I do not demand any right, therefore I need not recognize any either. What I can get by force, I get by force. And what I do not get by force, I have no right to, nor do I give myself airs, or consolation with my imperceptible right. With absolute right, right itself passes away. The dominion of the concept of right is cancelled at the same time, for it is not to be forgotten that hitherto concepts, ideas, or principles ruled us, and that among these rulers the concept of right or of justice played one of the most important parts entitled or unentitled that does not concern me if i am only powerful i am of myself empowered and need no other empowering or entitling right is a wheel in the head put there by a spook power that am i myself i am the powerful one and owner of power right is above me is absolute and exists in one higher as whose grace it flows to me. Right is a gift of grace from the judge. Power and might exists only in me, the powerful and mighty. End of section 23. Recording by Elaine Webb, Bristol, England.